All right, all right, all right. What the hell is going on, everybody? And welcome back. We've got ourselves the GSL. It's the round of eight, Group B, and the Shield of Aya. Back out of the military over the last few months, and he started to do very well. But this is a hard group. It's the top eight. If you win this group, if you get out top two, you do get to the top four. And it's going to be so hard for Stance. He's in the top left here of Amphion. He's going up against Shin in the bottom, who's already mined minerals. Oh my god, Shin's cheesing him. Okay, okay, okay. I should have known. Shin is a very cheeky boy. Shin is already planning a cheese. Is he going to proxy hatch? He's going to proxy hatch. Okay. So he might spine crawl. No, not even spine crawl. He's just going to open it up and ling flood. Oh, me. Oh, my. Okay, so Shin is going to ling flood through the back door. Maybe even build roaches there. And stats isn't scouting on... Okay. It's fine to not scout. You just need to make sure you check this. So I, I've said to people on this map, especially against Zerg, you basically need to build your second pylon, Stargate here, start your wall off there, and you'll be safe against everything. Has stats studied this map enough? This is, this is the big question. This is the big question. It goes Nexus, then he'll build a probe, then a cyber core. Oh, sorry, sorry. Then a cyber core, then he'll build a probe. Actually, does he go 21? I know some players have been going 21. No, he's going to go 20 cyber core. Then he'll build a probe, a second gas, another probe, and then a second pylon. If that pylon goes in the main, I think he might just be dead. He's going to scout after the cyber core. Okay. At least that'll give him a tiny bit of warning. I mean, these drones are going to mine this out so incredibly early. That he's not even got Zerglings yet. I mean, this is so fast. I think the idea is even if he scouts you mining it open, he can't kill the drones. Because he can't possibly get an adept in time. Stats, let's go to his vision. Second pylon's in the main base. It's not at the wall off. He sees no expansion. His alarm bells should be ringing right now. He immediately goes to the minerals to check what the hell is going on. He sees one of the minerals is missing and he goes, oh gee, is it a gold base? Is there an expansion over there? And he, he needs to be getting defense right now. Stargate in the main. Stargate does go up. Okay, he sees no gold base. Okay, he's realizing, oh my god, this is not looking good. Let's go back to everyone's camera. Here we go. The drones have opened up the opening. There are Zerglings on the front. A Banely Nest is on the way. No queens. No queens. Guys, there's all ins, and then there's what Shin's doing. Shin is trying to rush so hard that he doesn't have time to make a queen. That being said, this is not that scary yet. Once Link Speed finishes, it will become scary. Adept's about to pop out on that right side. That's why we've got this view, guys. He's going for the Adept. If that Adept gets surrounded, then he's screwed. But that's good positioning by stats. He's just got to make sure the Adept survives. Picks off a couple of Zerglings, but he's going to lose that pylon. And he's going to be about defending in the main. Shield Battery's on the way in the main, as is a Robo and a Stargate, though. The reason he's going Robo is he knows that he might lose his natural and there might be creep spread there. So he's already thinking about it. Oh my god, no, no, no. Stats, oh my gosh. Almost losing the Adept there, but that was actually a trap. Dude, that was a sick move. He baits in the Zerglings for the surround and uh, and actually has the Shield Battery just barely inhaling. Banelings are morphing in the main base. He hasn't started the Void Ray yet. No Void Ray, no Oracle. Oh my god, these Banelings are going to be deadly. This Adept needs to go out and start fighting this. But Link Speed's almost finished. The Adept is actually in the open right now. I, I don't know if he can hang on. Because these Zerglings, even with Battery Overcharge, like, what can you do? The Adept has to hold the... Overcharge, 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 Overcharge! Oh my god! The Overcharge gets down on the Adept! But he gets depowered! Oh no! The Pylon was just too close! That Adept needed to be a pixel further forward to keep that Pylon alive. Unfortunate there, but somehow that Adept is still alive. Oh, the Adept's down. No, that should be it. That should be it. Only 12 probes left. I mean, there's not many Zerglings. Remember, there's no Queens. So there's only five Zerglings on the map right now. If he could get this Voidry out, then maybe. He does have a Shield Battery back up now. Uh, it's about 36 seconds until Battery Overcharge is ready. I, I don't think Stats can hang on. Because remember, Shin, I mean, he doesn't have an expansion. He can't really macro behind this just yet. No Queens and no Expand. The battery's out of juice. The battery's out of juice. The probes are fighting okay, but oh my god, there's a Baneling! Baneling! Voidray needs to get the Baneling! The Voidray comes out just in time, manages to take out the Baneling. The probes, as long as they have battery healing, they can survive these Banelings coming in. And two more probes do go down. Oh, the Zerglings doing so much damage. Ten probes do survive. There's 16 drones for Mr. I was going to say Rogue, because he's playing kind of like Rogue, but obviously just super dirty, abusive attack here on this map. And you know what? Stats was going to check for it. He just checked a bit too late. But oh my god, these two overlords going down is big. This is huge. This is a huge mistake. This is a huge mistake, guys. Do you, he cannot afford to rebuild those overlords. He's supply capped. Which means we've got 11 Zerglings. There's going to be 15 Zerglings and 4 Banelings on the map. And there's an Immortal and a Void Ray. Which can hold. They can hold against this. But the Banelings are going to sneak in. Oh god, if that Immortal doesn't stop them, this is a big problem. Oh god, oh god, oh god. He gets lured out of position. The, the probes need to run. The probes need to run. He gets rid of one Baneling. Probes, oh, they're going to try and phase through the Immortal. They're going to phase through. They, oh my god. 
just, oh my, ah, I don't even, oh my gosh, he somehow only lost two. He somehow only loses two. He's going to stack them up. The probes are trying to fight. The probes. Oh, he somehow only lost two probes. Remember, his natural's still alive. The immortal focused down most of the bailing stats. Is absolutely clutch right now. And another overlord. Shin. Oh, no. Shin has messed it up. I can't believe this. I cannot believe this, guys. Dude, if one more Baneling landed on those probes, it was game over. It was lights out. But only one Baneling hit. The other ones all got focused by the Immortal, which is, like I said, on eight kills. Another Overlord! Oh, no! Shin's transition is ruined. It's ruined. He can't transition. He's completely supply blocked. And now Stats can probe up his natural and even think about walling it off. Oh my god, Stats is ahead of this game. I, 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 not, not by a massive amount. Don't get me wrong, his opening sucks in many regards. He's, he's on not that many workers. Like, one Baneling getting in here still ruins his day. It's not like it's over, but I can't believe he's ahead after that. Dude, what a clutch, <laughs> clutch hold for Stats. And this is what people have always said about Stats, is he's actually the lowest MMR of all the Protoss players on the ladder. Like, like the Zests and the Heroes and the, you know, whoever's at the top of the ladder, Classic. Um, but, but everyone else plays a bit worse in tournaments. Some say 500 MMR worse was the meme, which is massive. It's probably not really 500 MMR, but they say, oh, players play 500 MMR worse in tournaments. They'd say stats gets to a live tournament and he plays 500 MMR better. And, and that's why people said, like, if you looked at his ladder ranks, it never reflected his, his results in tournaments, but he's so calm and good at executing under pressure in tournaments. And, uh, you see it there, man, the shield of Aya, the defensive king. Now, uh, Voidre has 19 kills. There's only two queens out on the map. He could just focus a drone or two down if he wants, but probably not worth the risk. So, Wall Off on the Natural's up. If the Voidre doesn't watch that left side, these guys could... No, 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 this is a... Oh, this is really bad. Stats. These guys... If, if those four Banelings morph in here and, like, get in his main base, that's a problem. But actually, he does have an Adept on duty, so he's, he's kind of aware. Okay, he is aware of the fact that this is a problem. Adept will defend on that side. Ah. Uh... Don't lose it, mate. Oof. Okay. He's okay. 29 drones for Shin. Shin gonna struggle to even take a third base here. He needs, like, creep and stuff to protect said third base. Oracles are building in the main. So it's one, two gate, one robo. Obviously that pylon could get blown up, but, you know, that's a lot of expense when you're on such a low economy right now. Void Ray flies in. Looks like it wasn't able to kill a drone. Looks like it just kind of flew in, flew out. And uh, as those two oracles come in, yeah, it's like, man, if they catch, like, uh, a bunch of drones going to the third or something like that, that could be deadly. The probe count is back up to 36. Oh, he does lose an adept there, the damaged one. The other adept continuing forwards, though. And he's, walling, he's walled off. Okay, so a pylon and a gateway now walling off his back door. Nicely done here. Dude, units lost have better than two to one. The efficiency of the Void Ray and the Immortal is absolutely next level. Now look at that. That's going to pull Queens down, which is going to open up the main or the natural for the Oracles, which are flying down the left side of the map. Oracles go towards the main. There's a... Oh, the Queen moved away. There's only a Spore. Spore is not enough to defend this. He could get... Oh, he could have got so much more. Stats playing a bit conservative there. A little bit conservative, guys. He could have killed seven workers and, uh, and kept both Oracles alive. There was another Queen about to pop, but he didn't know that. Third base is on the way. Forge and Twilight. Third and fourth gas. Does he want to play charge or does he go straight for blink? I think both would be good choices in this scenario. Now, the Zerglings are going to find that exposed pylon, so he has to wall off behind it. These oracles looking for more damage. There are drones in the open, as are queens. Oh, he has to turn them around there. A little bit awkward having them lose their acceleration. They only get two drones to start, but they grab a third and a fourth. No, just three. Not too, not too bad. I mean, this is not bad damage. It just looks like he could be getting a little bit more with how kind of fragile Shin's position is in this game. Now, uh, it is going to be blinking plus one here for Mr. Stats. Takes a third gateway as well. He does lose the pylon out front, but he's got a sentry there now as a bit of reinforcement just in case. Now, one thing I noticed watching Stats against Dark in the group stage is he was a bit unnecessarily defensive. And I'm wondering if that was a fa factor against Dark, where he kind of just sat back when he was miles ahead. And, and it kind of looked like he was going to let Dark recover. And I think it was the Oceanborn game, if memory serves. And uh, I was like, man, he could just go win the game so easily. And he went for like Stalkers and Storm and took a real long time to tech up. And, and, and I just want to see him take a fast fourth. If you play purely defensive, you, you want to make sure your opponent kind of has to punish you. Um, or you're going to get ahead. And in this case, it looks like he's actually just going to go... I think we're going to see a Prism. Right? Because he's going 8-gate. I think we're going to see a Prism. Because his probing has been not non-stop. 
I believe we'll see a warp prism pretty soon. I think he's gonna go, he's gotta go for a blink pressure. And he's gonna try and maybe secure a fourth base behind that. A blink pressure to deny the fourth of Zerg would be excellent. Oh, he's gonna lose one almost. Not quite, two more drones go down though. Brings the kills up to 10 drones, 18 probes have fallen. Stalker's starting to warp in. He doesn't have a forward warp in point and no warp prism though. So this is a very light stalker pressure. I think he's just basically moving across the map and he'll just take a fourth base, gases on his third and the rest behind it. I, I gotta say though, no forward warp in point is a little bit questionable. Okay, he's bringing a probe. He's just gonna build a pylon and maybe even think about building a gateway. Fair enough. Not a bad way of doing it. There's nothing wrong with building a pylon on the front line. Stalker's warping in there. The Zerg is going to go for them, but not enough surface area. And the shield battery will come up, though Stalker's going to easily deflect that small Zergling run by. Spire attempt on the way for Shin. It has not been spotted by stats as uh, he comes forward right now. We've got 11 Zerglings, 5 Roaches, a few Ravages trying to morph. Dude, he's not giving him much time. The Queens need to buy time right now. A few Roaches and Ravages start to come out. Bile's starting to push it back. The Void Ray will be falling. I'd love to see him keep the Void Ray alive. This is one of those things I always throw the Void Ray away in battles like this and then I regret it later on in the game. I go, man, if I had that Void Ray and I just left it at home defending my third base from runbys, I'd be so much better off. The Lynx came in, they weren't able to shut down the Pylon, which is actually pretty massive. The Immortal and the Stalk is dodging all of the Biles very well. I'd love to see him push to that right side. For now though, there is a Creep Tremor on the high ground. Getting rid of that would be good. The more you remove the Creep, the better you turn this area as an engagement area for Protoss. I don't think a single Stalk has gone down just yet. He's doing good blink back micro, but there's a good position for that Roach Ravager and the Immortal, of course, being stuck out front will go down eventually. Blinks forward, oh my gosh. There's confidence and then there's what Stats is doing right now. The man knows he's got the numbers and he's already at a, still maintaining a two to one unit loss trading. Plus one attack, plus one melee has only just finished for the Zerg. Well, plus one was done for a while for Stats. His plus one armor's almost there. He doesn't know about the fourth base on the right side. He's trying to just win army versus army right now. It's not a bad call, but remember, he doesn't have a fourth. He's got no gases on his third. This is an incredibly committed attack for Stats. It is the opposite of what I what I said. I said he was too cautious against Dark on Oceanborn. This is the opposite. He's just saying, I'm ahead, I'm going to kill you. I am just going to lean on you with good Blink Stalker control, trade really well, give you no room to breathe. I know I'm ahead in this game. And you know what? I think that micro is good enough for it. He's now moving forward. A great blink forward. Just as the Biles come across him, rather than pulling back, he blinks forward. He exerts his force. And what an impressive hold that was by Stats at the start of that game. I, I have to look at it again. Because there was one more Bane Link that should have hit that mineral line, in my opinion. I say should have. Obviously, like, there's this one where, 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 where he pulled back. But let's watch with the Immortal. The, the Immortal hold was perhaps the most impressive, in my opinion. Because here we go. This is it. Ah, oh, so he focuses that one down. That one gets in. And then he, does he focus this one down? Yes, he does. He, he, he focuses that one there as well. So only one Baneling gets on top. Wow, let's just watch that again. As I kind of jumped into the middle of the fight there. So look, the, the Banelings come in from there. They see they're blocked. He focuses down one. He focuses down another. That one gets on top. And I love the way he phases through the Immortal. This is a trick we do. I don't know if I've ever seen a... I guess I have seen Protoss players do this, but very rarely. This is a trick we do in Zerg versus Zerg all the time, is you'll have your spawning pool here and your queen here. And when the Banelings come in from this side, your drones are all here. So then the Banelings all go to the right side and then you'll phase through your queen. And when they turn back, you phase back through the queen. And if the, the Baneling player doesn't have enough Banelings or split them both sides, you can basically just click on the minerals on your natural to phase this side, click on these minerals to phase to that side, and you use your hatchery as an obstacle and the queen as the blocker. I don't know if I've seen a Protoss player do that exactly the same, but that's so cool to see ZVZ micro tactics being used by stats. What a legend. All right. Well, that was a pretty clutch hold, wasn't it? He knows his opponent's a bit of a cheeky guy who's almost always bringing out dirty builds against Protoss, and he still scouts so incredibly late. I'm shaking the camera angrily, going, stats, don't be so greedy. And it, it, he got away with it. He got away with it despite that. He does go for the pilot. I'm unashamedly cheering for stats in this match, even though I will be cheering for Shin um in his matches against Kua and Gumiho if he plays either of those two who are playing in the other first match the reason is Shin just plays really fun strats the reason I'm cheering for stats though is I actually learned a lot of how to play Protoss off stats and oh my god is he hatchery blocking he's hatchery blocking so this has been Dark's response lately whenever Dark gets blocked as well he does the same thing now Shin's trying to he wants to get a hatchery up oh my gosh I don't think attacking the probe's a good idea, and that's going to prompt him to build a pylon. You know Stats is going to build a pylon there now. And he's going to build that hatchery to block the expansion, so hatchery goes down there. And of course he's going to build the pylon. So unless you wanted him to force you to take the third, I don't think there's a reason to attack that probe. 
because essentially stats will get antsy and, and come in to scout if you just wait longer, which is what Dark does. And then as the probe comes in, he comes down and builds the hatchery. Even if it's as late as a minute 10 in often of Dark's games, he still gets it down on location. Whereas now this is hatchery into pool gas. Now you might be thinking hatch gas pool, that's a normal build. Yeah, not when your hatchery is in their base. Doing this with your hatchery in their base puts you at a very, very limited economic position. And in fact, it, it basically says for stats, you, you play as carefully as you want here, because because there's no expansion for Zerg yet. The whole point of this is to get a faster expansion of Zerg, but it hasn't even started. It's going to start now at about a minute 45. He does get the money. Probe sees it immediately. And stats has gone for a zealot. Now, has he gone for a second gas? No. Yes, he has. Okay. I was about to say, it's it's not a bad choice to go a second gas here. Just chrono two adepts, even off just one gateway. Get a Stargate and a pretty quick Oracle out, even while getting your Nexus up. Obviously, this delays you having 400 minerals by a little bit, but only by a little bit. It's not that big of a deal. He did pull four probes, which is quite expensive to clear this up. But if you don't want to build a second gateway, that is kind of standard. No Adept going down yet. So he's actually saying, you know what? I want to get a Stargate and a Nexus. I'll delay my Adept. And I think... Normally against an earlier hatchery, I would disagree with that. But because he knows there's an early pool and this hatchery is so late, there's not really going to be any exposed drones. He knows any adept he goes for is diving into a queen and a bunch of zerglings. It's not really going to kill anything in the main. So he said, you know what? It's more important to just start the Nexus, start the Stargate, which is a little late to start. There we go. It does start now. It's still well-timed considering what's happened in this early game. Don't get me wrong. And he will need to build another pylon as he's about to get supply blocked. Drone in the main base, luring this Adept away. And the Adept does shut him down. Pylon goes down, third hatchery gots, gets placed for Shin. Shin's on 18 workers versus 26. So this is the downside of this whole interaction. You go, well, his hatchery's up a little bit quicker. Who cares? The Nexus is not far behind. He's down nine workers. Bad opening for Shin. Guys, I have to, I have to say it straight up. Bad opening for Shin. In my opinion, you've got a quick link speed, but if you can't do anything with that, it's, it accounts for nothing. The dream for Shin is these two adepts move out, you surround them immediately, especially if your overlord sees where they are, so you can catch them just as a shade finishes or something like that. He's building six more lings though. That's so he's really gambling on surrounding the adepts and denying the third base. But that third base won't be going down for at least another 30, 40 seconds, so this is definitely a bit iffy. Oh, this is great though. Seeing the shade is great. This is exactly what Shin needs. Oh, they diverted though. They diverted. He knew he got spotted by the Overlord, so he changed the angle of the shade. Shin's like, where'd they go? Where? They oh, he pulled it back. He's realizing, oh, he pulled it back. And look, he's just got them wedged in a nice little pocket. They are a bit exposed, that one on the front especially. Oh, those lings are just out of vision. He senses it though. Oh, he must have glimpsed them. He must have glimpsed them. Oracle's gonna turn its laser on. Is this worth fighting with the Oracle overhead? I mean, he's going to kill both Adepts, but the Oracle kills six Zerglings. Ends up being nine Zerglings for two Adepts, which is pretty even in the trading. And that Oracle's still there. Nexus does get placed nice and early. Second Oracle's on the way. This is a really quick third. Remember that Shin's been mining less resources this whole time. If you don't get the cancel on the third, it's not really worth it. Stats has just adapted so well. The moment he saw Pool Gas before expansion, Stats has played very carefully. And he's really just focused on a mixture of safety and macro. And, and Shin has, I think, just telegraphed what he was doing a little bit too much in this game. Now, it's still Ghost River. And attacks take about six seconds to get across this map, guys. So I haven't really seen Queen Walks on this map. But I feel like they could be so quick to get even up that it's a narrow choke point. If you just get your creep to like here, it doesn't take long to walk across. I feel like Queen Walks are going to be a very good strategy on this map. That being said... Oh... Nice. That's that. That was a beautiful run by for stats. Minimal damage on his oracles. Three drone kills. Equal workers on both sides. Third and fourth gas comes down for stats. Uh, the overlords in the base are probably the biggest mistake I would say of stats right now. Just letting these overlords see everything. It's so worth building a single phoenix at this point. You know, go kill this overlord. Come back, kill that one. Just just something to get rid of them. If if he, if it was earlier, maybe warping in a stalker to shut those down. But for now, he's given Shin a lot of information. That being said, Shin is going to go for the surround on the Adepts. Oracle doesn't have much energy, so it only turns on its laser for about half a second. And the Adepts do shade into the natural. This Adept harassment, not as powerful. He's just going to... Oh, he gets two drones, interestingly. Double Oracle goes around the back, but the Queens are well positioned. Oh, the natural's open, though. The natural is open. There's no Queens here. And nice movement for stats. Only gets himself one drone. Once again, very cautious with his Oracles, isn't he? He, he, he basically lives by the uh, the rule of do not lose your oracles. 
if you lose your oracles for no no good like you know unless you're killing 20 workers with it and in that case just kill just kill 10 and pull back it's better to kill 10 and pull back keep the oracle alive seems to be stats uh, mo and i think that's that's generally you know what we used to prioritize that was a lesson we learned from guys like stats and classic and early legacy of the void is if you lose that first oracle your build kind of sucks keep it alive even if it doesn't feel like it's doing a lot it is forcing to defense it's giving you so much vision information they do a surprise push you got a lot of oracle energy banked up it can be a real game changer fourth base on the way for shin he's got a lair and an evo chamber coming in 68 workers he's done a magnificent job of recovering catching all those adepts was really good scouting as well with his overlords amazing i'm actually very impressed and and i might even put him slightly ahead in this scenario as he is up eight workers that being said roach speed hasn't started he doesn't have he's just got his plus one started he's just started roach speed so he doesn't really have any points to his tech like any any oh you got a spire halfway done already oh you've got an infestation bit coming up and he's gonna go roach hydra now roach hydra is the least inspired style that we've seen recently um i don't mind obviously you know a few hydras when you're going basically up into lurkers but this is hydra before infestation pit which is not the order for that this is the roach hydra all in style if we break these rocks you do have some pretty big wide open areas to engage down here as well i mean it, it can work because it's so surprising but you really need to hide it which is why he's put that hydrogen down the bottom and, and you need to hope that your opponent thinks you're going for Hive. If he could show an Infestation Pit, that would be great stats. He's going to see it. He's going to see it. He sees the Hydrogen. Massive, massive scout. 100% scouted that. Uh, I think my computer is struggling a little bit there. A few lag spikes. I don't know, guys. <laughs> I mean, I'm... I'm uh... I want you to replay right now. I can't can't blame that, uh, that one on anything else. I don't know what's going on there. But, uh... Just a couple of, couple of lags in the StarCraft game. Plus one range, Ravages, Roaches, and Hydras coming in. He's got Storm on the way, so he's going to have Stalker Storm. The Natural's off in a weak point here. He's going to build a battery and a cannon. Stats realizes, hey, I need defense. And, oh, he's going to break these rocks. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, yeah, the Natural's usually a weak point, as I was just saying. He's only got one pylon at the front. He needs he needs another pylon up here as well, potentially. Oh, God, he doesn't realize. He, he sees it now. He sees it now. Finally sees it. But no stasis traps up. Oh, God, he's already in. Oh, stats might just be dead here. That's a massive army. It's a massive army. Storm's not quite ready. It's 10 seconds away. He needs that Psy Storm to deal with the Hydras, but the Natural's being breached. Stasis trap tries to go up in the Natural. It freezes only a few of the Zerglings. The building cannons and batteries unable to complete. Ravages uh, are going to push in. Hydras will take care of those Oracles. The Oracles are going down. More Lings, Roaches, Ravages coming in. Great Storms, great Storms. Great Storms coming in. A lot of probes going down to the top right. The Stalkers are doing okay with those Psy Storms, though these Zealots are not even speed zealots yet and yet they are managing to do a lot the archon morph is quite good it seems like shin's starting to thin out the herd he needs more reinforcements right now more roaches are coming in one archon goes down if you can get rid of that other archon that could be big that ravager up there is going after those probes he's actually biling probes up in the top of our screen as this fight continues sorry to show that i just want to show you guys he's also got a few lings in the main base going after the probes he gets 13 workers and it looks like shin has has most likely broken him here uh it does it, it's gonna get cleaned up and he's gonna need to gather up for the next wave but, I mean, he could transition to Hive and be miles ahead. He could just keep going. There is a fourth up for stats. And he's got a decent probe count. It's not over. It's pretty... It's... it's I mean, it's, if it wasn't stats, I'd probably say it's over. But I'm like, stats is really good at defending, man. <laughs> he's got double... Oh, he's going double upgrades in the midst of that. Mate, you barely survived. He needs more High Templar. He's got two High Templar. He's trying to warp in more. He needs energy. The cannon battery on the fourth actually makes it really hard for these roaches to do damage if he runs three roaches and just hold positions behind the mineral line i think that's the best move but if he tries to run in and focus the pylon down stasis trap's gonna ruin his day <sighs> oh he's gonna go for the batteries gets a battery but then he i think he saw the stasis trap i think he realized that was there he saw the shimmery boy even on the uh the snow where i think it is one of the harder tile sets to see it my templar not quite having storm the zealots don't have charge yet oh man the Roach Ravager count isn't that high on this side, but they are cleaning up those Zealots really well. Stasis Trap freezes the Roaches in the south. High Templar are going to jump down. Good Storms, good Storms. He's got an Immortal coming out as well. Immortals are so important, those gateways. Do you manage to hang on? He pushes him off the high ground. Shin is almost maxed right now, but a lot of the army is in production, and these Roaches are actually now in big trouble. His best bet is probably shuffle to the right side, try to focus down these building buildings, kill as many probes as you can. 
or bring the rest of your army to reinforce and just straight up fight. That also works. Yeah, he's going to run to the right with those roaches. The rest of the army comes in. Those units on the top do get stormed, though. Oh, damn. The big storms on that army on the north. So the, the northern army got smacked. But he's running in on the south with a, a fantastic force down here. In the top left, you can still see it, uh, roaches coming in. The army coming in from all sides. A few zealots do warp in at that moment. Stats desperately trying to hang on. Dude, I feel like right now Shin is just beating a warhammer down upon the shield of Stats. But Stats' arm is inevitably going to break. This is just, he just, you can't hold on against this swarm in so many locations for so long. The fourth base is being routed. There's, there's Ravagers. He is picking off those Ravagers in the middle, but he's losing so many probes up here. Desperately trying to warp in Zalets to stabilize. What a chaotic game this is. This is absolute madness, and it's exactly what the Zerg player thrives on and the Protoss player hates. Now, technically, he does have two one upgrades, but look at that. The Roaches, happy to fight in the choke point against those Zealots. Those Zealots trading quite poorly as they can only fight one at a time. The Natural did get cleaned up. Does he have any Psy Storm? He's, he's managed to warp in four more High Templar, which is impressive. In these sorts of games, the problem Protoss has is their splash damage relies on energy gathering over time, and most of the time, Protoss players never find the time to warp in High Templar and gather that energy because the next attack's already here. Shin is saying, if I just keep attacking, you never get time for it. Another four probes went down. 70 workers against 57. A massive 60 army supply lead. More Lings getting into the natural. The Roach Ravagers here. Has he got Psy Storms? Not quite yet. But he's going to have it in about three seconds. That might have been the moment where Shin should have fought. Now there's Storm ready. You do not want to run at him in a clump when he has Psy Storm. And that's four Archons and Immortal with three Storms backing up. The natural's going to be a much better angle to go for. Shin's going to go for it. Crazy. He does bait out the Storms though. There, there is an advantage of YOLOing like that is you do bait out all the side storms, but this army in the south is outnumbered. He's trying to just lure that army out of position while these guys get in and start to clean up. But a few of them are getting distracted by the gateways. He does bile down a stalker, gets rid of an Archon. Nice micro for Shin, dude. Shin's actually multitasking like a monster, but Snat says, I've got the numbers advantage. I can just blink on you in the south. Cleans up the southern army. Can he get through in the north? If Shin breaks through and clears this mineral line one more time, he's got this game in the bag. He's now building a Baneling Nest. Oh my god, 3-2 is about to finish. 3-2's about to finish! Guys, he's only got he's only got a 10 worker advantage, 12 worker advantage to Shin, but it's about to be 3-2 against plus 2 range. No. No. Dude, when stats started plus 1 armor, I was like, are you a maniac? But he was like, no, no, that's my win condition. If I can keep making high temp, like getting just a few storms here and there, Keep making upgrades. He's got three, two upgrades. He's got two Immortals, two Archons, three High Templar Gathering Energy, 10 Stalkers, a few Zealots. He's trying to rebuild a battery, that wall off. He keeps rebuilding this wall off. I tell you, if he didn't keep rebuilding this wall off, the Roach Ling would have flooded into his natural so many times. I cannot emphasize enough how any other Protoss player at the top right now would have left this door open, especially if it was Hero. There's no way he would have rebuilt that wall after the first time it got broken down. Let's let's not kid ourselves. Hero wouldn't have even thought about it until a week later. Stats immediately rewalled it. It got torn down again. Immediately rewalled, torn down again. I think this is like the fourth rebuild of this wall. But those gateways have bought him so much time. There's been a lot of Shin's attacking time wasted killing these gateways. A thousand hit points each, rather than killing probes and other units. Hero wouldn't have even had the first wall, says Twitch chat, and I can't disagree. I think I think you guys are right on that one. Now, Shin, like I said, he could have transferred Lurkers, transitioned Lurkers at some point, but because Stats had a fourth base, it's always kind of slowing the pace down always feels a bit awkward. Now, he's got a big army. He's making Banelings, but Baneling speed's not done. Stats is actually pushing right now, which seems crazy to me, but I think he wants to use the upgrade advantage. Oh, Stats messes up so bad. Oh, luckily only loses one High Templar. Okay, he loses an Archon as well. But dude, leaving those High Templar on the low ground, big mistake for Stats. He's trying to push forward. Oh, the, the lack of Baneling speed. I mean, it is it is a good timing. Hitting pre-Baneling speed is massive. The Banelings aren't hitting anything. Nice storms across the front of the Ravages. But pushing in may be giving him the opportunity he needs. Banelings roll in and kill 22 probes. Stats, this may have been an unnecessary counter push that gives this opportunity to Shin. 29 probes going down. Overlord starting to fall here. Shin's got to be careful. Those Overlord's getting wrecked. He's got to fight this army. Those overlords need to get out of there, but he doesn't want to attack into the Archon Immortal. He's trying to bile down the prism. Prism's going to go down. The biles are massive. Stats blinks on top, though. Stats blinks on top. He feels he's just got the numbers. Is he right? Oh, my God. The supply is deathly close. The Ravages. The Ravages are such inflated supply, as are the Roaches. Remember, guys, Roaches are two supply. Ravages are three supply. But they're only each worth about one and a half supply when it comes to combat stats. And stats... Two incredible holds, back to back. He was down 80, 90 supply at multiple points in this game. I, I need to go back and just look at some of those moments. I just want to look at the supply count to benchmark it. He's down. 
<laughs> He's down 60 friggin' 60 supply here. Let's go to 10 minutes. He's still down 55 supply. Here, he's down 70. 70 supply. My god. Upgrades and high attack units, though. Used exceptionally well, despite being spread across four bases. Wow. Let's, let's check the units lost at the end of that game. See what those upgrades did for us, guys. That is huge. 7,000 resource lost advantage. And uh, yeah, just brilliant play by stats. Gets a 2-0. And it was not easy at all. He had to work so hard in both of these games and super clutch play. GG well played stats. All right, all right, all right, gang. We're here with Gumiho in the bottom right side. It's the GSL round of eight, group B. That's the initial match. Match two, technically. Stats and Shin played in the other match. And Kua up here in the top left side. Winner of this plays the winner of Stats Shin. Loser plays the loser. You guys, I'm going to be putting these out in order on my YouTube channel, by the way. So... Obviously, starting at the beginning of the group with Stats Shin is probably a good way to start. If you uh, are coming into this as your first series on me channel over the last few days, should be a couple series in a row. Not sure if we'll post all of them. Obviously, we, we do try to keep the series uh, entertaining. Unfortunately, GSL haven't been getting as many views on the channel, even when there's some real banger series that we post pretty much right afterwards. So we'll keep experimenting with it, seeing what you guys enjoy, what you don't enjoy. Um, who knows, maybe I will actually experiment with putting an entire group up as one video. That might be an idea. Because my, my lovely editor and waifu, um, actual wife, probably shouldn't call her a waifu. Waifu sounds like it's made up, right? Is that just me or does waifu kind of sounds like it's imaginary? <laughs> Whereas waifu is actually the real word? Uh, anyways. So I, 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 know, I know me and her have been talking about, like, yeah, well, why, is this, why is this Maru video getting so low views with the GSL ones? We're looking back at all the GSL VODs we posted, even the Banger, Banger series, don't get that many views. Part of it is, of course, I guess that they are best of threes, so the series aren't as long, but I actually think some of the best games are in GSL, and that's because the players prepare their matches so hard. They prepare their matches so bloody well, and they're so kind of just... It, this, there's, there's the filthiest build orders that you know you want to take on ladder the next day. That That's always been the glory of the Korean leagues is because everyone in Seoul, you've got 20 million people in one city, even if you're as far as, away as possible in Busan on the opposite coast, you get like a two hour train or whatever, a two, three hour train. I've, I've been on the train, not to Busan, but down to, to Pyeongchang before. So that was kind of on that side. It didn't take that long. Basically, you guys can all actually play a lot of tournaments against each other in one city and have a circuit with lots of preparation time. Oh gosh, don't lose it, don't lose it. Yeah, he should get out, just barely. So you can actually set up a, a regular circuit where the players have big downtime between their matches. But uh, obviously in the international scene where everyone's scattered around the world, you kind of fly into a city for at most one week, often only a weekend, two or three days usually. Usually it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday tournament. And uh, as a result, it's much more high impact games back to back to back. And you'll often see someone even in the finals or the semis using the same build orders or at least some of the same build orders that they used in the earlier rounds. It is funny when you talk to guys like Serral and Maru though and Rainer and these, these kind of top guys who win the tournaments, they do hide builds specifically for the playoffs because they, they know they can kind of get there without using their sneakiest build orders. It does give them a big advantage. Three Marines on the high ground. Kumiho chasing with his Reapers. Cyclone's out for both sides. Gumiho's is out a little bit earlier. He's already going a tank. I do like that. Second gas, uh, or third gas, sorry, on the natural for both sides. Kua's is a few seconds later, but his expansion, of course, is earlier. So a bit of a greedier build for Kua. Gets him um, a slight worker advantage. As you can see, he's already starting double workers and mining from the natural just a little bit earlier. His orbital's dropping mules faster as well. On the plus side, Gumiho is going to have a tank drop very fast. And once that, that medevac comes out, I do expect him to swap onto this tech lab, I believe. And then that factory might swap off and build a new one, is what you usually see with this sort of build order. Oh no, he's going to go second tank immediately. Wow. Okay, guys, there's tank pushes. And then there's, I am going to YOLO you. I'm going to I'm gonna just get in there with tanks and marines and try to get some early damage. On this map, you can try to siege up here. You can't really siege across this gap. All you'd get range of is that maybe gas and depot. You could siege over here, but these buildings are pretty far back, so a tank there doesn't reach too many of those add-ons. Mm, interesting to see how this goes. Uh, Raven's on the way, Interference Matrix upgrading. Marine's up in the high ground. The tank in the natural is going to cover the natural, but not the main, and it's the main that you've got to worry about because a tank and four Marines are headed that way. Extra medevacs on the way. More Marines and tanks building. Gumio is playing a wildly aggressive opening. 
It's a little bit of an odd one. The tank does siege up, takes care of that Marine already. He's going to ferry the Cyclones to the high ground. Raven doesn't have Interference Matrix Energy, nor the upgrade. Oh, Cyclone locks on. Very nicely done. Good Reaper Grenade does tickle away at those units. And this tank's going to pull on out of here. Oh, wait, is he just going to pull that to the high ground? He's going to he's gonna ferry everything home. Does he go back for more? Hey, I like this. I love seeing someone not overcommit. He's going to bring two more tanks to the front. Those Marines are going to walk forwards as well. I think this is a build where you send an SCV to build your third command center out here on location as Gumiho. Uh, no, builds it in the main. Okay, very safe follow-up for him. Meanwhile, that third command center starting for Cure at the same time. He's going to start a second barracks beginning his transition into the next step. Stim also beginning for him. And he thinks the attack's mostly over. But dude, this drop, three tanks and four marines in the back? Problem, there's going to be two interference matrixes. If you can interference matrix two out of the three tanks, that's going to be massive. Oh, he's going to get the cyclones and the, and the reapers in here as well. Dude, this is actually an impressively hard position to break. Tanks already shelling on Cure's tanks. Nice interference matrixes do go down though. And that's what I was worried about for Gumiho. Cure shuts it down. Doesn't even lose the third command center. That was absolutely deadly. Beautiful play there. Just locked down on the defense. And all oh, the Vikings are going to chase him out as well. Cyclone does drop. Good damage on that Raven. The Vikings try to block it. But even though he does manage to take down the Cyclone. Getting the Raven well worth it. And the Viking goes down as well. Cure, though, turns around to get a hit on the Medivac, always trying to get whatever value he can. Uh, engineering bays go down, as well as the second and third barracks, but they're much delayed. So much investment in aggression, not to mention only one Raven out so far for Gumiho. He's trying to set up an ambush in the middle of the map with only a single tank. He's got to get out of here. He's been spotted. He's got to get out. Good pullback by Gumiho. Picks up the tank and does run away. Stim. Almost finished for Cure. It's fourth and fifth barracks on the way. Double Engineering Bay going down. You might be thinking, isn't that Double Engineering Bay a little late? It is, but that's because Cure prioritized things. He said, I need to just survive, get extra barracks, get extra marines, get my stim, and then we'll be fine. Gumiho is down two tanks. He's got two ravens, funnily enough, which I wasn't really expecting. Doesn't have Interference Matrix just yet. He's still making three ravens, even though it's so late. Wow. Yeah, I mean, he's going to have the Raven advantage. He's building tanks. He's not too far behind in workers. He has kept Cure on the defensive, which does make it harder to macro because you're so worried about where Gumiho is going to hit you from next. I thought he'd be a bit further behind after these early trades, but if we look at the units lost tab, you can see it's actually quite even. Gumiho's done a very good job of preserving his unit count, not overcommitting. Cure playing as the defender. Gumiho is the attacker so far. Turret on the left. Fourth and fifth reactor coming in. Combat shields is there. 1-1 one, one upgrade slightly ahead for Gumiho. A single marine does spot that third command center coming out. Ooh, guys, he's gone six gas straight away. Gumiho, he really wants to get a second factory up very early, I believe. As well as get the armory for the 2-2 uh, two, two upgrades. Remember, armory's cheaper now. 2-2 two, two upgrades a little bit cheaper on this balance patch as well. Marine's going to come on out. Kira doesn't know that he's here. He got scanned, so he's kind of sensing that his opponent's nearby, which is why he did his own defensive scan. Armory's coming down, and I would expect a second factory to be built here and then swapped onto that tech lab in the near future. Having six gases up so fast, definitely a tech-centric focus for Gumiho. You can see he's a little down on Marines, but with two Raven advantage. And if he can get a second factory up earlier, he will be able to catch up in the siege tanks. Spotting depots, spotting Marines out there on the map. Interestingly, a medevac marine drop moves out, but only one medevac here for Cure. And this begs the question, is it Viking or medevac focus for Gumiho? He chooses Vikings. So he's only gone two medevacs to heal up his marines after they stem very slowly, but it's all about the Vikings. That second factory goes down as well. Yeah, Gumiho is, is very clearly in a much more tank Viking mindset. Whereas even though the Vikings start now, they are at slightly later. And that second factory does go down in the tech lab as well. Cure's combat shields was earlier, so he was able to make that swap a bit faster. It's not a big difference, guys. It's, it's, it's just an extra medevac for, for Cure. It's really pretty much mirrored build orders. I, I'm trying to find the difference and see if there's any direction difference, but really, it's pretty much a mirror matchup at this point. And Cure is essentially the best TVT player in the world that isn't Maru. Clem recently has definitely been looking like he is potentially the best TVT player in the world up there with those two guys. 
but uh, I'd say he's a bit more hit and miss. Nothing near the consistency over the years, whereas, you know, it feels like if Clem has a good week, sure, he can match Maru's level. Feels like Maru never really leaves that level in TBT, though, does he? Kuro, on the other hand, never beats Maru, ever. And that's always been his big weakness that puts a, a bit of a black mark on his name in this matchup. Bit of a crazy drop coming in here. The Ravens... Oh, the Interference Matrixes! All of the Metavax to stop them unloading anymore. There's actually quite a few Marines that already got unloaded. But I think the Vikings do take care of those. Yes, they do. Marines on the right side actually end up surviving. Big push on the front. Two Marines get left there. Oh god, Gumiho's out of position. Even though he cleans up that drop very efficiently. Does it give position to Cure? Yes, it does. These tanks need to siege. Back in the... Oh man, these, these three Marines are doing so much. These three Marines, Gumio's multitasking has always been his weakness, guys. His mechanics are much lower than the other top pros. I've said this many times. His SCVs aren't even attacking. He attacked a single Marine. He didn't A-move on the ground. Oh, God. Same time, big fight on the front. Oh, nice Matrixes, though. Nice Matrixes for Gumio. Oh, my God. He gets rid of all the tanks. He gets rid of almost all the tanks. But does it matter? He's losing 15 SCVs to two Marines right now. Cure F2s the Marines out of the base. Literally, if Cure didn't F2, they would have kept killing Marines and SCVs in the back of that base due to Gumiho not handling it. That is something I am used to seeing at my level of play, but you can see even here with some of the best Terran players in the world, TVT gets bloody intense. That is something straight out of out of low GM TVT. The Marines just going unnoticed in the back of the SCVs, right clicking on a single Marine rather than attack moving. Um, bizarre to see those mistakes there. But you know what? It was a pretty good fight for Gumiho. If it wasn't for those Marines in the back, I think this would be an exceptional position to be in. As it is, he's still on the back foot and he's trying to take a fifth on location. That is not going to fly. Look at the way he look at the way he's staying out of sensor tower vision, guys. See how cure, how, how cure just he waits for the last second and then he's going to stim down there so that there's no time to react. Great move there. Great move. And Cure's going to find his command center and go, "Oh, are you for real?" He doesn't see it. I got cancelled. There we go. Gets cancelled. He's like, "Ah, oh, hello." Now Q is on four commands and as his extra starports are a bit late, notice Gumio is already going double Raven production here. He's got one reactor and two tech labs. So, we, so Gumiho is like, I want to have lots of Ravens really early and spam those Matrixes out. He's only got two tanks on this right side, though. And this sensor tower is not very uh, not very far forward, is it? He needs sensor tower vision out on this right side. He doesn't have it. Oh, this is an easy break right now for Cure. That's a beautiful siege location. He's going to need a ton of Matrixes and a lot of Marines. Is he going to get it? Oh my god, he only gets one! He only gets one Matrix! The Marines did get pulled to the left, which does allow his Marines to close in. So, you know what? It works out. His tank volley was actually kind of deadly. Gumiho does hold on that south side. He's completely open. If those Marines stimmed into that base, Gumiho would have been left wide open. Gumiho is F2-ing like a mad dog right now, guys. It's, it's, he's, he's really leaving himself open. You can tell that Gumiho is very good at taking one fight, but he can't handle the multitasking of Cure. And even though Cure is trading a bit worse in the engagements, if Cure keeps taking expansions, he's got so much map control, and you can tell that Gumiho's whole army... Look, he's leaving his right side undefended, his main undefended again. So if Cure just keeps on this, like, multi prong sort of poking in from multiple angles, it feels like Gumiho, yes, he's got the Raven advantage, he's got very good front-on fights, but look at this. He's only got one medevac. He quickly builds four medevacs now, because he's like, oh god, I don't have any healing. And the whole army pulls back again. This time, at least, there's a tank on the high ground. He tries to drop marines down there to defend it, and Cure just clicks on it, kills the full medevac. Even though Cure loses these units, the unit's loss tab is pretty close, and it does feel to me like Gumiho is definitely uh, a little bit tense in this in this game. Cure looks a bit more relaxed. That being said, double the tank count. That's going to do well for you. You're up in a Raven, and you're building more Ravens. To be fair, he has taken a break from building Ravens recently, so he's only got a couple right now. Upgrades are nearly dead even. And the command center expansions for Cure have been a little slow. It's not that Gumiho's losing this game, it's the fact that when you see a player freeze up like they did in the main with the Marines, and then again with pulling his whole army from left to right, from left to right, it leads to openings in your defenses. Cure right now is stuck on the defense, so he's not going to be able to take advantage of it for a little while. It's a big Viking count. Ten, no Vikings right now for Gumiho. Gumiho's going to stim in this left side. Don't think he's really going to get anything done there. He's just going to go for the sense tower. He should siege these tanks before he just gets jumped on by a superior force. Oh god. Yep, no, that's not going to work. Gumiho with some really sloppy army control there. Yeah, the first moment where he kind of goes for the multi-prong and Cure just looks much more calm and steady under pressure. 
Remember, Cure basically plays Maru every other week in a big tournament. He always gets ahead in two out of three games and then loses pretty much every every game. He'll win a, he'll win a game or two, but he never beats Maru. Cure just has like a psychological I can't beat Maru thing, but he always looks like he's just tighter than Maru in the early stages of TVT. And that says something beautiful about the strength of your TVT. That being said, Gumiho is a tactical mastermind. He plays different. He doesn't play as standard as these guys. And this is a big swing. Q is getting caught out of position. Just as I'm singing his praises, a massive dearth in his map vision gets taken advantage of. And Gumiho is going to siege up and blast that planetary out of there. Oh my lord. This is a very aggressive move forward here for Q. But looks like... Uh, oh, Gumiho. Careful, mate. Careful. Those marines do move in range and get blasted. Gumiho's on five base. Fifth base just got blasted. Kyo's got, you know, the new base coming up top. Lost 24 workers as well. That ain't cheap. Did Gumiho just kill his own unit? Looked like he did. Big counterattack coming through the middle. Big counterattack. Dude, Gumiho's just not watching for it. He's got a siege right now. He's got to be ready for this. He scans the army. He's bringing it home. And, and Kyo knows he's going to get sandwiched. If he stays there any longer, if he moves south there, you know, it's no longer a surprise. You've got to pull back. And that's, that's exactly the correct maneuver. I love this tank. Something to just say, hey, if you're moving around the middle, if he scans, you get some big shots on him right now. But, yeah, gets one shot off. Even that, just, just having a tank in the middle sometimes, it just makes moving around the map more stressful for your opponent. Trying to swing around the left side. You've got to be careful, because now Gumio is the one whose whole army is split up. He's leaving random tanks around just to be a nuisance. Try and scare Kua from engaging on him. Okay, Interference Matrix comes in. I like the stim forward, and then the pull back. Yeah, pull back and say, come on into my tanks, baby. But... Stays a bit far forward. And there we go. Nice spreadies. Counter attack on the right side. Gumiho will take advantage of this. But the Raven counts. Very good for Cure. Seven Ravens. Only five for Gumiho. Getting rid of a few more tanks. It's eight versus 11. At this stage of the game, you really want to get up to four or five factories so you can quickly rebuild your tanks. This has been the big mistake that no Terran player has really added this to their late game TVT. I think I saw Maru do it one time. Viking Raven tank moving forward the middle. Cure is going to lose an expansion. Dude, Q has got to rally back to the natural, which means this top base is isolated. He's counterattacking. Gumio goes for it, but his marines are very wounded. Nice matrixes, though. He does get nice matrixes, but it doesn't matter. His marines were too damaged, and he has no tanks there. Bad fight for Gumiho. His tanks, they're down south. His tanks, they're up north. None of his tanks were in that fight. He should have held back and been more patient. But Gumiho, as I said, a bit too overeager, a little bit too nervous in some of these fights to pull the trigger. And look at that. Gumio doesn't even scan the high ground until a little bit too late. Only gets one or two tank shots off before those tanks go down. This is a beautiful push for Gumio, and I think it might be a game-winning position. Because Gumio's pulled his whole army back, but remember, his marines don't have much healing. They're getting shot down, and this bot south area is, is exposed. Remember, marines could have denied these command centers and held this position. It's not like Kua has a lot of mining, but if Gumio loses all these bases and he's lost the last few fights, suddenly things are looking very bad for him. Kua finding his way back into this game despite a very scrappy early and mid game. Command center goes down, every SCV goes down, and Gumio once again finds himself defending with just his rally of troops, and he goes across the map with a counter attack. Anti armor missile goes down, but he can't fight into siege tanks like this, and Gumio just looking a little bit too desperate in this game. Kua is going to smack on through on the front, hunt down the last command centers, and he will be able to defend. Planetary in the north should be able to hold a lot of time. The command centers can lift up and fly away there as well. If he pulls them back, pull them back, mate. Oh, those command centers. If he pulls those to the left, he should be able to keep them alive. Meanwhile, army coming forward, driving to the natural. Gumio is F. He's just moved his whole army forward. He's just brought every single unit forward. But Kua is going to take this position. Kua will take through the siege tank fight. It looks like at least one of those command centers did go down. Nice snatch for Gumio. Tank gets interference matrix. These tanks will move forward. Kua going to take out that siege tank. Moving forward, the tank's a little bit at a time. He's got a wedge in between Gumiho's bases. Gumiho's in trouble right now. Gumiho is in big trouble in this game. He's bringing a flank around the left to come in from this side. What's he got? Lots of Marines in the natural, lots of Marines to the north. He's setting up for a big surround. This could be a massive engagement. He's going for it. F2, stim, A move, but the Marines weren't ready on the left. Oh, doesn't matter. It's still a good flank. It's still a very, very good surround and flank. Kua does push for the win, ends up getting his army surrounded. But at what cost? Gumio just lost 10 more SCVs. He's got very little mining. Kua still has the northern base. He's retaken the southern base by landing an orbital. A marine drop to the north will force that command center to retreat. Gumio knowing he can't defend it. If Gumio can catch these Vikings and Ravens from returning home, that's a lot of supply right there. That marine alone can kill a Raven, could kill another one as well. Oh, this is huge. This is huge. The Raven's getting caught. He's going to stim on the orbital. 
Kua's army's out of position to the north. Oh god, those Vikings and Ravens pretty much all getting taken out. The tanks need to siege though. Gumio a little slow to the siege up. Oh, and the interference matrixes are good. Three matrixes do go down. Big volley on these. There's only one tank firing right now. The tank does get a shot off though, and he's got a good position. But the tanks of Q are moving forward so methodical on the defense. A Raven gets shot down. Hey, great hot pickup on those Marines though. Gumio gets some value. Marine drop comes in on the north. Gumio has plenty of units to deal with it. These Marines will take care of all that. Planetary especially helping out in a big way. Oh me, oh my, what a TVT this has been. Gumio creates such fun games. I feel like he's not as relaxed, he's not as good at the multitasking, but tactically, he's a mastermind. You know, I feel like Gumio would be one of the best coaches. If we had him as a coach for some of like the best mechanical players, I don't think they'd ever lose. Marines coming in with the medevacs, the cat tanks and the Marines for Cure coming over. Gumio's got a great angle again. Positionally, he's isolating these bases a little bit. anti armor missile only lands on a few Marines, but he might be overextending. His tank's getting big shots off, though. His tank's getting big splash damage on the enemy tanks. He does maybe overextend slightly, though. A lot of his Marines go down. Gumio has to pull back. Income. We've still got one, two bases against one. And actually, he's got some mining up there as well, does Gumio. He could put some SCVs there, but he's down 11 workers. And if you look at the orbital count, Gumio has two, only two for cure. Okay, equal orbitals. Oh, siege, siege, siege. These ravens are getting mad value for cure as well. You gotta realize that value, 2,000 resources lost advantage, that's big. That is very, very big. Okay, I think we're gonna watch from Gumio's camera for a section while I sip some water before my voice just goes kaput. TVT, man, so stressful. Without any uh, SCV count to match Cures, it does seem like Gumio, even though he's re-establishing mining bases, he's down a bit in army supply. They're very similar upgrades. He is building his own Ravens as well, um, but he's a little down in tanks, a little down in Ravens, and a little down in Marines. So Cure has all the advantages right now in terms of base uh, count, in terms of uh, you know army supply, um, a few more tech units. It's not big enough for it to be a wipeout. The, the, the angle still matters, and both players are still so poor that they can't really afford full map vision. You can see just like the occasional SCV spotter or a few Marines getting put out. And you've only got two, three orbitals each. So three orbitals now, they've both made a third orbital on these uh, bases they've floated down. But it's limited scans. You can't just scan nonstop. Now, these are good fights for, for Gumio, right? Because Q is like, oh, I need to see where his army is. But he's kind of bleeding into Gumio's map position. Four Marines on the right. You know, they could kill a barracks. It doesn't really matter if you lose a barracks here. You're on nine barracks as Gumio. You're completely fine for Marine production. Looks like he accidentally built a Reaper. Um, probably a misclick there. Scans that army. Does leave a tank in the middle. And these tanks and marines do come forward. Both sides have stopped building SCVs, but Q is up to 59. So Q really rebuilt a very nice economy where if he keeps taking new bases, he's like saturating them straight away as these other bases mine out. Gumio hasn't done that. Gumio is just building army. And that means he is in a massive income deficit. 500 minerals a minute right now. It's a big amount. Raven count, seven verse five, so much energy. Look at that. It does start on sieging in time, so we can run it away. Oh, get it out of there, Gumi. Eh, stays a little bit long. Gumio doesn't have many scans. I think he might have been dropping some mules, or he just doesn't have that many in, in general. anti arm missile goes down, very cute. Oh, Gumio's just gonna go for it. Interference Matrix, he's going for it. He says, let's fight, let's fight, bro. I actually think there was enough Marines for Kua to fight, but he was afraid because of the tanks sieging up for Gumio. He was like, if I take a few bad tank shots and the anti arm missile, this could be bad. Gumio with a really nice engagement, but he's got, to, he's got to stop chasing now. He's got to just move his tanks forward. You just killed all of his tanks. Now use your tank advantage. Don't fight Marine versus Marine. Kua has more than you there. The tank line is deep. The tank line is deep though. Oh my God, has Gumio done it? He's got, no, there's so many Matrixes. There's only one tank in the back. Oh man, Cure's chance for the Ravens to rain down death. And he will overwhelm Kumiho's army. Wow, that was an exciting fight. The way Cure just held onto his Raven energy until he gathered up his reinforcements and was ready to counter push. And even though Kumiho did a great job of sieging his tanks in a line, when there's an interference matrix for every single siege tank you have, that is a problem. And Cure manages to just wipe those tanks out and do it. Kumiho had to make a play there. He was way down on economy. He hadn't rebuilt his workers. It was the right play. He was just a little bit too far behind. So hats off to both players. Cure for not panicking and stimming into tank fire there at the start of the fight and just being patient, pulling back, waiting for the right engagement. And, and Gumio, I mean, he had to make a play. Maybe he could have rotated around and found a better angle, but, but he was on a timer. 
with so few workers on the map and Cure on a much more established position. So understandable what happened there, but that will be the end of this game. Gumio, of course, it's been a long scrappy game. He's like, maybe, maybe I still have a chance. He's going to hang in there. No, no early leaving for this man. And understandably so. But uh, Cure did a great job of just staying calm through the chaos of this match. And definitely Gumio, a lot more kind of, I want to grab my whole army, jump it on your face, land good raven spells and shut you down. You know, you know Gumio was looking for these like really well-planned, ha ha, I gotcha sort of moments. Whereas Kyuu was just looking to survive through all of those and just be a little bit better at the overall game, the macro, the, the you know, the, the, the taking more bases, recovering, handling the messy situations. And at the end of the day, Kyuu's experience does win him game one in a 25 minute TVT banger. All right, all right, all right. Very impressive game one for Kyuu. There was a few moments where man, those, those Raven Marine jump-ons from Gumiho scared me. Like, and they probably scared Kyuu as well, but he manages to survive and uh, representing Team Liquid in style. Now, of course, Gumio's representing Cloud9, by the way. Should have said these teams at the start of the series, but uh, I, I, I just am amazed that they play on accounts that don't have the clan tags next to them. I think it's very lazy from the players. I think we're really lucky that pro players have uh, sponsors and teams. There have been times where, where top players don't have teams because StarCraft, you know, wasn't being seen as doing so well. At the moment, all the top teams are picking up StarCraft players over the last few months, and I really think the players should be making a little bit of an effort to do so. I don't want to be the one kind of calling them out on, on that, but I mean, how hard is it to make a clan on the Korean server called Cloud9 or Team Liquid, and then actually making sure you're joining that clan so that we can see it next to their their, their name, you know, in, in game, which is... It's surprising to me, but of course, it's not players, you know, main priority representing sponsors. They're like, whatever, I just play the game well. And apparently no one's chasing them up on it. So fair enough. It is what it is. And it's just one of those things when the the, the teams don't want to pick up the players. There is always a little bit of like, oh, why is no one picking me up? And then when the teams are there backing them up and, and supporting them the whole time, it sometimes gets taken for granted. It is what it is. Brave. Uh, thank you, Brave, for the sub, by the way. Appreciate that. Now, Q has gone for a very defensive build again. He said that worked out well. I personally would be a bit more eager to be aggressive after the last game. I, I don't like defending that much. Felt like letting Gumio take the momentum is kind of scary. And I felt like the moments when Q was kind of backstabbing him and doing drops and stuff caught him off guard. That being said, Q might be saying like, yeah, no worries. I'll get the economic advantage. I'll defend and then I'll start doing little drops while being very safe at home, tank sieged up, covering my bases, doing all that sort of stuff. And that could be awesome. All right, SCV's there, two on each gas. So he's putting back on gas pretty quickly here. Now three on each gas. Should be going for that starport momentarily. Cyclone always delays the starport a little bit. So uh, just wants to get that gas up for it. Of course, the factory much later for Cure. And he's just been building Marines one at a time. No bunker. So the Reapers have a chance to do some micro, but with the depot on the high ground and these units here. Let's see, do they go for the SCV? Yes, they do. Hey, not too bad getting yourself an SCV. Wee! Not a bad way to die, man. That SCV is going to Valhalla. What do you think SCV Valhalla looks like, by the way, guys? I mean, I know for Vikings, they're like, oh, we've got mead and there's all this big friggin' meaty haunches and feast food and, you know, uh, I'm sure there's beautiful buxom wenches serving them beer and mead and ale. But uh, for an SCV, there's just there's, is there minerals everywhere? They're like there, there's gold minerals and purple gas everywhere. I don't know. Oh, oh, that was sloppy. That was sloppy as that Reaper gets launched. Gumio leaving his two Reapers there way too long, and loses them both. Those Reapers would have been amazing supporting units for his Cyclones. And a Raven comes out as well. Twitch chat thinks that it's a they, there'd be a sea of oil in SCV Valhalla. They can just lubricate all the joints in their in their suits apparently. Like an oil bath, that's what they need. It's like C-3PO, right? He gets a nice oil bath uh, in one of those one of those old Star Wars films, right? And he's like, oh, this is so good. I'm like, I imagine I imagine maybe that's the same for the SCV. Guys, what chunk? Is that his head? Oh my god, it is, isn't it? <laughs> oh gosh, I love that graphic. When the Reaper gets taken down, it just gets like ripped and there's like a chunk of just viscera and, and, and pieces of spine and stuff, I think, sticking out as the, the helmet of the Reaper floats up. Third command center does start up for Gumiho. Third command center for Cure. You can see he's just waiting for the 400 minerals and he puts that down. 
No big difference between the players. I would say, well, actually, no, no, no. Cure is, is swapping off. So he's only built one Cyclone and he's just building tanks. Whereas Gumiho is still building Cyclones, which means Gumiho kind of needs to get something done with those Cyclones, whether that be picking off a few units or when he moves out, picking off a Raven. Because those Cyclones are going to be a unit that falls off very hard the longer the game goes. And remember, they don't do quite as much damage as they used to. They are slightly tankier at 130 life, but they still die to two siege tank shots directly. A CV Valhalla is literally the exact same thing as life. They're just like, the only difference is they have a big smoke break every, every couple of hours and they're part of a union. So the, <laughs> their leader can't pull the boys. They can't be pulled into battle as a meat shield. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I think that that's probably more than an SCV ever expects out of life anyway. It's going to be one of the worst jobs. Two more factories building. Gumiho, hello. Hello, mate. Are we going to see some mech? Three factories, double armory. You love to see it. Now, if Kua realizes very late what's happening, that's that's what hurts him the most. I don't think this push is very scary because he's got three tanks covering the natural, so unless he's got... Actually... If you just YOLO in here and interference matrix all the tanks, you, you might just win. Dude. Oh no. This is so bad for Cure. His Marines and Raven are up in the main base. If, if Gumio goes for it right now, he actually wins the game. Because he's got three matrixes and auto turrets. Cure doesn't know he's there. Gumio doesn't have the info though, of course easy to say oh yeah he might be able to just kill him and he look he's like i know he's gonna move out to take a third so he's trying to catch him as he moves out to take the third kewan knows it though look how careful he's being yeah i don't think gumio has the opportunity anymore not with four tank sieged gumio pulls back as he sees the tank siege and he's got to just he can't go for the engage anymore no 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 there's no way there's no way Okie dokie, floating barracks to watch for doom drops on the south. No turrets on the north side just yet. That natural is one of the best drop angles. In my opinion, it's way better than dropping into the main. The main is overused as a drop path, whereas dropping behind the natural and into the back of the production is uh, much less utilized and therefore much more effective in general. Fourth command center already building for Cure. Cure did scan the factories earlier, by the way, guys. I didn't even notice that. So he, he knew it was mech immediately. That's why he's playing so safe, is because he knows Gumio wants to slow him down with Cyclones diving on his early units. But by denying that trade, now your Marines are getting Stim, Shields, and 1-1. One, one. You're getting all the upgrades you need. You're getting to five barracks. As long as you just deny the engagements while taking a greedy fourth, there's going to be a point when you're around 150, 160 supply, your army is suddenly so much more mobile. And Gumio, he's like, well, let's take a fourth on location quick. What's he got to cover this? Four tanks? Yeah, he's got three ravens against two, so he's got a single raven advantage. He's got two vikings up here. Are they looking for drops? If so, I'd like him to almost have one there and one down here. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool. Kind of cool way to, to, to look for those. But he doesn't have much tank production. Remember, he's got six tanks. He's only building two at a time. And even right now, he's only building one at actually because he's supply blocked. But those depots finish and an extra tank starts. He's going to try and hold the middle. I like that. I do like, because because this choke is kind of awkward. He's trying to see where he's coming from. Oh, Cure is so smart. Cure is like, yeah, you think I'm going to push you? No, I'm just looking. I'm looking for a bit of map control. That's all I'm looking for. I'm going to go range live Viking. So he's already focusing on Vikings. He's going eight racks, though. I don't like the eight racks. Scan misses the fusion core. It doesn't see it. That's the edge of the scan there. Fusion core's in the back. Oh, damn. I, I do think normally you'd want to go second and third starport. It's a little odd that he's going eight racks first, but I guess Kiwi just wants to have the mixture of bio and Vikings, and he does actually have three starports already. Never mind, I'm blind. I'm, uh, never mind, he, he went three starports and eight racks already. Dude, how is Kiwi's economy so good? Just taking that fast fourth and never missing any SCVs. He's got so much infrastructure already. You might think, well, where's his 2-2? Two, 2-2 two? Two, two doesn't matter. Guys, upgrades don't matter against mech. It's more important if you get the air advantage, win the Viking fight and siege libs, it's game over. So this is actually very smart of Kua to say, let's spend my gas on mass Viking, then libs and lib range. I'll get, I'll get plus two attack for my bio at some point, but it's not a priority. Even if he's got plus two armor for his mech. Gumio's gonna go Thors as a, a way to try help even out the, the, the air. 
But that's still going to be nasty, man. This this early range of fourth starport. And the factory is building a reactor to swap onto it. And a fifth command center. Cure is going straight to the late game counter to this. And Gumio, you can see, is so worried about just surviving. As you should be. When you're playing against uh, a bio like this. I do like the sensor tower. Those marines do get blasted. Ooh, nice lock on onto a medevac. Doesn't really get any kills though. Interesting to see the mech player opening those rocks up so he can move about a little bit more freely. Oh, he's going to get jumped on Cure, a cheeky boy. Gets himself a cyclone, runs in, runs out. Oh, gets another. Eh, he doesn't want to stay too long. Getting closer to Max is Gumio, which is very scary if it wasn't for the fact that six range libs are building at a time. 2-2 two, two now starts along with plus one ship weapons. He's trying to build up to five Thors as Gumio. Those Thors need to make sure they're in single fire mode. I don't think they are right now, guys. I think they need to make sure they're in single fire mode. I don't think his big guns are out off his shoulders yet. And that's that's going to be a problem. If the fight starts and they're in splash damage mode, yeah, they can put some splash on the Vikings, but it's more important to kill those libs from long range. And getting up to an 11 range high impact payload is more important. Hellion's going to run by on the north. They do have blue flame. Going to have to avoid the planetary, though. Eh, not bad micro, just using some like hold position behind the gas. I'd like him to shuffle some SCVs there as well, since some of them are attacking the gas. But a couple of SCV kills ain't bad. Doesn't really cost Gumio much. These Hellions are minerals. Minerals are cheap. He's still only on one starport, though. He's on eight factories, but only one starport. Two more command centers and a second armory building. What scales better, Thors or Libs, guys? If you have equal supply of Thors versus equal supply of Libs... Oh, he's killing his own Marine Marauder to free up more supply for Liberators. Interesting. Oh, Cyclone Alien Tank Push. Going to get a good position for Gumiho. How many Libs? We got 12 Libs. And there is not that many Thors. There's only three Thors on the front. The other Thors are spread across this map or at home or something. They're at home at the rally. Gumiho's got a lot of units spread across this map, not with this push. He's got to be really careful. He's got to be very careful right now. He's going to lose a few tanks here. Two tanks do go down. There we go. More Thors are coming forward. He's building more Cyclones. Cyclones are pretty garbage in the maxed out fights, in my opinion. They are mobile, though. Does get a Raven. Gets the high energy Raven as well. Anti-armor missile is not that scary. 3-3 three, three starts. Plus one vehicle plating. Plus two ship weapons on the way. 3-3 three, is almost done for Gumiho as he starts two more starports. Now, Thor Raven is an exceptional composition, guys. Because you can... Um, your Thors can shoot down their aid. And actually, splash damage mode makes sense now. I actually think splash damage mode might be the better mode for him to set up in right now. Oh, he's in single fire, though. He, is, he does get one splash damage Thor shot in there, which is kind of nice. Because those air units are clumping so much for Cure. That when there's this many air units, having one or two Thors in splash damage mode can actually be really good. If the Libs are pre-sieged, I'm pretty sure they do beat the Thors. Remember that Lib range is reduced by one in this patch. It's eight range, not nine now, I believe is the number. But, but basically, it's one less. So the Thors have 11 range. I don't know. If they come in from the direct opposite side of the circle, they have to walk into range of the circle. But a Lib still takes like five or six shots to kill a Thor. I don't know how the math works out here. I would have loved to you see. This is where the Thors should have taken a few shots, killed a few libs, and then pulled back. Interference matrixes as well. Nice, nice usage of the matrixes. Thors are going to start to fall though. You're going to be careful. Thor's actually got a very good fight. That was actually sick. He lost one Thor. He just killed seven Liberators. Not bad. Cyclone's picking off the sensor tower. This is a really interesting battle. Ah, Liberator Harass. That's going to cause a lot of problems for him. Give me her. Not reacting just yet. Very focused on the front. He's got a great position. Does pull the SCVs away from the south. Over here, he's got tanks on the high ground, which is really nice. Not really doing much with it just yet, though. Thor's are going to move into range and start blasting these libs. Tank will go down as well. Thors are a beefy unit. They're very well-rounded, Thors. Not many tanks to back this up, though. The bio lib sieges on top. Oh my gosh, the Thors got blasted. The Marauders and the Libs going at the same time with no tank support. That was the mistake. The mistake there of Gumio is no tank support. you got to have even just three or four tanks sieged in the back. will wreck those Marauders. But he only had two. And that, that was the issue there. So nice fight. So far, Gumio has lost more units. If we do a tally, 10 Libs for five Thors. I think that's actually a good trade for the Libs. Supply-wise, Libs cost three each. They're 150 minerals, 125 gas. A Thor is six supply, 300 minerals, 200 gas. Um, 
It's definitely more gas heavy for two libs than a Thor by 50. Same mineral count, same supply count. Thor tank trying to hang on here. It's a lot of units though. Hellions coming in. Not going to be too effective against the Marauders. Oh my god, the lib zones. The lib zones! That is so many! We've got 12 Liberators sieged up in one direction. That northern base is going to get taken out by the Vikings. Great move by Cure. We've only got ship weapons starting now. I don't think Gumio should go Vikings. I think Gumio needs to stay on a ground army. If he can mix in a few Widow Mines, that would kind of be nice. And, and I say that because just one Widow Mine splash on the Vikings or the Libs is massive. Obviously, it's not a big part of your game plan because what are the chances he walks into Widow Mines repeatedly? It's not going to happen too much, but just having one or two can be a nice way of zoning those air units a little bit. It's very much low on the priority list right now, though, because Gumio is just trying to survive. He's got eight Thors out right now. He's building three more as well as five tanks. This base has to abandon. Get out of there. That base is done for. Thor's getting a good fight on the left flank, along with the Raven Viking helping to support them. The Vikings, though, have Cure come in, which will smash this fight. But Thor's got a very good angle. Oh, that was beautiful. He's still behind on the units lost, though. These mech units are expensive. But up to 23 libs for six Thors now. Seven Vikings for nine. You can see how these numbers shift based on the engagement. Chat's asking, why not repair the Thors? I think he's just a bit too busy right now. He's got a lot of things going on. There's a lot of things you gotta manage in a StarCraft game and repairing one or two Thors, as useful as it is, can be a little tricky to manage sometimes when you are trying to figure out exactly how to win this game. No, no tanks backing this up. The Bio cannot fight this on its own though. Nice hold position on the Thors, well done. Vikings doing good, they catch another Liberator. Tank does get a shot on the Hellbat. We need Siege Tank production and we need it desperately, mate. Mass Lib Marauders being built. If you have a few tanks in the back, the Marauders don't do jack. The Thor's going to pull back. Not a bad idea. We've got tanks rallying through the middle. This is huge. It, dude, if he brings these random tanks as well that he has scattered around the map, I think it's actually just that one. It's only this one tank back here right now. But if he brings these tanks forward, gets a wedge up here, tanks and Thor's, I don't know if Kua can deal with that. Kua's going to send a lib around the left. There's turrets everywhere blocking it. Turret defense is really good for Gumiho. Gumiho's bases have transferred their workers very nicely. Maybe pull a few off that base is the only thing I'd adjust. Looks like Gumiho's got a forward position and he's doing so well with this massive Thor Viking Raven army. 3-2 upgrades are done for Kua's air though, and that's going to give him some chances. Turrets do catch that Liberator as we expected. Nice matrix for Gumiho. Anti-armor missiles massive as well for the Vikings. The Thor Viking line is letting a lot of firepower out. The Bio comes forward. Dude, it's a very close fight, but it looks like Gumio will win this fight. And that looks like it might be a game-winning position. Uh, this Marina Marauder actually being a nuisance. They're going to kill a lot of SCVs, but he can kill the Planetary. Go up there, kill that base as well. Gumio, I mean, Kua has more money in this game. He can rebuild Libs and Bio, but he's got no Metavacs for that Bio. Every stim is sacred. Oh, he sees this SCV. Even if he just moves one tank over to focus that, that would be great. But Gumio's done a great job showing that Mech can definitely do very well. Gumio did just lose 12 workers. He needs to rebuild a few of those. He's got a Thor on that left side, which he's leaving out. He's building a command center over there. Okay, Gumio's getting a bit fast and loose right now. And he does get rid of that planetary on the right, which is excellent. But he leaves a Thor there. Bit of a waste. Thors are very expensive units. Think of them like battle cruisers, guys. You never want to lose them. You just preserving them and taking the correct engagements with them is the best way to do it. Um... I think Gumio is taking more bases than he needs. He's got so many minerals across these bases, but it's good. Getting planetaries up is great. He doesn't have many orbitals. Oh, he's got seven? Never mind. He's got an insane amount of economy. Gumio has got this in the bag, mate. Plus two ship weapons coming in. I mean, it's pure bio lib. He's got the right mix of Thors and tanks. He's done a very nice job. 23 SCVs went down. Um, less workers for Q. The only thing, so Q is not rebuilding his workers. He's building eight medevacs right now. Mass Air versus Mech. Mass Air is meant to win. I always thought it did win, especially if you catch them by surprise with the first lib swap. But Kua didn't rush to those libs, right? Oh, he did, but he didn't rush to use the libs. Push coming in from two sides at once. Got to make sure your army doesn't get too isolated here as Gumio. I still think you're best coming in from one angle at a time. The Thor, the, the libs are going to come in. It is 14 libs. We've got six Thors there. Oh, the libs are sieging up pretty nicely this time. Oh, he's trying to pull out of the lib zones. 
And he's not really focus firing the libs, which you don't normally want to do, but you can see they were all shooting different liberators. One of those Thors out of range, it's doing massive damage. Thors are going to kill the planetary! The Thors take out the planetary on the left side. He does take out the base. That Thor up there did kill a bunch of libs as well. This is a very expensive army for Gumiho to be losing right now. That's a very expensive army. That Thor goes down as well. The, the mech split push was a wild decision for Gumiho. Mech is best when it's all together, but he kind of allowed Q as planetary on the left to help hold that with, with the help of an SCV. Boipul, Q as economy is scratched though. It's completely gone. But he's building Thors. They take so long to build. The Remax is so slow. He's got to watch out for this counter push. Gumiho's got to watch out. If he gets sieged in his main base, he can't get down the ramp and there's no way out with Thors. He needs to fight in wide open areas. Oh, his SCV pool gets caught. He's trying to transfer to the top middle base, the mad lad. The Thors are coming out. They're not all in high impact payload yet. Oh my god, this lip siege is brutal. That lip siege is so good. The Thors, they're all in splash damage mode. They're not doing much yet. Okay, now they're in single fire, but the Libs are just going to siege on top. There's a lot of bio. Gumiho's Remax is too slow. His Remax is too slow. The split push was a bad idea. It looked kind of cool. It killed a lot of bases and economy. But the split push was a bad idea because look how quickly the bio lib re rebuilds and look how quickly it counterattacks across a small map like, map like Oceanborn. That move of Gumio might have worked on a really big map, but on a small map, it doesn't work out because Thors take friggin' forever to build. Bio lib counterattack does it after losing a lot of fights and a lot of bases. Man, it looked like Gumio had the answer to the composition. Kua didn't know how to win compositionally with this i think he needed to use ravens as well to be fair because it went so late into the late game i think if you rush just mass lib you can hit a timing attack with it but he let there get too many thors out in too many good positions i think you had to go ravens to actually interference matrix the thors because if you come in think about it a two supply unit interference matrix is a six supply unit thors are incredibly weak to interference matrix it's it's basically the best value so this is, uh, this is obviously game, you know, it's, it's completely game over, which is, I'm talking about what Kua should have had to do to win this game and what he was kind of doing wrong, even though he's winning. Some people, they, they don't like that. They get angry at me in the comments. They go, he's winning! Stop talking about what he could have done better! No! That's okay, guys. I'm going to continue to ignore you, people who say that in the comments. There's not many. It's like two people. Probably shouldn't even talk about them, to be fair. <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, nah, it's 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 true. Kua was losing that game, and Gumio just uh, he overcommitted with a split push, and uh, he was in a, a a big big spot of bother. I thought it was a GG before he lost his Thors. Someone says, in "Oh, I'd love to hear the explanation of that." Gumio had the game in the bag; he was miles ahead. As long as Kua wasn't willing to build Ravens, Kua was uh, was losing that game, and we we saw it in the previous trades as well as Gumio's big economy advantage and base count advantage he had before he split push the split push threw the game away in my opinion but as it is q is going to take this one man really decisive obviously i mean he's trying to rebuild factories in the top but i think he's uh he's kind of screwed vikings coming there as well vikings landed chat says oh i think he means gg and that gumio wins oh yeah for sure okay if it's I, I thought you were you were disagreeing and i was like i'd love to hear the argument for that I, I think if Q is building Ravens, you could make it, maybe make that argument. But uh, without the Ravens, I just don't think there's a way of taking care of it. But I, I do remember Thor Raven. Ryung used that against Clem a couple years ago in the team league. Um, and uh, it was it was legendary. It was so good. And I, I'd never seen it before. And I was like, wow, I didn't realize this is so good. But it destroyed because he was interference matrix the enemy units and, and Clem didn't have any ravens of his own he was trying to use like range libs and stuff like that but uh definitely he was just using it for a, a mixture of interference matrixes on any enemy thors but also the libs he was interference matrixing and uh Gumiro did have some ravens in this game but you can see he's just so outnumbered I mean this is not even a match at this point uh and that is going to be pushing in and overwhelming tried to rebuild his economy in the top right Gumiro played a fantastic series and I love seeing mech and, and you know how many people do we see play Mass Thor up against range libs, very rare. A really cool, unique, interesting TVT, and this match made me very happy to cast. So thanks for both players playing such a good series. Q against the 2-0, but man, the, the, the scoreline does not do justice to how back and forth and fun that series was. All right, all right, all right. What the hell is going on, everybody? We've got ourselves the winner's match of the GSL. A round of eight, Group B. Q in the top left side. He's going to go Barracks Gas on Sight Delta up against the Shield of Ire. The man we're all cheering for. Stats in the bottom right. I say we're all. Obviously not everyone, but 
Oh, we went Nexus before gas. Hello. Hello, cute opening. This one's a little bit more economic. You get that Nexus up early. And, and this does transition nicely into the um, the old three gate that Parting used to do back in 2021. I can't remember if you got it. I don't think you got a second gas with that build, though, did you? Did you? No, that was a one gas build. So this is a slightly different one. I think he's just getting the Nexus up nice and early. Slightly more economic start. And only scouts for the closest proxy racks, which... Dude, you're playing Cure, the guy who's going to 100% proxy Marauder you at some point. He does this every series he ever plays. Taking the risk of, like, not scouting properly against him is so dangerous because Cure has, like, a 1 in 4 chance in a PvT of building two barracks here, making Marauders, and then just killing you if you don't scout. It's, it's such a scary strategy, but Stats loves to skip scouting and just be a bit more efficient in his opening. He's chronoing and adapt out. He's got Warp Gate started. Main base fully saturated. And you do get earlier probe production, earlier chrono boosts, and you can rally probes to your natural so fast with this version of the build. And his adept still pops out pretty fast at 224. It's actually really good. Marine into reactor, into third CC. Dude, Q is playing. Guys, I, I, I really am amazed. This patch, the Widow Mine change, the Cyclone change, and every Terran in Korea has one mode now, which is greedy three command center play. And they're giving so much room for Protoss to breathe. And I kind of don't feel they need to. Yet somehow, I guess that Widow Mine change in practice has really affected things. It's weird. Because, you know, I've been watching a lot of Max Packs. And, and, and there's the Terrans have no respect in Europe for the Protoss players. And the Protoss players have clearly not earned that respect. But it's like from within a day of the patch dropping, every Terran in Korea is scared in how they're playing. They're scared, they're defensive, they're turtly. And it's so weird to see the difference in the metas between the regions. Nice snipe there for stats. Gets rid of one of them. Gonna go after these SCVs. Deny a bit of mining time. Even just making him pull off minerals is great. And then he shades away. Beautiful play here. Looks like he got himself just the one Marine though. This Marines ain't gonna do much. I like the way he pulled back from the Adept. Knowing he wasn't gonna get any damage. So he didn't want to waste any of his own hit points. And we are going for three gate robo right now. Wait, wait, wait. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's a three gate robo? Okie dokie, Prism. He's going to do this, the blink, no blink. Guys, he's going to do a four stalker drop into Colossus, into a third with a bunch of observers. It's not a bad way to play. It'll give him some forward pressure and some vision and there's not going to be stim for a long time. So that's good. Third barracks with the tech lab on the way as well. Robo Bay coming down. This building placement, definitely want to see another pylon in here at some point powering these buildings. But for now, it's okay. Shouldn't really be getting these depowered this early on. He's looking for a third base quite fast as well. Transferring workers onto gases, stats. Notice he's prioritizing his minerals first, though. Adept still shading forwards. We've got the stalker drop coming forward. I guess it's going to be two adepts, two stalkers, most likely. Oh, we actually left some stalkers at home as well, in case there's like a widow mine drop, because he doesn't know what he's up against. And you know what? Two adepts and a stalker is enough to one shot an SCV or a, a marine. So actually, as long as he's got that lethality, that's fine. He sees it, he sees the third command center, knows what he's up against. It's a scary marine count. You have to be quite wary. Gets an SCV, picks up and pulls away. Good choice. And nice hot pickups on these. Gets another marine. Well done. Third Nexus is on the way. Observers are building. First Colossus coming out. So two observers into Colossus. I, I, I really don't like these build orders from Terran because it does feel like it gives Protoss so much room to get established in the game. And I mean, we've got a third base at 430 and Colossus on the way. And a forge on the way. Like, it does feel like Protoss is having an easier time in Korea just getting to the middle stages where they thrive. And I always thought Q were playing very standard kind of three barrack style openings before the third command center was his strength. But he could absolutely surprise me. He could show me he knows how to do this very well. I, I really feel like Hero's uh, weakness in some of the games I've watched, uh, as well as like Classic and a few of the other guys on this new patch, uh, Max Pax as well, has been not knowing what to do in the end game. If it does go to like five, six bases, Terran's building lots of commands and is going for range libs. I really hope one of these matches goes there because I want to see what Stats does there because Stats was at the top of his game in 2016, 2017, 2018. There was a lot of like standoffish situations where you were using Tempests and Storm in late game. Things which we don't really see the modern Protoss players in the last few years pretty much ever use either of those units. It's very rare. Prism has been pinned in the back. I mean, you know there's going to be a Viking coming out soon. So you probably should recall this as stats. I guess he's just relying on reacting quick enough, but it's a little dangerous. It is a little dangerous. Luckily for him, Q is going Metavax first. 
Second Colossus on the way. Charge is coming in. No blink. So there's no real anti-air control. Dark Shrine goes down. Wow. Okay. Okay. Dark Templar can be very effective. Observer is going to get sniped. Stats should pull that away. <laughs> yeah, he's <laughs> just waiting for scan energy there. Kills it. Picks up. Drops to the right. There's an Observer on path, though. Stats should see this. Let's go to Stats Camera. This is Stats Camera. He sees it. He sees the double drop. Oh, there we go. He spotted it. Yeah, yeah, he spotted it. He's going to recall his prism, move his whole army to the right side. Now, with no blink, you cannot punish these drops. So, Cure, he can drop around as much as he wants. He sees the Colossus. He sees the third base. He should realize there's no blink. I can keep being very aggressive. As long as I don't actually let the Colossus land swipes on me, I can really scare the Protoss. Clean up some pylons and be as irritating as possible. Fourth Nexus is kind of greedy. I got to be real. Oh, oh, Cure! Oh my god, very greedy, but not crazy greedy. That medevac gets shot down to the bottom of that pond right there. And that's huge. Because stats, like I said, is, is at a very low army supply, or was. But he just killed 10 army supply of Terran. And, and he's actually forward on the map, which seems kind of crazy. But you know what? He's down 10 workers, so actually maybe it's not. Oh yeah. Guardian shield pops off. Oh man, this is actually nice. He's got a second Robo, a, sec a Forge. He's making DTs. I think he's going to use those for an Archon. No, he's going for a DT Zealot drop. So he's going to attack the right with his main army. Zealot DT drop on the left. He's still only on 65 probes. Wow, because he skipped the gases on his third. So he's still got some probes on the fourth. And he's going to be able to build more probes behind this if he chooses. Oh, big army coming. But he's got force fields. So he can just easy... Oh, I didn't like those force fields as much, but that's okay. Get some good shots. Prism flies in. Prism flies in, and he drops the Zealot DT. Nicely done. A Zealot and a DT in the main. The DT will go down, but he's going to drop one in the natural as well. That's a speed Prism, guys. Oh, he's doing good damage in the army. Still there on the front. He's got to be careful. It's a big army, but I think he's out of sentries, and he's got no warp in to reinforce. But dude, with the DT Zealot doing damage in the back, this is a great move. Look at that. Yeah, he pulls back everything, but lets the Colossus use that nine range. They go far forward, though. A bit too far forward. He almost loses one, but no, it's worth it. It's worth it. It is so worth it. The Colossus are roasting. He finally loses one. But I mean, at what cost? Cure's army has been destroyed. The Zealots and DTs are still in the main. The Prism did go down, but he already got the warp in off. And that is massive. Cure just has to tap out. Stats looking powerful. GG, well played. All right, clean opening for both sides. Very standard stuff. Oh, Stats is looking for the eBay. But not only is he looking for the eBay, he's staying there. He's going to go Nexus before Core. Which is really good if your opponent doesn't go Reaper first. If they go Reaper first, it can be, uh, some people would say, a little bit dicey. But notice he's doing it on 19, not 20 supply. If you are going to do Nexus before Core and you want it to be a little safer versus the Reaper, go Nexus and Cyber Core on 19. And it just speeds them both up just enough that your Adept isn't too delayed. Ooh, okay. Got to get out of there with that probe now. The blocking is over. Notice he spent all of his time blocking before Cure even had the money to put the Command Center down. And then he runs back before regening minerals. So Stats just did a whole bunch of micro blocking a command center that literally could not physically exist due to the state of Terran's money at that stage of the game. The reason he was blocking it is a lot of Terrans go marine first. They cancel the marine, get the 50 minerals back, and so they can start the command center earlier than normal. That's what he was trying to block. So there was a reason for what Stats did there. It was incorrect with what we know, but he doesn't know that it's a Reaper instead of a marine. Now, losing the probe was unnecessary. That was obviously just a bit of a mistake for him, but it is what it is. Stalker first. Stalker warp gate. Are we going to just see Robo first again? I've been loving Robo first for a while. A lot of people have told me it's not a good opening. It's not great. You have to open Blink. You have to open Stargate, Phoenix, one or the other. Um, I feel like Robo is kind of the safest. Oh, this is a Twilight, though. This is not a Robo. He's going Sentry first into Twilight. So it's a delayed Twilight, I believe. Technically, you can go Stargate after Sentry. That's the 300 IQ mind game because no Terran expects you to spend 100 gas on a Sentry and then still spend 150 gas on a Stargate because that is so expensive. Twilight it is, as you would expect once you see the hallucination. Two Marines on the way. Starport as well. That mule gets pulled off. Very nice. Very, very nice. Reaper's over there as well. Stork is hanging out. Second gate at the front. So this is this is going to be a bit more of a standard game for stats. Um, expect a Robo to go down here, probably after Blink. Oh, three. Oh, hello. Three gate Blink. Three gate Blink with a, a delayed Robo. And I, I mean, I guess I like it. If, if you've got a Sentry doing Hallucination, which he, he's hiding from the Reaper on purpose, 
Try and delay that getting scouted. He's going to try and scout and go, hey, if I don't need a robo, why would I build a robo, man? He doesn't even necessarily need to be aggressive with it. He could, he could though. Because about a minute and a half from now, so just after five minutes, you're going to have enough energy for another hallucination. You can use that to still blink in the main. So you can still do some pressure, kind of like it. You've got a robo with a prism spotting the high ground. You can still blink in the main once or twice. Uh, be a little annoying, but of course it's uh, nowhere near the same level. Now he's looking for Oracle with these units, guys. Wow, Cure. He's looking for an Oracle up there, just in case it is that. I'm going to send a Widow Mine drop across the map. I'm not sure if Stats noticed that coming or not. Two Stalkers and a Sentry out of the map. He still goes Robo. So it's just an incredibly safe build. Robo into four gas before third Nexus. Very controlled way of building up. Bunker on the natural. Engineering Bay goes down. This is more what I like out of Cure. Standard three racks. I think he's so good at keeping the pressure up with these builds. And if the Protoss is a little too greedy, finding the kill. Otherwise being very defensive. Widow Mine drops going up north. Pylon will finish soon. May spot the Medivac if he's not careful. He sees it. Stat sees it. Slight mistake for Cure there. But he's not on the edge. Oh, you got to be on the edge on this, this map. There's so much dead space around the back. <gasps> Ooh, cute little run by. But the Stalkers do reposition. And that Medivac's just going to hang in the very back. Stalkers actually can't see it as well. So you can boost one way or the other. Which is why Stats has to spread those Stalkers out. The fish there. In a school anticipating future units to chew on. Oh, oh, bad Stalker movement. Stalker movement, not good. Eh, much better to lose probes than stalkers. Stalker costs more than three probes, guys. Let's get rid of that. At least the, the mines will go down. Medivac is forced to retreat. It's not terrible for stats. He does have his third on the way. He's going to go forge behind it. And that Robo Bay is already up. Cure did not build a tank. He did not feel threatened at all. So Q has been able to just go straight into three racks bio Medivac, which is very dangerous. Because it basically, if you go for a tank and a raven, you build a bunker here, maybe a bunker here because you're afraid of forget the medevacs, the stim, the shields get slowed down. Instead, at six and a half minutes in this game, he can be on the proto side of the map looking very scary. And if that Colossus gets left unsupported or anything like that, he can stim on it, kill it, and, and suddenly, bam, stats is basically dead. He's already moving out pre-six minutes. This is really nice for him. Stats does have blink at least, but he's going to blink into the hedge. Ooh, okay. You see that blink? Not very good there, was it? <laughs> Not a lot of distance covered. The Robo needs to get back to the middle of the map to track this army, is what I'd say. He's going to use his Stalkers, though. Stats very good at kind of cleaning the map up like that. Charge is coming in, as well as four more gateways. Stats forces a stim out of a few units, pulls back, and the double drop goes to the left side of the map. This Observer is huge. That's going to see that there's not much bio there. He's going to be like, hey, you sent a drop to the left. If Stats is watching... You should realize, where are the medevacs? Yeah, look at that. Great scouting and read by stats. He's like, hey, I've got five stalkers. That's enough to two-shot a medevac. But Q is actually unloaded. Third command center building on location for Cure. Eight worker advantage for stats. Plus one weapons is done. Concussive is done. Plus one armor starts. Widow mines are on the way. Second Colossus is about to eject itself from the Robo. Here we go. Big drop coming in. Stalker's not quite in position. He's going to two-shot one of the medevacs before all the units could unload. Goes for the other one. Needs to run those probes. Zealot warping in is a nice move. Ooh, the Zealot warping is actually really nice. You know what? He doesn't really lose any workers here. He's going to pull back to the right side. Drop goes into the main, though. There's two Stalkers ready for it. There are two Stalkers ready for it. He's trying to get in around the top. Two Stalkers will, of course, not stop a drop in of themselves. Uh, Observer here sees that there's not many units alive. Colossus clean that up. Drop's waiting to go into that main base. So far, the trading is in favor of stats. Very good vision management by him. That Observer build time buff might not seem big. Getting the uh, Observer out, having it in the right position. Excellent play by stats. So he's thinking about a fourth base again. My gosh. He's loving this. Just get the fourth established of three mineral lines, four garrus. Go for the double forge. Go for the dark shrine and play it from there. It's a good style. Stats is finding a lot of success with it. Drops in the back. Drops in the back. Oh my god, he's just sitting there. Cure, what are we doing, mate? Cure, what are we doing? Oh, damn. Giving him so much time to prepare. At least he forces the recall and doesn't lose any units. But that was very sloppy. Sending more medevacs to kind of join up here. Oh, he's trying to, he's trying to triple drop. Triple drop is very dangerous because it's hard to micro. 
uh, don't get me wrong, you can catch them out of out of position and do really well. He's just going to drop here to kill the fourth. That's a good move. At this point, just go for something a bit more conservative, a bit more safe. Stop trying to split up and, and catch Stats out of position because that seems impossible. Just denying the Nexus a good move. Stats is supply blocked here. Ooh, force fields tried to trap some of those units. Not quite able to get it. Plenty of Stalkers in the main, though. You don't want to drop into that many Stalkers. It's not quite nine. Two more Stalkers gives that the, the one-shot lethality, but... Oof. Still very dangerous the way Q is playing this game. He's up in workers, though. So this pressure has really kept Stats in a, a bit of an awkward position. Stats is going to go for that Speed Prism DT drop. There is a turret in the natural. No turret in the main. Ghost Academy does start up. 2-2 two -two starting as well. A lot of these Terrans are going faster upgrades since that did get buffed. He's going to drop on the Nexus. Uh, I think this works out for Stats if he pulls the Colossus back. Oh, the Force Fields barely save it. Uh, you got to get out of here, Cure. This is a bit of a crazy move, dude. Staying to fight here is insane. There is no reason to do that. He just threw away a lot of army. He's behind in the trading quite badly. Oh my gosh! Oh, I'm sorry, that was kind of comedic. Seeing a prism fly into a turret for Vikings and a pack of bio, and it was filled with Zealot DT as well, so that's kind of painful for stats, man. Ties up the units lost to have DT, only gets a few SCVs. Ah, nice hunting down of this double drop, does get rid of them. Stats economy is not great. He does have second forge, he's got a second robo on the way. I love the way Stats is building forwards in the game because it, it really feels like his goals just make a lot of logical sense in terms of like establish the fourth and then probe up with the double upgrades, the DTs to try to get your opponent a bit defensive, put on some pressure, and the second robo for the disruptor production that's going to anchor your army in the late game. Cure though, he's building a lot of ghosts. Dude, I can't believe this is the winner's match on Stats. If he wins this game... He goes to the top four of GSL, and he's officially back. I mean, already being in the top eight, people are saying, that's his back. But I feel like winning two best of threes in the round of 16, as impressive as it is, is not as impressive as winning a few best of threes against the guys who made it to the round of eight. If he can do that, that would be huge. 2-1 upgrades are on the way as well. Widowmine's pumping out. Five racks going. Zealot Stalker, Colossus Disruptor. Ooh, good Widowmine hit. Oh, he gets it! That's a, another prism going down, man. And another one bites the dust. Has he queued up a second one? Nope. He's like, screw it. Plus three attack, plus two armor on the way for Protoss, but just starting, whereas 2-2 is finished for Terran. Kua has nine Vikings. There's only three disruptors. Kua's army is better. Definitely feels like he's better. Stargate starts. So Stats is thinking about that Tempest transition for the late game. Realizing this game is going to go long. Hard to actually force an engagement, though. You gotta kind of dodge a few disruptors, and then you can basically A move this army as cure. You need to get rid of the disruptors before you commit. Oh, he gets rid of a... Already... Already a Colossus goes down. That's big. That's big. Colossus falls. Gotta be careful. Oh, he gets another one! Oh, no. Stats. He's in huge trouble. Another Colossus goes down. Big disruptor lands on the front line. But it's all about disruptor stalker zealot sentry now, which we know is not a good army. Good split on the zealots. Against the Widow Mine. But you, ah, this is, so this is something we occasionally see a Protoss player when they realize the Viking count's too high. They grab all their Colossus, they send them back to their natural, and they just leave them out of their army. And they try to hang on with their other units. And then once the Vikings are dead, then they bring them back to the fight. It's, it's a weird thing because it wastes a lot of your supply, but it is super efficient if you can pull it off. A couple of Marauders and Marines get picked off. Two Widow Mines picked off. Disruptors are doing a good job. As long as you're fighting around this choke point, that's great. Kua should break these rocks on the left. And maybe these ones on the right. So we can start threatening to surround this army. But map control is great for stats right now. He's got zealots, pylons all around the map. Army in the middle. Disruptor counts up to five. And there we go. That's the fleet beacon I was talking about. Guys, he's not building a second Stargate. This is not a Tempest transition. This is a mothership transition. A second Stargate and a Cybercore does go. Okay. He's, he's, okay, he's just a little bit slow on the Stargate. There we go. He's going to go four Stargate. Uh, I would imagine Tempest first, but it could be carriers first. Carriers are not bad. Second Cybercore for air upgrades as well. He should be making plasma shields eventually, but maybe not the biggest priority against a guy who's going to blanket EMP across your entire army. Second Starport's on the way. He's still building Vikings, interestingly. Probably expecting Colossus to be rebuilt. Doesn't want to catch him, get caught in that position. 3-3 three, three is almost done for Cure. He's got a fourth base, but he doesn't have like a lot of orbitals, and he's only on 67 SCVs, so... As good as Kua's army's been, he hasn't done anything with it. And I feel like Stats is teching up way harder 
plasma shields, plus two air weapons, plus one air armor. And, and I mean, stats definitely does not need to be oh pushing right now, but the fact that he's able to threaten it, it's actually very impressive. I, I kind of feel like Kua could surround this army and jump on it, though. Splits an army south, a big one, too. Carriers, indeed, is the transition. Two carriers do start up. He's trying to build more, but he is, of course, supply blocked. A bit low on gas as well with all those upgrades going. Zealots on the right side. Few of those might get tagged. Cure a little slow to pounce, though. Only gets one of them. Ooh. Oh, God. He's pushing forward. Crazy man stats. Blinks to dodge the Widow Mine. Nicely done. He's putting his army in a very vulnerable position. Going to throw that for the Widow Mine. Nicely done. Army's going to flank him. Yeah, this is, this is bad for stats. If he stays out here any longer, it's so dangerous. This is exactly why. He's going to just jump on the army on the left. That's crazy. Oh, first disruptor shot gets a few marauders. He's keeping the army back on the right and just fighting the army on the left. This is actually working out pretty well for stats. Kua cannot bring his forces in from the rear despite that. You see what happens when it's just zealots and stalkers trickling into the bio on the left. As I said, he shouldn't have been that far forward on the map. That being said, that being said, that being said, he he's actually traded out not too badly. He's ahead in the units lost. And most importantly, he's cleared up supply to properly start the carrier swap. And this is against the Terran who has no idea this is happening. He's building Liberators to counter Disruptors. He doesn't have Mass Command Center up, no Orbitals. I mean, Cure is not progressing to the late game, and Stats is. And Stats is simply preparing for the late game. Cure isn't. If Cure doesn't get some big damage soon, it's going to really hurt him. This is a sixth base. You can't even deny the sixth base. Oh, two Marauders and a Widow Mine. Juicy Disruptor shot. Army on the left rallying over, but it's, it's a rally of units. It's not that powerful. He's going to recall to the left. I think he's going to give up his sixth base. Disruptors. Careful, mate. Oh, God. Stats. Oh, God. Big mistake. Luckily for him, Q is not watching. Q only gets one disruptor. Top right base does go down. Bottom left. Stalker Zealot chasing right now. Should be pulling back. That's not a lot of Zealot Stalker to be chasing with. He does have six carriers, so maybe he's like, screw it. Let's just fight right here, right now. Disruptors are going to try and defend the army on the left with cannon battery, but no cannons up yet. Oh, God. Oh, God. Q. Oh, my God. Q goes for the gamble and gets it. He gets it. Uh, you could say it's a gamble, you could say it's just perfect judgment, knowing you could get in there before those disruptors got their shots off, and Stats is deep, deep in D-Town right now. He was in such a good position preparing for the late game, but now he's back to four bases, 58 probes. He does have six carriers up with good upgrades and, and, and four more building, but he, if he loses this base on the left, he is deeply screwed. Carriers jump on the army on the top. He loses a carrier. Oh god, he's losing a carrier. If he loses a second one, that's so bad. He's lost two carriers. Like, yeah, he's going to win the fight. But at what cost? Can he defend on the left? No. Oh, Kua looking fantastic. I actually thought Stats might just run away with this game because Kua was just so stuck in the mid game. Even though he took a fifth base, he's just not building orbitals. He's not really going for like three, four starports. He's just two starports, eight racks, fusion core. And I didn't think he was going to find an opening, but he finds an opening at the perfect time. Stats taking this base up here was a bit of a mistake and he split his army poorly. It was a lazy split. It was an old man split for stats. I'm going to send my whole army here and just my disruptors there on their own. He just misjudged it. He thought maybe the cannons would get up in time to support it, but he needed some zealot warpins or something to help stop that bio just jumping on his face. And it was a clutch move for Cure. He saw the opening. He finds it. He catches it. And, well, the carriers. Great pullbacks. He gets one of them out on nine hit points. Dude, there's not much that shoots up here. There is not much that shoots up here. Uh, Kua needs to get out of here and build pure marine viking right now. He's, he's still building a lot of marauders. Don't tell me stats wins with carriers. Seven vikings, five building? I don't think so. Even if you lose this base as Kua, you've still got this base. As long as he defends this base, he should build a few turrets or something there just to anchor it. Try to run the SCVs to buy time. And, oh, he's going to pull back. I thought stats was all in, but he apparently feels like he can, he can try to recover by rebuilding this base. I don't know. I almost feel like the all-in was his best shot. He's not really probing right now. Blinkson gets a medevac, but loses a few stalkers for it. The Marauder pack, very scary. He's got two, two, one air units, soon to be plus three air attack. He's chrono boosting it. I think he wants to actually push with, because he's not probing. He's Yeah, he's just going to make Archons. So he's, yeah, he's going for an all-in. So basically Stats is like, no, no, no. We're doing a plus three carrier all-in. That's my timing. There's only plus two ship weapons for the Vikings. Stalker Sentry can also help against those. Guardian Shield will help a lot. Seven carriers with plus with, with three, two, one, and a dream. Can he do it? Guardian Shield gets off, but EMP already lands on one of those carriers. That carrier at the front needs to pull back. It's going to go down so fast. The carrier does get focused down, but 
The carry interceptors are kind of all launching right now. Turret's actually doing good damage. The Vikings, oh man, they take out another carry. There's only four carriers left. Three carriers left. Two, oh, two carriers left. And that's not going to be enough. The Stalkers go down to the Marauders. It was a valiant effort and a nice transition from starts, but not good enough. Q is going to, wait. I mean, sh Income? Wait! <laughs> I mean, surely these carriers aren't enough to win this with just six stalkers coming in to reinforce, but he's killing economy. Q has this base mining, half a base mining there. Those minerals are gone. Q needs a new base. What the hell, man? Dude, is he actually going to get this command center? Dude, this game is so wild. I I'm loving how unpredictable this is. I'm loving how unpredictable this group has been so far. This is awesome. Stats is just hanging in there. He's making a DT right now. Oh, God, that Widow Mine's going to ruin his day. Oh, hello? Oh, the retargeting micro. Hello. You have to pull all the probes away so he doesn't have the option to do that. Dark Templar's going south. He's going to try and hit the economy. But there's a planetary. There's a planetary with a turret behind that. Looks like he gets rid of the Widow Mine. Two carriers and 14 stalkers. I'm going to go out on a limb, guys, and say stalkers aren't it. I don't think Stalkers are going to beat Bio Ghost. I, I think Kua has this in the bag. He's got such a better army. He's got plus three ship weapons now as well. And uh, definitely a nice attempt from behind for stats. Almost rallied back in this game, but this is so hard to push. He's going to need an awesome engagement. Kua doesn't want to just headbutt into the battery, which is smart. You, you've got bases you can float around. You can harass up north. There is an observer behind him, which is great. Stats is going to clean up that observer. Oh, that widow mine, sorry. And then move north. Going to send a few zealots south. Not a bad move. They could easily beat a few marines. Yeah, it does get on top. Remember, he's got 3-3-1 three, three, on the zealots. Even one zealot could beat most of those marines. Ooh, stalkers, careful. Zealot warp in does come in. Maybe a bit too far forward for Cure. Doesn't have that much bio. The MPs on the stalkers would be lovely. MPs on the carriers, the Vikings, oh, the Vikings just blast them down. Even with the pullback micro, it's not enough there for stats. Stalker's getting gunned down at the same time. Yes, the Zealots just killed 15 workers on the other side. But the Bio Ghost is just enough. EMPs, the Zealots that are warping in, the Vikings land to help out. Hail Mary Disruptor gets a few Vikings. Not bad. Not bad. Stats is trying so hard for the hot pickup to dodge the Disruptor. Nicely done. Zealots coming back from their counterattack to intercept the rally. A nice move for stats. A lot of nice moves for the Shield of Aya. But it looks like here in this game, the Shield of Aya will finally be broken. Uh, underneath Cure's just furious, furious blows. But man, he tried so many drops and so many moves, and he just wasn't finding the mark. I thought stats had the game in the bag. At the end of the day, Cure does find the opening. And a lot of people get demotivated when they don't find openings. Cure was cool as a cucumber. Just waiting for that opportunity to present itself. Ha ha ha. <laughs> yeah. EMP clicks on the disruptor. Kira shuts that one down. Ties up the series one to one. We're getting a game three, baby. All right, all right, all right, guys. In the top right, Kira going for a double gas. A bit more of an aggressive stance in game three. Stats in the bottom left. Going for the 19 Nexus again. Probe comes in to try and scout. Check what he's up against. And there we go. Nexus on 19. I like this, man. I think I'm going to start doing the 19 Nexus. 19 Cybercore. Seems like a, a good kind of middle ground build because I hate going core first. It just doesn't feel right. <laughs> I know Harstam's with me. Harstam always says it just feels bad when you have to go core before Nexus. And I see Max Packs, like just every game goes core before Nexus no matter what. And I'm like, oh man, if you could get away with some Nexus before core builds, it's such a good boost to your economy. But uh, it is it is a little more exposed. All right, what do we got? Interestingly, he's sending this probe to the natural. Is he looking for bunkers? I think he's looking for bunkers down there. Why is he not mining the second gas for that probe? He hasn't fully checked. Oh, he's building a blind shield battery. I guess because it's, it's double gas. He knows it's a double gas build. He loses his probe. So he's like, yeah, I'll build a battery just to be completely safe. I don't think the battery is necessary, but I, I wouldn't say it's like, oh, this is so bad. How dare you, sque you squeeze a battery? It's like, we know the Terran's delaying his command center by 40 seconds. We went Nexus before court. We feel pretty good about the situation. 
He's happy to lose that probe as well. He's like, eh, whatever, you get one probe kill. And in return, you don't really get to disrupt anything on my side of the map. Second Stalker into Twilight. He's happy to delay his tech a little bit as well. That's the other interesting thing about how Stats is playing. Now we do have a Widow Mine immediately coming out here for Cure. Mule pulling off just before it mines the last 25 minerals. Very good. And notice, guys, if you click on these heavy mineral patches, he's dropped one mule on this patch. Now he drops one on this patch. If his next two mules drop there and there, it means they'll all mine out at the same time. Just gives you more mineral patches to mine for longer. Some players, they have a subconscious habit. They always just drop all their mules here. That patch mines out even before this patch mines out. These light patches, if you do that. And you just, you're reducing your overall mineral patches. Just in general, always the close patches with more minerals close heavy patches i call them and try to spread it across them it's not the, the, the hugest thing but it definitely is something that uh is like one of those little edges if you can build into your play as a default it's really nice two widow mines medevac on the way a couple more marines building so we're going three gate blink robo into four gas stats is like dude yeah i like defending i like making colossus this is how i play starcraft and he's the best at it truly is the best at it. I, I loved seeing Hero play so much Storm Drop Charge, but if your opponent never goes for that style, building tanks is pretty good against what, what Stats is doing, right? Like, the, the, the rushing into three barracks in game two and trying to multi-drop didn't really find an opening. <laughs> oh, sorry, guys. Looks like we've got a bit of a lag spike there. There we go. It does fix up. That Widow Mine just kind of presents itself. Says, hello, look at me. Oh, three stalkers can kill that in three volleys. Oh, man. And he should unburrow that and run that away. Because you don't want to let him catch you. You know he can run out and kill you. So you got to run away and then burrow. Because once you're cooled down, you can turn invisible again. If you want to go to the right, you want to leave the pylon vision, which is about here. And then you go to the right. So you can see he was thinking about going right, but he realized the pylon could see him. So he decided to just run home. Good call. Second tank is on the way. We've got the three barracks now going in. Raven snaking its way down the left side of the map. Looks like I think that was the Reaper just got picked off on the tower. Widow Mind Drop still chilling, but with three stalkers there, they can take that medevac out in one volley. That pylon's great. He can get stalkers over there because he's got four stalkers nearby. Let's go to Stats Vision. Stats, he sees it. He sees it. He immediately moves there. He's going to blink on it as it crosses. If he can blink on it... Oh, he could have cut it off. You can leave a stalker here and it stops it from ever getting down there. I thought he'd run to here. And if he sees the raven move into this area, he blinks on it and snaps it. Kind of unfortunate. I guess he's just... He's hoping it'll present itself. He's like, no, that's fine. I want to let it come all the way in to drop an auto turret. When it gets to about, like, here, I blink on it. Take it down in a couple volleys. And that's going to be great. Good spread on his unit so far. We've got the third base coming up. Charge on the way. Forge. First Colossus almost out. Here we go. That's what we're talking about. Great reaction speed by Cure. Fantastic reaction speed. That being said, he's not finding the damage he wants. Stats, map vision, and his details. Look at this. Pylons down on the edges. Oh, man. Watching stats. It's like... Do you guys remember when me and Australia did that... Uh, we streamed like that coaching session of PVT a few years ago. And there was like a bunch of um, really interesting lessons we kind of talked about and things for PVT. And things like pylon spotters as well as building forward gateways whenever you're playing a heavy gateway style to warp in off. Well, like some of the biggest things, as well as observer positioning and just unit positioning for the first five, six minutes, that we just spent like hours talking about and figuring out and thinking about. And it feels like Stats has this stuff on lockdown on such a deep level. He just like knows exactly what to do. It's, it's awesome to watch. But putting pylons out does cost you money. Does cost you money. If the Terran doesn't overcommit, he only got two probes there, but look now, he's getting pylon kills for free. He is building his third behind this. He's got a scary army. The Raven saved all of its energy, though it can only be used for non-interference matrix spells. He did not upgrade interference matrix. He's got anti-armor missile or auto turrets. Oh, the tanks behind the minerals are hard to deal with. How do you get rid of that, mate? Oh, that's an annoying... And his tech's all out here. Oh, oh, that forge is in range. If he has an immortal, he could maybe run that up to the edge and shoot the tanks, but dude, tank range is sick. That hurts. Oh, this this could be huge. Look at that. Widow Mine Drop's going to come in as well. Stats not watching. It's under heavy pressure right now. Stalkers will take out the Medivac and the Mine, though. It's just gonna, he's going to lose the gas in the Forge. Cancels his plus one. He's going to have to rebuild that Forge elsewhere. Oh, I mean, the, 
Colossus. If, if the Colossus poke forward and get some hits now, that'd be great. But now the Robo Bay is going to go down next. Stats doesn't seem to have a play right now. He's building two Forges. He can't get a fourth base now. Oh, this is really bad for stats. Colossus is just going to go for it, along with the Stalkers. Stalkers take out the Raven before it can cast a spell. One of the tanks will go down. Remember, there's only two tanks here. The Guardian Shield is massive. Maybe he should have done this earlier. The Bio can't really reach. Maybe he should have just made this call to do this earlier. It was only two tanks. He realized, hey, I'm getting outplayed by two Siege tanks. What am I doing? But, oh, this drop is going to kill all of his Stalkers in the main. The Zealots are trading pretty well. But the, the, the Bio did so good versus the Stalkers. Such an efficient trade to start there for Cure. That being said, now he's getting jumped on. Colossus in the main base inside that prism. Going for a double drop in the back of the natural. The Colossus in nearby, though. Stats is taking damage, but it doesn't have to be game ending. Those Marines staying. No, nope, picking up at the perfect time. I was about to say potentially staying too long. They stayed just the perfect amount of time. Medivac's in the main go down. Cure stayed a bit long there. But he's got the third base up. He's up in workers. He's delayed the upgrades. Didn't kill any power units. He killed 10 Stalkers. That's actually good. Killing 10 Stalkers. That's 500 gas. It's a lot of money, a lot of minerals as well. 1,250 minerals, 500 gas. Is it enough? Is it enough? Q is up in supply. There's no fourth base. I would say it is because this Widow Mine knows there's no fourth base. He's got a Widow Mine in the north. Knowing there's no fourth base means Q just needs to defend and macro up, and he knows that he'll be ahead in, the, in this game. He's got a better economy. He's still building a Ghost Academy. He's got a second engineering bay and an armory. He's got like, okay, basically his goal is just chill and work the advantage. Make upgrades, make ghosts, make vikings, and you can fight later on. You don't want to fight right now, though. You do not want to fight right now. This is meant to be a, a backstab squad. It's meant to be a drop squad. It is not meant to be a fighting squad. He's going to lose both medevacs. Oh, one of them saves two marauders. Managed to take out a stalker or two there as well, which is pretty impressive, but that's all. Tries to jump in the front, only gets himself a single building and has to run away. Stats with a very good catch there. And this is what Stats has been doing exceptionally well, is catching Cure's units in and around the map. I'd love to see Cure start a fourth command center. Because that continues the, the kind of economic and tech lead that he's building right now. Whereas, of course, with the delayed upgrades and whatnot, Stats is playing catch up. It's no Dark Shrine this time, just Zealots. So it's a bit of a simpler drop. But he's caught Q's army in the middle of the map, potentially. He's got to be careful of the Widow Mines. Prism's going to try to get out. Maybe try to recall that. Does he recall it? No, he's going to try and run it down the right side. With no turret there, he will get out. Warp Prism speed's one hell of a drug. Widow Mine does go down on the left side. Looks like his Stalkers used some Micro to dodge that one. Eh, that's the Zealot die. That's not a big problem. Widow Mine there, as well as Widow Mine drop. No, it's the Marauder drop in the south of the map. But the Stalkers are ready for it. In the main base, Zealots kill 9 SCVs. Stats is right back into this game. Those Stalkers can absolutely take that medevac out. That just got F2'd, my friends. Ah, uh, happens to the best of us. Cure there, forgetting about that medevac. The Zealots in the back of his base, no doubt, occupying his attention and distracting him. Now, economically, Cure is fine. But upgrade-wise, he's also ahead, though with double chrono boosts, of course, that can change. The Disruptor count is now at 3, and... The Viking count is at 8 against 3 Colossus, which is enough to deal with it. I think it was 9 Vikings in the previous game when he shut those Colossus down. Vikings landing versus Zealots. The blink defensive blink micro of the Viking is just lifting up. It's not as elegant, but it does work. Oh, Prism. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. That's good for Cure. The Vikings went hunting. They gave up and turned around, but at the same time as they gave up and turned around their chase... Stats also turned around and tried to go back in for another another trip. And luckily, Stats has great reaction speed. Pulls his prism away. How many gateways? He's going up to 10 gateways. 2-2. Two, two. He's still only on 68 workers, but he's taking a fifth base. As always, looking for those mineral expansions. Whilst just building a, a certain amount of tech units with his limited gas to get what he needs. The ghost sniper is fantastic. Zealots in the left. Zealots in the right. Three more barracks are building. The second starport is already up. Plus one ship weapons on the way as well. Cure has great infrastructure. It's his army supply that's lacking right now. But he's in position for the Zealots on the right. He's in position for the Zealots on the left. The Zealot run bys do nothing. Which means now he can bring everything in to bear on the main army. Stats should have gone in with his main army. Forced him to pull units to defend it. And then sent the Zealots in. Bit of a timing issue with the way he executed that attack. He's now going up to 13 gateways. And the Stargate transition will begin. Plus one air weapons already on the way. Stats is going to have a second chance to show us that late game. And I think this map's a bit better for it because he can take his sixth base on the gold right in front of his, his fourth and fifth, which means he just needs to defend that area. 
Remember on Oceanborn, he got in trouble because he had like the equivalent of this base and then this base and this base all being taken at the same time. And how do you defend two extreme edges of the map? Well, you need to split your army in half, which Protoss does not want to do. Terran's much more happy to split these cheap bio units that are very flexible. Protoss wants to keep this ball together. Protoss wants to. I mean, we we're actually chatting about it between games. Someone in chat said, you know, I used to watch and play a lot of this game, just getting back into it. Protoss used to have a death ball. That's what they used to call their army. Looked like Terran just rolled over everything he had in that last one. And we were kind of having, having a discussion about how, you know, well, basically, if Protoss is all together, they're good. But it, it's when they have to defend many bases in far spread areas, that's where they're generally weaker, which is what was his weakness in that last game. The death ball still kind of exists, especially with it's got literal balls now that shoot energy balls that blow up entire armies. The top players dodge these. I think anyone coming back who didn't watch any Legacy of the Void up to now doesn't realize how good the Disruptor is until they play against it. Because you watch pro play and you're like, yeah, sometimes it gets a good hit occasionally. Then you play against it and you realize every Disruptor kills 30 units. Like 30 supply of army goes down to every single Disruptor shot and you're like, oh my god, this unit is overpowered. <laughs> But the pros are so good at dodging, they're so good with their micro that it doesn't seem as exceptionally powerful. Good defense, man. Q has been all over these zealot drops. Look at the units lost tab. He's like, free value, man. You killed one SCV, damaged some depots. Yeah. But I like that he keeps trying. I like that stats keeps trying. It's as silly as that sounds. It's like, hey, man, just keep him pinned. Keep Cure on the defensive. Carrier transitions underway. He's got double air upgrades building. Notice he builds his cyber cores and his forges near each other. So we can chrono all of those very easily. And he's going up to four Stargates, so we can build four carriers at a time. Oh, nice blink. Gets himself a Medivac, grabs a Marine. The Colossus getting a good angle as well. Great fight, really good fight. Medivac stumbles in again. Oh, wow, Q has got to gather his army together. I like the way Stats ventures into Terran territory. Just absolutely free balls it. Doesn't, doesn't care. I, I mean, like I said in the last game, it's dangerous because you can get surrounded. These guys can break these rocks, flank in from the south. These guys up north come in from the other angle, and Disruptors are not very good. Neither are Stalkers and Colossus when they get surrounded. They're good at fighting one directionally. Oh, this is a good move, though. He's going to get the Planetary. Going to get the Planetary down. Notice he's keeping his Disruptors in reserve. He's going to recall them. Where's he recalling them? Up there. Okay, this base will fall, but he's going to be ready to defend the next one. The rest of the army will come home. Disruptors. Here we go! Oh, you know. Ah... Oh my gosh, it's not going to be... Okay, it's not, a, it's not a free ball moment. We're not looking at the Protoss version of Leonard Skinner right now. Um, uh, here we go. Oh, wait, are we? Are we? Ball starting to land pretty decently. A lot of probes going down, though. And you know what? He's going to be able to pick up and get out with some bio, but he's only got three medevacs, so not all of it. Ooh. Marine Marauder Ghost. The last few units take out a few zealots with some EMPs. Stims, oh my gosh. <laughs> They're trading pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stalkers, man. So fragile once they get EMP'd. Yowchies. That was a really good move for Cure. Even though he lost the planetary on the left, he just needs to keep building command centers. He's going for a lib transition. He's already got quite a few command centers. And Stats Economy did take a big hit. Now, that being said, Stats has got the carrier transition underway. And it's not as handicapped as he was in the previous one when he lost the economy. Like, he's got this base on the left. He can rebuild probes. And he is rebuilding them a little bit. Not a massive amount. Like, he's not going non-stop probe production but he's back up to 60 and he might just be saying let's keep it there let's just let's just get as many carriers as i can and uh how many vikings have we got 15 he's gonna have plus three but with only single armory he doesn't have the other things going he's getting the medevac energy upgrade the caduceus reactor that's what it's called right caduceus yeah caduceus reactor he's also getting building armor and bunker room which is combined into one upgrade several years ago so it's neo steel building armor I believe is what it's called now. High sec auto tracking. Because Cure's sec drive was a little bit low. Um, ha 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 ha. Haven't used that joke before, pig. Uh, sometimes I groan listening to myself commentate. What can I say? Eight carriers coming forwards. Three Colossus. Eight Disruptors. It's a pretty good army. There's no Psy Storm in here. Oh, Stalkers. Oh my god. The Bio's coming down. The Stalker's blinking back. Okay, in the top left side, they're going to come in as well. Cannon battery. Sealing what they can deal with. Oh... Okay, this is this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. This air fight is going to decide the game. No size storm upsets me. My man, my man. It might. It's a little later than I'd like it, but if he gets a few high templar, man, storms it could be game changing. He's not going to have it for this fight. Q is going to push him pre storm. He's going to push him. Oh. 
Oh my gosh, that is a lot of lib viking bio ghost. Oh me, oh my. Oh my gosh, okay, carrier goes, he doesn't have enough vikings to one shot. Okay, this is a problem. If he EMPs the carriers, he might have enough. But he needs to EMP the carriers if he wants to fight like that. The trick is, guys, if it, what happened there is he had a carrier and it barely survived and he needed to waste an entire second volley to finish it off. And once those interceptors are launched, the carriers can shred Vikings. The trick is, because your Vikings can shoot at the end of range, you can like pick off a few carriers before they get their interceptors launched. That's why the Vikings can counter them if you get a good engagement. Gets another 11 probes and another Nexus. Can he get a second one? Dude. Oh, this slow, clunky Protoss army struggling to catch up with these guys. Struggling. Oh, there's Marines back there as well. They're going to hide. Oh, Sats doesn't know they're there. Oh, these guys are going to kill so many probes, man. Stats does have a good army. He's got four High Templar with Storm now. Where are they? They're coming forward. They've got Storm. Storm is not something that, that you force to happen, though. And it looks like he's trying to force this to happen. 28 Vikings. There was 15 30 seconds ago. There's now 28, 29 Vikings. That's what happens when you have four reacted starports. Couple command centers going down. Q is correct to pull back. He's got to wait for the perfect engagement. He's got to wait for the perfect engagement. That's what this comes down to. Intercept is going crazy. The command center is going there. Sorry, my computer is starting to lag a bit in this giant fight. EMPs all over the carriers. The interceptors are pre-launched. The Vikings are going down quickly, but so are the carriers. Oh my gosh. The storm drop on the Vikings. The storm drop obliterates them. Still six carriers left over. There are some Marines and Ghosts. There's not many interceptors. He's got no interceptors left. Not a single one. Storm and disruptors will cover him against the ground army, but the carriers need to just run throws four disruptors at once and lands some pretty good shots. He needs to warp in stalkers right now. He does another storm on the bio. He's not got many carriers. They're only rebuilding them one at a time. The four five Vikings are actually beating the bloody carriers right now. He's got to pull these carriers back. Okay, this is wild. This is wildly close. Those Marines, they got F2'd back. They only killed two probes. I thought they'd do more than that. They got F2 stimmed, guys. It is what it is. Plus three air attacks about to finish. It's going to be three, two, one carriers once again. But this time the economy is way more even. And that is a big, scary problem for Cure. I mean, Storm is so incredible. If it lands, it came in late in that fight, but you saw the Storm on the Vikings and how much damage it did. A Viking has 135 max life. Storm does 80 damage over four seconds, hitting on air and ground. It is a massively important upgrade when you are playing air against Sky Terran. And it's good to see stats knowing that that is something that you need to mix in there. He's got a few mining bases, that one being retaken, this one looking good on the minerals. Cure's income is ahead right now, I believe he's been dropping a few mules and that is probably why. Gonna clear up some of this static, disruptors are still kind of scary. Where's the High Templar guys? He's got no High Templar. He's not rebuilt any Stormers. 14 Vikings against 4 carriers. I mean the ground army might win this for stats, but his carriers are easy pickings. Ooh, Archon carrier going forward, the Archon Stalker tries to go after it. He's, he's losing a Disruptor and an Archon or two to the uh, the Liberators, but he's killed 14 SCVs in a base. It's it's worth bleeding out a few units if you're just going to damage his economy this bad. Uh, what? Oh my god, a Liberator just killed 10 probes in the top left of the map. Oh me, oh my. It did get cleaned up just then by the Stalkers. Disruptors in the open, Disruptors in the open field. Bad Disruptor control from stats. The only shot that gets off lands behind the army. Oh no, a Liberator sieges on his base and he AFKs. Leaves his disruptors hanging out to the left. Lets them all die without doing any damage. The rest of the army crumbles right afterwards. Oh my gosh, after such an excellent series for a twin like that is so upsetting. I have to... You've got to watch that from Stats Vision. That was so upsetting. He should have just clicked his army away when he noticed the lib there. He should have just... I mean, he's cleaned up the lib. I don't know why his disruptors went so far forward there. I can't. It's just, just a, a bad choice. I think being on only 50 probes after losing those 10, he felt a bit more all in than he was. I think stats in his mind thought, oh, there's probably a base here and a base here, and he's probably got so much money. He didn't realize that Cure was in a similarly weak economic position. They were both in a very low economy position where it really was just going to come down to the next uh, fight or two to see who decided it. Oh, ho, ho. Cure with a great comeback here. Uh, dead even army supply, dead even economy. Could have been anyone's game, but just not paying attention. Let's go to stats camera, guys. He does. He's looking here. He should have thrown all five shots the second he saw the bio. Just a slow reaction for stats. GG, well played. Hats off to Kua, wins the series, and does get first 
through to the semifinals of GSL. GG, well played. All right, all right, all right. I knew we'd get the new maps when these two are playing. In the top right, in the losers match, it's Shin, aka Ragnarok. Gumiho, his opponent in the bottom left for Cloud9. And dude, he's sending an early SCV out across the little wastewater slipstream there. And he's going to be going up here for a proxy barracks. There's a Reaper ledge there, a Reaper ledge there. And that is it on this map. Sorry, I was like, I know there's a map with three Reaper jump in points. This one has two. Um, now, this is, of course, post youth. You get a nice little gold base here. Three gold minerals, three blue. It's the overall mining. There's less minerals to mine here than from a normal base, but you get that lovely boost early on, which is a very, very big boon as a Zerg player. Now, it is just a single proxy Reaper by the looks of things. And uh, this map also has very exposed gold bases here, but they are terrible. They are really awkward because if tanks get up here and stuff, like you're fighting around ledges and cliffs and whatnot to, de to defend it. There are some wide open areas. I know some people have said, like, this map's so, bad, so hard to defend because look how wide open this is. I actually don't think it's that wide um, because like your third base is here. Once you wall this off, kind of as like a Terran or a Protoss, attacking in here doesn't really get you on a mineral line. You still have to go through a semi-choked up area here. Getting up this ramp is very difficult. It's uh, it's interesting to see how it works. Now, spawning pool at the ramp. Shin thinking of walling off in case Hellions try to get in perhaps. Or oh, we sees it. He sees it. Command center does go down. So it's a one racks expand with a forward Reaper to try and find some damage. Reaper's going to hop into the main. Drone's going to be taking some damage here. Ooh. Drone's going to be taking some damage. Trying to, get, trying to see what he can do. Here we go. Gumiho's trying to pull back around the left side. Zergen's going after him right now. Reaper's going to try and pull away. Doesn't really get anything. Just a bit of harassment. Forces sixlings. No big deal. A few spore tricks. It does de delay him mining the gold as well. So not too bad. But it is what it is. If there's any mods in the live chat, if you can remove that message. Not sure if you can delete your own message, Han Solo. Get that one right up out of there, mate. Third command center is on the way. We've got the factory swapping over onto the reactor. Overlord rotating around as well. Zergling's going to try and deal with this. But the Reaper's just being a nuisance. You know, minimal commitment. A single Reaper. Maximum nuisance. Problem. If you don't have your barracks at home, the factory has to build the reactor. It takes a long time to build that reactor. A very, very long time. Ah, that's a bummer. That is a bummer, man. I always feel like this build's just not worth it because of how much this delays the factory. And what are you really using these minerals for in the meantime? I, I almost feel like if you're going to do this build, you should go four command centers because he's just floating minerals because he can't build Hellions until so late. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. It just feels like an awkward start. Single proxy Reaper. I mean, it, it throws off Shin's build slightly, but only slightly. Rotoran's on the way. Man, this is such weird building pla building placement. I really don't like this for Shin. I, I get why he's doing it. It's because if it is Hellions, he just wants to wall off with a single queen. But there's just something so... I, I hope he opens these minerals up. I guess once he's got roaches up, if he mines these minerals open, I'm fine with it. But otherwise, if his units always have to pop out here and then go all the way around, and if he gets dropped in the back, he has to run back around, makes things very uncomfortable. Now, of course, Gumio is known for playing mech. We've got to have that in the back of our mind as we do see a third. Gas is already down. Hello. Overlord coming in from the rear of the base. In the rear with the gear. Does see the Starport Tech Lab swap around for the Banshee Tech. Five Roach is building right now as well. We'll see exactly what we can do. <laughs> Four Command Center sounds beyond greedy. You're absolutely correct. I just, I don't like the efficiency of it. Like, reactors, factories have to build, having to build reactors. When you've only done damage with a single Reaper and it's it's just so minimal. It's like, you know, what did you what did you really do with your opening? It feels a bit uncomfortable. Double engineering bay, it's a bio build, double eBay. This is the way Gumio likes to do it. Most players want to prioritize getting three barracks marine out. But he says, no, 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 I want to have really fast 2-2. Two, 2-2 two. Two, two, is when Terran has a lot of oomph. And what is what is Shin gonna do? Because Shin's not really got a massive economy lead. 
I think he takes the fourth. I think Roach Ravager makes sense because it's a composition where you can defend this fourth easily. And then off four bases, you can either swarm with Roach Ravager, do like a 70 drone timing attack. Yeah, he's moving forward with this drone now. Or you can just macro up and try to swap back into Ling Bane Viper. But Roach Ravager makes a lot of sense. Defending this base with Ling Bane is just a nightmare. You just, you, it's so awkward, man. They put a tank here, then they put tank up here. Like the, these positions, the Widow Mines on the ramps are so hard. Five barracks coming up, double upgrades on the way. Evo Chambers have not started for Shin. He prioritized the Lair, the Roach Speed, the fourth hatchery. Understandably so. What? What is this? Does he think he's playing against Mech? I think he thinks he's playing against Mech. He's going Spire after Roaches into double Evo and Ling Speed. Does he want to like try to, 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 to do a Muta swap against Mech while swarming with Ravager Ling? A bizarre build for Shin. Roach into Muta is not something you see at pro level. It has its advantages because once they see Roaches, your opponent goes tanks. They don't go Widow Mines. Mutas are much better if they play Siege tanks. But it's such an awkward transition in terms of all the gas being spent on Roaches, Ravages, Roach Speed. And he's going 1-1 one, one range upgrades. It really feels like he thinks he's playing against Mac. But who knows? Overseer comes in. He sees it. He knows it's Bio. Do we see a change in the upgrades or is he just going to keep it? Nothing wrong with going 1-1 one, one on Roach Ravager. But he does start a Baneling Nest now. So yeah, there's the reaction, the Baneling Nest. So I do think Shin thought he was playing against Mech this game. He cancels the Spire. Yep. Yes, he did. Okay, we have confirmation. We, we have confirmation. He cancels his Spire. I was wondering... I was like, this has got to be a, a sneaky Muta swap against a mech build. But he is, uh, he's, he's, he's cancelled it now. He's like, oh, I'm playing Bio. Okay, we're just going to go Roach Ravager into Ling Bane Hive. That's fine. Double Bio on the Viking. Oh! Was that not even placed where the Viking was? Does he not have Flyer Helper turned on? Guys, you got to leave this Flyer Helper. I even leave it on when I'm casting. People go, why? It's not as pretty. It's so you can see where the, the, the damage needs to actually land. Storm... Fungal, anything like that needs to be on that little circle. You don't click on the Viking up here. You got to click on the here. So that's that's something that's very important. If you guys don't play with that on, turn it on right now. You will struggle to hit air units with spells that aren't targetable. Hive's on the way right now for Shin. 80 workers. Gumio's got 2-2 two, two, and he's going 8 racks. Question. Does he build tech labs or does he just pump? He's got a 4th Command Center and 2-2 two, two in Vehicle Weapons, so I think he's 100% going to build Tech Labs. Mix in a Heavy Marauder Count is a really nice way to do this, and then start creeping those tanks forward. Only problem he has is he's only on one factory. Ooh, he picks up, doesn't even try to fight. Fair enough, it's a lot of Roach Ravager. Shin's not trying to hide his style at all. Doesn't care if you see the Zerglings. I'm pretty sure the Banelian Nest already got spotted. He's completely fine with that. A lot of players like to put Spore here on the very top, another one over here, and another one here, because that, that top base, and sometimes they build a second Spore behind it. It's a very popular drop angle, and a lot of people like to put a Spore on this edge as well, now that the Banshee phase of the map is kind of over. Yes, the Banshees are still alive, but they're not really harassment units anymore. They're more defensive units. Ravage is harassing the Command Center, but they don't get the SCV. Double drop in the top, cleans up a few Zerglings. Two Marines do go down. Units lost tab is 800 resources in favor of Gumiho, but they've barely traded. It's a very slow game, this one. It's just economic arms race, really. Ultra Cavern's on the way. Two Vipers building. Adrenal Glands, plus one melee, plus two carapace. Concussive starts up. And indeed, it was all tech labs, by the way. Lots of Marine Marauder. With just four tanks. Still no second factory. Still no second starport. This is a mass bio force. Gumiho needs to push. Basically now, his 2 is almost done, his Marauder Count's growing. He needs to start fighting before the Ultras are out. Baneling Speed is ready though. Nice drop on the left side, picks it up, saves it. The tank's coming forward. He's going to have to get this tank line as far forward as possible to force his opponent into engaging. Good dodge against the Biles. But look at this, Shin is holding back. He's trying to delay the engagement. I'd love to see Shin spread out before the fight. Banshee gets Biled. No, nope, great dodge. Gumio, he's moving his tanks forward. Shin's trying to just dance in and out, dance in and out. He may consider giving the gold base up. Oh, 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 Gumio just grabbed his whole army and shoved forward. His whole army deep on creep right now. Shin just knows this is not the time to fight. Good choice. If he fought right now, this would be fighting when Gumio wants to fight. I've talked about this piece of theory, this golden rule for fighting Terran for a long time. If Terran wants to fight, you don't want to fight them. If you can delay fighting them, counterattack, give up a base, expand elsewhere, buy time, do little backstabs, do runbys, delay the fight, 
because they're always attacking you when they're strongest. He was attacking just when his 2-2 finished. Shin's buying time for his plus one melee, plus two carapace, adrenal glands. His vipers are gathering energy. His ultras will be hitting the field soon. He's waiting for his army to improve. Why fight when you don't need to? Give up a base, lose a little bit of mining time, run your drones to a different base, and now trade your crap units out. Start trading the roaches out in small numbers. Very technically sound play. And Gumio is like, ah, damn. Okay, this game's going to go longer. I better build two more command centers. Problem. He's got a Ghost Academy, no ghosts yet. He's got a Fusion Core, no second Starport yet. He needs to get more production and late game units up. Blinding Cloud comes in. Shin's ready to take the fight. That's a lot of Banelings. Good pullback on the Banelings. Ooh, he didn't even take out both tanks. Bit of an awkward fight there for Shin. Viper not quite getting caught though. Would have been nice to see some Marines stim on top of that. Big army on the left side, only one medevac. Oh God, huge mistake. You, you do not want to be on Zerg territory with no way to pick up and leave. His medevac count is too low right now. Only six medevacs for 15 marauders and 47 marines. Fusion core's on the way. Extra starports coming in. Is he just going to get the fusion core for the medevac upgrade? I think he might. Sees that army. He stims. Backs away. The banshee does go forward. Only one banshee left alive in this game and not for long. It's too much going on at this point to keep managing that. Two more factories building. So Gumiho is probably going to get a reactor on one attack level on the other, I would guess. Ravageling Bane being a nuisance. Get themselves a Viking kill. Not bad. Ultras with Kindness Plating. And one, two upgrades are out. Army on the right side. Coming in. You got to be careful. Gumiho, you might be going a bit deep. It's a good idea to just pick up and leave. Tank goes down. Oh, there's two more tanks behind it. Leaving his tanks hanging out. But as the bio ghost comes forward. No, no, no. He's got he's to drop that bio. Gumiho's going to drop that bio on the right side. His units are stuck, though. He's got to get back. Oh, his ghosts were kind of trapping his bio a little bit. The Bailings get some decent hits. And Orbital burns down. Not quite. The Orbital survives. He only got a factory kill. That was a great defense for Gumiho. Shin is famous for making hundreds of Bailings and rolling them into anything. But uh, as long as he repairs the Orbital, which he is... Yeah, he's up on five orbitals. He, he's got two factories. Medevac energy upgrade is exactly what he was going for. Brilliant position to be in right now for Gumiho. Baneling's unable to connect. Bile's landing on the Ravages. Oh, sorry, Snipes, I should say. EMP on the Vipers. No blinding cloud for you. Beautiful angle for Gumiho. And Gumiho, the absolute monster, looking like a beast right now. Banelings do connect on the left side. Big Baneling lands. But on the right side, the bio is standing strong. Their stim does wear out. Those ravages, all that's left, as well as a few ultras and lings that are building. Gumiho is heavily damaged in Zerg territory, but he's getting massive damage. Massive damage. Panic Bile starting to land there as well. Not even anywhere near the Terran. A few snipes landing on the ultras. The Marine Marauder kiting backwards. Yes, that siege tank will fall, but so will a lot of ultras. Nice transfusers. Kind of clutch transfusers coming in to keep those ultras alive longer than they should have been. And it looks like, ooh, he could have trapped that ultra potentially. But Gumiho is going to back off and stabilize. He's got a gold base up as a fifth. He's denied Ragnarok's third. Ragnarok's fourth and fifth are reasonably fresh, but he's only on 58 workers. I keep calling him Ragnarok. Sorry, guys. I know it's Shin now, but just helping the older viewers who aren't familiar. Letting them know who they're watching. Three medevacs. It's not enough to pick up all these units. Careful. Careful, Gumiho. It's You can pick up most of them, especially with the fourth medevac there. Nicely done. Planetary is not up just yet. Oh, this is he's going to commit to the planetary. Planetary is not done yet. Pick up the Marauders. Oh god, the SCVs and the tanks are going to struggle. He's going to drop on the high ground. Should cancel that planetary and lift it. Cancel. Oh, he doesn't cancel the planetary. Sniping the planetary would be big. Counterattack in the north side. Parasitic bomb does go down on a medevac. Nice stutter step away. It's almost pure marine though. That plus two, plus three carapace. Ultralisk. Oh, oh. It kills a lot of those marines before it goes down. The planetary did fall as well. Gumiho splitting his army up. Gets caught out here. And this is a massive hold. All those marines in the top right did nothing. They killed a few buildings and they got shut down by a viper and a single ultralisk. That ultralisk, guys, we always talk about Hungry Hungry Hippos, one of the greatest uh, game names of all time. Hungry Hungry Ultralisks is another game. And when they find marines with no marauder, no ghost support, they absolutely have a party. Tank getting caught in the corner there. Snipe on the viper is nice. The marine marauder trying to pull back. Oh, the ultra will fall. Go spread back. The bile's not really landing. Ultra does go down. But more ultras, more Bane's coming in. He's got to stim and, and, and keep microing. Gumiho does struggle sometimes in the multitasking front. Shin may not be the fastest player of all time either, but he's got that momentum with the Baneling Ultra right now. After the last few fights, he's going to get on top. Oh, the bio misclick. He misclicked into the Banelings. He just maximized the Baneling damage with a misclick forwards. Oh no, the pathing error. 
messing him up. 14 more workers go down. Shin is on 59 workers. He's completely all in. Gumio had this game in the bag. And then the army split with the Marines getting held on the right was bad. Not cancelling the planetary was bad. That move command was bad. Gumio needs to just take a breath and slow down. He's still got what he needs to win this game. But he's got to just defend. And he's not doing it. He's not doing it. He's going for a counter drop on the left side at the same time sending his units across the map. The tanks are doing okay from the high ground. The mules do run away. He's trying to counter attack with mass bio on the right as well as a marine drop on the left. And whilst he's doing damage, securing his gold has to be the biggest priority. Lings in the bottom right do get caught. Down here in the top right, he counter attacks into the natural, but he's only killing creep and damaging overlords. He's not really killing any zerg units. And that's what's threatening. Finally, does pick off an ultra, pulls back. Uh, Gumiho needs to just fall into a defensive stance. He's got to stop attacking in this game. You could tell he feels like Shin's getting ahead in the economy. And to be fair, Shin maybe is a little bit. But Gumiho's attacks are not trading well. Uh, compared to what they were earlier anyway. I, I bring up the units lost tab to prove myself wrong as I say that. Don't tell me I'm not honest. Don't tell me I'm not honest. The last few fights weren't as good as they were earlier in the game. Um, and that is actually a true statement. Uh, as silly as the rest of my analysis may have sounded. Overlord speed's on the way. Up to 67 workers. These top three left bases are the bastion of economy. Now for Gumiho, this base here, he should just leave a tank or a few units on the high ground, but basically be ready to lift that. Oh my god, he's going to lose it to my spile. No, 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 no. Get it out, get out, get out. Yeah, he needs to just pull that command center back and also do the same thing. Focus on the bottom right. If you can secure these three bases, you can both kind of mine similar economies and be okay. Orbital with two libs in a tank. Lynx can do damage to that. None of that's super good at killing Zerglings. And there we go. Tank goes down. A couple libs do... Lings do fall to the lib. And the marine drop in the top left. Gumio is back to maxed out. I think he's still in a great position. Infestation pit being rebuilt. He's thinking about infestors right now. Is Shin. Oh, catching the Baneling Cocoon Moth. Nice. That's all of those Zerglings. And Gumio's got a very nice army. Just has to be careful about losing this one to Biles when he's not looking, because it's already so wounded. That's a lot of ravages. <laughs> Once again, Command Center gets set on fire. Oh, something got sniped there. Don't know what that was. Looks like a Ravager. That medevac does go down. Gumiho's army. Six ghosts, four tanks, three libs, 16 marauders, 37 marines. Up against what is just ultras, banes, some ravages, couple vipers. The infestors with burrow in a scrappy game. Those are a god tier unit. They could be Shin's path back into this game. Respreading creep is also essential. This lack of creep spread is really hurting him right now. This command center, like I said earlier, it's a distraction for Gumio. He needs to go take the bottom right. Um, something I've talked about a lot over the years is how you really need to keep your, your defense kind of centralized as a Terran in late game TVZ. Don't spread out too thin or the Zerg gets a lot of nice attack angles. Oh, that's great. Gets himself a bunch of Banes and Ultras. Dude. Oh my gosh, he just got so many dudes. So many Banes and Ultras. 9,000 resource lost advantage. You know what? I don't mind this too much now that it's repaired to full. Because anytime you attack into that with tanks on the high ground, it kind of feels bad as Shin. As long as most of his forces are defending the right. It looks like he wants to attack now. Okay, so th th this is a great force for roaming the map. It's being very efficient. But now that Infestors are here, you get one fungal parasitic bomb combo in the middle of those medevacs. This is game over. Ghosts are coming forward. Liberator does actually get parasitic bombed, funnily enough. Ghosts, uh, not really doing much to those cocoons. Gonna snipe a bunch of the Baneling cocoons. Yeah, it's a little bit of value, not a lot. Bio is gonna run to the right, kill this hatchery. I don't know how we knew that hatchery went down. Nice, gets a kill, no cancel for Shin. Shin needs a good fight. He gets a fungal on a few of the ghosts up front. The spready is pretty good. A lot of Gumio's army is not there though. It's only a small section of Gumio's army and so it is getting overrun. More Bio comes in from the top right. Here we go, though. There are more infestors available. Fungal blinding cloud on the bio in the top right. Oh, man. The fungal bio, uh, bio uh, combo, fungal fungal blinding cloud combo, I should say, was actually so good in the top of that fight. And now counterattacking across the map is Shin finding some delicious engagements. Oh, God. He's got to pick those units up. Gumio does pick them up and save them. Ghost trying to rally down right now. That ultra is not long for this world. It does get ripped to shreds by those ghost snipe and infestor poking forward as well. A scan goes down. 59 workers against 72. It is still locked in a very close brawl. 10,000 resource lost advantage for Gumiho. Kept the command centers up. He's got to finish building these, though. I wouldn't mind him repairing his SCVs also as he builds a planetary there. Gumiho, you can tell, is in a heightened state of awareness right now. He is on the back foot. Shin has played a high momentum style. And we're on his camera right now. He's looking for snipes. He's looking for infestors. 
He's looking for the spellcasters because he knows those are the game changers. But that means he's completely forgotten about his economic progression. He missed that infester. Luckily, it only gets a fungal on a single ghost. So no big deal. Gets out of trouble there. Does take the infester out. These command centers being ignored is massive. He starts building more... Wait, wait, one, two... Has he got four command centers building? I think it's the same two command centers showing up twice, guys. Bit of a bug on the production tab. Oh, Gumiho has a big army, man. Big army. Does he have enough scans for this? He's, he's, he's just forgotten about it. He's, he's trying to push forward in the middle of the map. Snipes coming down! Couple of snipes popping ultra. Bailing Ling flashing into the right side of this army and getting some pretty good engagements. Nice spreadies for Gumiho, though. The ghost pulling back as well. Great setup for Gumiho, but the numbers are there for Shin. Shin is cascading over the tanks. Can he bile down the libs? Those libs doing good damage, but the biles start to take down one of them. The bio coming in from the right side could turn this fight, but the bailings, they connect with all of the marines, which is massive. The ultras are very low. They are getting taken out by the planetary. The marauders dropping behind. Will shut this down. Kubio hangs on in an epic game one, and he survives, which is so, so important because remember, Shin's bases in the top left are starting to get low on minerals. Two of them are still on eight, eight patches. And Kumiho does win the map. Very nicely played. Ooh, nail biter. Nail biter, man. Kumiho definitely got a bit flustered in that game. Not just the command centers. Multiple engagements started getting a little fumbled. But he had such a good position from his forward pushes. Great ledge usage. And I've talked about the chokes, the ledges, the areas with the setup. That was lovely play from Mr. Kumiho. All right, all right, all right, guys. Going into game two. 15-15 opening for Shin in the bottom left side of the map. Wondering what he's got in store for us with this one. As his spawning pool was right on time, a minute and three seconds. The two racks Reaper for Gumio. Wow. So, guys, I have um, basically done a tree dies on... A, a tree... A tree dies. A tree dies. I've, I've written a fuck... A, a free, I'm sorry. Excuse my language. I've written an essay verbally... Many times I've ranted about how the dumbest thing you can do against Shin is two racks Reaper wall off. I, I talked about this at Katowice, where Shin beat Cure, Clem, and a bunch of other Terrans, and they kept opening proxy Reaper and, and Reaper wall off. The reason why this is dumb is this is the most vulnerable to all ins, and Shin is one of the best all in players in StarCraft 2. If he does like one of Serral's Roach pushes, your barracks, half of your production, or, or sometimes all of your production, is exposed on the low ground with no ramp, you can't use this ramp to defend. I'm not saying it, it's it's a free loss, but it's an unnecessary risk when you are favored against Shin in a macro game. Now, perhaps Gumiho feels like he's not favored against Shin in a macro game. He needs to put on pressure. He needs to throw Shin off. If that's the case, I can support it. But when I see Maru, Kuro, or Clem, one of these guys who's clearly better than Shin in a macro game, basically do a very risky opening, I always criticize it because it gives him big chances to utilize his aggressive strengths against their weak spots, which is getting surprised by all-ins in the early game. Um, and and that's, that's why strategically I was very critical of both Clem and Cure for doing those sort of builds at Katowice uh, a few months ago. Tech Lab comes down as well as... It? Oh, three barracks. Wow, okay. So it's going to be four Reapers into three barracks. No third base just yet, but with a 15-15, you don't really care about not having a third base. It does not matter. Dodging the Reaper Grenade is really important. Otherwise, you can get a lot of free attacks on you while you're just getting bounced around and not attacking back. Reactor goes down. This is a very aggressive follow-up for Gumiho. Part of me wonders if Gumiho is going to go super YOLO and play like eight racks, no Metavax. It is such an old style. You have I haven't seen it in Zerg vs. Terran in a long time. But if anyone remembers builds from seven to 12 years ago that might catch your opponent off guard in 2024, it's Gumiho. Stim's on the way, and it's going to be a second reactor. Mass Marine three racks, my friends. He's going to make Stim into shields one at a time. Lair and Roach Warren's on the way. Third base does get taken behind the gold. Ah, oh, very clever by Shin. Because I don't, I don't care. I don't care about your stupid Reapers. Brings down the extra Queens as well. He's played a very solid four Queen opening so far. Has missed an inject in the main, so he's going to quickly run over there and inject in a moment. Oh, we're trying to kill these Reapers. Hey, he still hasn't injected the main. This is doing damage by distracting him. He's going to pull the weak queen back to the main. Saying, hey, that's the job for the weak queen. Stay in the very defensive position. Four overlords building. My man's going for roach speed in two seconds. 100 minerals, 100 gas. He needs roach speed. He's going for a two base roach push. Um, we know this because he's building four overlords at once. Um, 
He does go back to droning a little and takes a fourth gas. I mean, fourth gas allows you to make a lot more ravages with this. He's going to Overseer Scout as well. The good thing about this setup is as long as you remember to Overseer Scout with the 15-15, you see exactly what your opponent's doing. And you don't have to go for the all-in. You can just defend. But if you do overwhelm... Oh, that's bad. Well, at least he knows there's a lot of Marines moving out. But he doesn't know exactly what's behind it. Is it third command center? We know it's Metavax. This is looking like a two-base push. It's a two-base push. He's going plus one weapons. Oh, he's going four gas on two base. My man's going to go for tanks and five racks. This is a two base all in for Gumiho. Question, is there any good tank spots? I mean, there's tanks up there could be good for pushing on the third. Tanks behind the rocks could be good. Oh, there's a few corners which you could use really well. And the queens are already heavily damaged. But roaches, that's a lot of roaches and roach speed's almost done. Get out of there, Gumiho. Gumiho, get out, get out. Oh God, go home, go home, go home. He has stim. These guys should stim home, honestly. He's going to have medivacs out soon. I, he's got to get out because if Roach Speed kicks in, I mean, I guess he can wait. He, or he can use the grass. That's a good idea. Use the sight blocker. He's going to try and ambush this. Does he have the firepower? Good pullback by Shin. Oh, marine damage output is insane, guys. And the grenades are actually pretty sick as well. But there's Ravages coming in from behind. He's going to have to stim again to get out of there. Stim's about to run out. There we go. Roach Speed's very scary right now. Oh, me, oh my. Shin getting a good fight. Even though he loses in the mineral count, He's droned up his third behind it, and he's got forward position. The only problem is if he gets jumped on by a mass of marines. Because these guys are so damaged, that only works if Gumiho pulls SCVs. Gumiho is almost supply blocked right now. Oh, don't lose combat shields. He cannot afford to lose combat shields. It's 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 three seconds from finishing. The marines are going to stim out to fight this, but he's not pulled SCVs. And if he loses this fight, he loses the game. If he loses this fight, he loses his barracks and loses the game. He has combat shields. He has a medevac out. His first tank is about to pop. Trading. Barely in favor of Gumiho. But remember, that's a two command center Terran getting his army worn down. He wanted to build up until plus one was finished. Until he had tanks, medevacs. The fact that he's been worn down, Shin has droned to 70 behind it off this 15-15. Like, he basically built 20 roaches off 45 workers. Uh, how, many, how many roaches did he lose? 14, and he's got 5, 10. So he built 25 roaches off about two bases. And then he just droned behind it while pushing Gumiho all the way back to his base. And now he can do whatever he wants. Shin is miles ahead in this game. And this is why the 15 15 is so good against a guy like Gumiho, because you get the fast Overseer Scout, you get word of what's going on, and you're incredibly safe with a two base Roach. And that fast Roach speed gives you the ability to counterattack and be so powerful on the offense. Oh, doesn't quite get that creep tumor. You could try to grenade it. He's like, screw it, I'm going to scan for it. But look, this creep tumor is spread across from there. Oh, that's so frustrating. Another Overseer comes in. Third command center does start on location. Gumiho is not watching. Ooh, gets rid of the fourth base. It's a good snipe for Gumiho. But that Overseer is going to get out of there. Changeling does get shot down in the main. Fourth and fifth barracks does build. Shin has no idea about that third command center. And yet he's still going hive and droning. Bit of a wild man. I also don't know why he's trying to take this hatchery. Unless he's going to break these rocks, which it does appear he's been trying to. I feel like the other hatchery is better. This one's easier to defend from drops, but it's so hard to defend on the front. This this back and forth micro is kind of hilarious. So he tries to bile. Biles do hit both rocks at once. Oh, but having just used up his biles, if snipe on the fourth base. It feels like we're getting diminishing returns. This just got cancelled twice and then killed. I think we should just take a different base. Come, come uh, Shin. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sometimes players get a bit too stubborn. They're like, no, no, no. I can defend it with Ravages. Ravages are a good zoning unit. Third base has been spotted. Fourth and fifth barracks has been spotted. Shin's been far out on mining on three base first two for a long time. But now that the third comes up, it's no longer that big advantage for him economically. And the Marines focus down a few of these boys. Comes down. Gets another hatchery cancel. Another one. My god, he's being such a D-bag. I think at this point, Gumiho is like, dude, I've kept you on three base long enough. I can just play a macro game. And he's building two tech labs. So he's going to go very Marauder heavy. Three tech labs, two reactors on his first five barracks. He's already going second engineering bay armory. So he's, he's getting set up for a longer game. He just picks off a creep tumor. Gets a Zergling or two. Only loses a Marine. He's got another Marine there blocking the base. The rich gas base will go down again. Catches a drone that was trying to take the top left. Vipers are on the way, as well as Adrenal Glands, though. So even though Shin has not had a fourth base to mine, he's had that third base a lot longer, and he's got a good supply advantage. He's got great upgrade advantage. Gumiho taking a fourth command center, but 
limited production. Five racks, one factory, one starport. Still a lead for Shin. Shin was miles ahead earlier, and I'd say his advantage has diminished a little bit. You know, Gumio's clawed a few inches back, but you can't lie, that supply count is scary. A lot of it's in Roach Ravager. Nine roaches, that's 27 supply of absolute garbage unless you let the Biles hit you. Something which Gumio is not very commonly letting Biles land on him. 21 roaches, 42 supply of garbage there as well. I mean, you got to realize that once they max out, that Roach Ravager are not the most effective units. But the Vipers, on the other hand, very supply efficient. Banelings, very supply efficient. Ultras, not half bad either. And they will make up for that. I do love how in some of these maps, the units actually go under the trees. Just, they, they dip underneath the canopy. Oh! Good hot pickup. Trying to get away from those vibes. Oh my god. That means he's got no units at home. Oh, Shin just realizes there's way too many units on the map. And he's like, let's go kill some tanks for free, man. Let's go kill some tanks. Oh, Blinding Cloud there could be brilliant as well. He's just going to abduct. He just abducts these two tanks. The Liberator on the left side does get some damage. Nice harassment for Gumio. He tries to run in. The Banelings come back. His Marines and Marauders got to get out of there. He saves most of them. Well done. How many tanks did he just lose, guys? Four siege tanks. Oh! Oh, focus the drones. Ah, uh, only gets a few. But actually, wait. They go back to mining. They go back to mining. This drop goes in. They're 18 drones. 19. 20. Oh my god, the Liberator. The Liberator doing way too much. 13 kills on the Lib. Nice. Multi-prong for Gumiho. And yet he's still down 40 supply. Oh, Parasitic Bomb goes off, but he gets both Vipers. They got left out there in the chaos. Gumio is making this a very scrappy TVZ. He was so far behind earlier on, but I actually think he's in a pretty playable spot right now. It's a big army, though. 35 army supply lead. It's a big army closing, and he lost all those tanks. How good would those tanks be right now to support this position? He's got one in the back behind his natural. Banelings coming forwards. They are getting slowed by the Marauders. Beautiful spread and angling from Gumiho. He just doesn't have the numbers. Look at the amount of Zerg barreling into that choke point in the natural. Oh my god, it's like that silly World War Z uh, movie where the zombies are just like a bloody blurry CGI just swarming up a wall over the top of each other. I never watched the movie, I just saw the trailer. That's kind of what they just did into the natural there though. Gumio does get knocked down. That two base roach build with the Overseer Scout shuts down his sneaky three racks. Whoo, all right guys, what a series we've had so far. This has been fun, this has been really fun. Gumio in the top left side now, Sight Delta. Shin in the bottom right. It's a map with some wide open spaces that are meant to be good for Zerg. Yet somehow I find these like ledges with these little tank areas behind them always end up doing quite well for Terran, as well as like drops and multi-prong are very hard to deal with. I've been wondering why we don't really see Mutalisks much on this map, but I think it's just the pushes kind of come across a bit too hard and fast. Because it does feel like something like Mutas could try and keep the Terran back off of you. For now, Shin is not doing a 15-15 again. Back to a 16 hatchery opening. Here we go. Hatchery does start up. Barracks gas on the way. And it is a low ground single barracks for Gumiho. A little vulnerable, but this map at least has a ramp. So uh, not a bad way of doing it. He could rally a second SCV down, but it's a bit late now. If he hasn't rallied it down, it's too late. And we are on 18 supply. So 18 gas, 17 pool is the standard. See that drone pops out, builds the gas. This one pops out, builds the pool. And just a classic, classic Zerg vs. Terran build order. Notice he's looking for proxy racks a fair bit. Sending this overlord down around. He is not checking up here. So if Gumio had gambled on a proxy three racks or something, he might have done it. Orbital starts up. Marine first on the way. Luckily for Shin, he knows that Gumiho likes Hunt Overlords, so he's playing very conservative with his Overlords. If he goes straight across the map against this, two Marines get an Overlord kill, but as it is, Gumiho will not find that. And that's always frustrating. When you open up like this, if you kill the first Overlord, it feels really good. Did he go gas first? Oh my god. He went gas first. I was wondering why the command center had to wait for a few seconds before making the orbital. He went gas first. It's a quick factory. What is this opening? Is this just a quick starport where he builds Hellions one at a time? I do want to see... A, he's going three Marines before Reactor. Command Center's delayed a fair bit. This is a wild build order from Gumiho. Shin, no idea what he's up against. It's Overlord's very conservatively placed. We were talking about accents just before this game. 
And uh, someone's saying, I even learned when I moved to the south that some places called shopping carts buggies. We call them trolleys in Australia. So completely different for both of them. Is it an SCV? What is this? Everyone let us know what you call a shopping trolley, shopping cart, or shopping buggy. Wherever you are in the world, I'd love to hear if there's any other terms for it. I think that's the only three. I think that's the only three in English. Maybe there's some funny ones in other languages, though. He's going to try and build a bunker. This is crazy. Why hasn't he started it yet? He's building it behind the minerals? Okay. Okay, just so he can kind of micro behind it. This is a weird pressure. Hellion cleans up the Zergen. Oh, and if you if you come down with too many units to deal with this, the Hellions will run into your base. Oh, this opening's actually cute. This is really, really cute. He's got to finish the, uh, the bunker, though. He's trying to fight the Queen. The Lings are trying to stop the Hellions. No, he won't finish the bunker. Get out of there. Get out of there. Ooh, SCV's going to go down. But Hellion's going after those uh, Lings pretty well. Time to cancel that bunker, my, my dude. If he just built the bunker over here straight away, I think he gets it up. I think he just needed to start it earlier. Two Hellions and a Marine thinking about fighting the Queen. They can kill her, but they'll need to commit a lot of Hellion life to do so. And remember, Link Speed's almost ready. Queen's going to go for an inject there. Three Hellions gathering up. Three alien shots at a time. It's three times 13 damage, not battle. Three times seven, I guess. 21 damage of volley to the queen. 14 damage to light units like Zerglings and drones. Uh oh. Oh, oh my god, they both went past each other. Only one SCV on the low ground. That's very good for Gumio because now he can just pull back and focus on this. There's more links coming in. If he gets surrounded, that could be bad. If he gets surrounded, that could be bad. These Hellions are weak, and he's only building one at a time. Look at the way Shin's trying to set up for the surround. Coming in from two sides. Gumio. Oh, not the best focus fire for him. He's trying to focus fire to make sure they actually target the Lings. But he is getting surround and cleaned up. Good defense uh, by Shin, or at least defense turning into counter offense, I should say. Gumio won't take any serious damage, but that gives so much room now. Getting rid of the Hellions means even with only four queens, you can spread creep as much as you want. You can see he's starting to spread that creep. He didn't end up losing this queen either. She survived. And you're making him lift his commands. And a third CC is almost done for Gumiho. But Shin is going to explode on the macro front over the next few minutes of this game. Oh, and that one Hellion's not enough. Second Hellion comes out. Well worth losing a couple Zerglings, though, to shut this down. Oh, okay. It does take a few more hits than he would have liked. Not a bad trade there for Gumi. 10 SCV lead, though. Or 10 worker lead, I should say. Unless the Banshee can get some real serious damage done, which is unlikely, with Spore Crawlers already being finished. Queen's in position. As long as you pull the drones away. Pull the drones away. Eh, a little bit lazy for Shin. Should have pulled those drones away as the first order of business. The moment you see... Oh, that's unfortunate, though. It does go behind the minerals. Gumio not watching, though. He could have grabbed that drone for free. He's going to go into the main. Of course, there's a Spore and two Queens there as well. Well defended. Shin's all over it. Shin is all over it. He's going to try and get between the rallies, maybe look for some more. Of course, there's a third spore crawler. He doesn't even really check for that. He realizes it'll be ready. Just gets the Banshee out. Now, there is a Raven building, but where is the production? You can see how delayed Gumiho's mining is in this game. He's going for gas. He's going to go factory. So he's going to play mech. We're going to see mech up against Shin in game three. But if Shin can scout it early enough, we know he can sort of double armory before second and third factory. My gosh, Gumiho. Your greed knows no bounds, mate. Oof. All right, Banshees do manage to take out a few lings in the middle. Shin's like, dude, I'm on, I'm on five gas. He cancels his sixth gas geyser. Thinks he's playing against Bio right now. Seeing the Raven may change his mind. If I see someone who's gone aliens, Banshees, and then a Raven... I don't know, there's part of me that's going, for real? It's Gumio though, it's so hard to read him, because he plays so unique. Couple Zerglings for a few Marines, good trade for Shin. Did lose the Overlord before that. Oh, great positioning, just four Zerglings and three Queens, not to mention that Evo, just blocking him. And, and those Hellions have to back away. Second and third factory is on the way now. 1-1 one, one upgrades have started. Spire starting up. Remember, we saw that Shin wanted to play at the start of this series, Spire against uh, against a, a mech play, but he doesn't have a Roach Warren, so I still think this is just him thinking it's Bio. And I was saying at the start, I wonder why people don't play more of those units. Well, it turns out Shin is of the, the school of, yeah, let's play Mutalists on this map, man. It's a big, wide open map. Let's freaking do it. Banshee Raven harassing the North, Ling's being in use since the Hellions. Just being on cleanup control. I mean, Shin really using his APM 
his actions to run around in circles. And I always talk about Shin being the weaker mechanical player in most of his matchups against top opponents. I think Gumiho might be one of the players where, where they're about even. But because there's momentum on Shin's side right now, it's going to be a bit easier for him to catch Gumiho off guard and force mistakes. Oh my gosh. Oh, he goes for the surround. The fourth command center kind of blocks him though. The aliens are going to slip into that corner. And that's a good D. Raises the depot. A few more marines get caught. Those aliens are actually going down. Dude, those Hellions are just not lining up the shots. The Lings are getting a surprising amount of surface area. No way. No way he did that much damage to them. Oh my gosh, he has to pull back his Banshees. He has to drop auto turrets to defend this. That is a disaster for Gumio. And now he knows it's mech as well. I'm pretty sure he saw the Cyclones. He's got Mutalis exploding. Actually, does he even know? Maybe he didn't see the Cyclones. The Engineering Bay, the single eBay in the wall is a big tell. He's massing drones. He's going to go up to like 10 gases. Oh, he's got so much money. He can just overwhelm with Bass Mutalisk. Yeah, he starts the Roach Warren. He definitely knows that it's mech right now. Shin. Amazing Zergling usage. You're not meant to trade efficiently, guys. I always joke about it when I'm watching noobs that the slow Zergling is the natural predator of the Hellion because low-level players micro the Hellion so badly they always get surrounded. But it really is like a finicky art. Like I've practiced thousands of games with Hellions. And I very often get them surrounded like Gumiho just did, but I, I would never see that happen to Clem and Maru, very rarely. And, and it's just some minor details with the positioning makes such a big difference. Oh, remember Cyclones don't lock on as fast, so if they all lock onto one Mutalist, they kill it, but then they can't lock on again for a little bit. Oh, Hurricane Engines! Hurricane Engines! 94, 95, it goes down, five seconds to go. Oh, that sucks. Hyperflight Rotus is going to go down as well. Shin being an annoying player to play against that time. Okay, at least... Hyperflight Rotors does survive. Well, it's burning down, and Gumiho is stressed out right now, so he might not be ready for it. But, okay, he does repair. He's going for Thor's 2 2 upgrades. Ooh, we're going to see a Lurker transition potentially. Or maybe just Hydra Bane. We've got range and melee upgrades, Roaches, but Hydra upgrades coming in. Could be Hydra, Hydra Ling Bane Vipers, a very good composition. You normally can't get to Hydraling Bane Viper vs. Mech because their, their timing attacks and their Cyclone Swarms are a bit too scary. Shin messing up with a bit of his drones rallying across the map. He'll fix that quickly. Resume to harassing. Just a small amount of Mutalisks is forcing a lot of anti-air. And Thors are not good versus Lurkers. They're not good against Hydra with Blinding Cloud either. Blinding Cloud plus Hydras is pretty good against Thors. If you can land the Blinding Clouds... Thors are just such an awkward unit when it comes to maneuvering around. So I do think Vipers will be high on the priority list for Shin. So many different techs right now, but 99 workers. Gumio is going to need to find true efficiency in this game. He's going to have to find that bloody, crazy Maru level of efficiency. And I think that only happens with a late game Ghost Transition. Cyclone's defending the Sensor Towers nicely. And she's trying to fly across the map. He's like, I want to put on some counter pressure, man. Luckily for him, speed overseers have not been added to the Mutalisks. As I say that, they're coming in right now. Hellions on the right get caught. Lings just straight up surround them. The blue flame is not done. And it's just so few units to counter these Zerglings. Shin's getting so many good trades. Ooh, hello. Gets himself a Ravager Sniper or two. Not bad. As the Mutalists come north, he's got to pull back. Greatest Buyer, Vipers, and Corruptors building. Shin has an immense amount of income. Over a thousand minerals and 600 gas a minute more coming in. But he will be butting into his maxed out supply. Gumiho is not too far behind on maxing out. So Gumiho still going to have a pretty fearsome army. But so many Cyclones in the mix. Cyclones are not a great endgame unit by any means. Thor does do splash damage shot. Gets a little bit of damage on those Mutalisks. Spines building at the base is a good idea to help deal with Hellion run buys. So all your supply is going to be going into Broodlords in the near future. So he's freeing up supply by building those. Eight, eight Broodlords more. Three more Corruptors on the way. Mutalisks are still dancing around. He's just kind of keeping track of where Gumiho is. Gumiho is trying to make 3-3. Three, three. So two more Command Centers, two more Thors. 3-3 three, three upgrades all starting. Gumiho is trying to get to that late game stage. He only has three Thors right now. They are also in splash damage mode to help deal with the Mutalisks. I think they should go back to single fire. Hellbats get taken out. You can see the Hellbats do a lot of damage, but those Zerglings barely surviving. Very important. Oh, Banshee Raven comes forward and is like, oh no, get out of here. Run, Raven. Ravens are very slow units as well, remember. Three Thors. They're swapping into high impact payload. This one hasn't here. 
If he could flank this maybe with the Cyclones. Gumiro's looking for a surround. He's looking for a surround right now. Here we go. There's actually not that many Banelings. Oh, they're going to they're gonna ruin these Cyclones though. Cyclones in the south get ruined in the north. Thor's doing pretty good versus the Broods, except for the ones who are in splash damage mode. That one Thor up front in splash damage mode is not doing a lot. Dude. Gumiro cleansed the ground army. It's a shame though. He can't get on top of the Broods. His Thors are wasting a bit of time moving forward. He's got to get on top of those Thors. Those Broodlords with those Thors. Let's take out one of them. So three Broods in total falling. Units lost tab. Pretty damn good for Gumiro. That was actually a nice fight. Remember, like I said, Gumiro, he has got eight queens, 16 wasted supply that is not in the battle. He's got 90 drones, which means he's got 15 more supply there as well. So he has 30 less army supply in a fight like that where they're both maxed out. Now, don't get me wrong. He remaxes much quicker, does Shin, but he's also playing Roach Hydra. Oh my gosh. Roach Hydra Ling, really? That can't be right. No Baneling Nest. Banelings are your most supply efficient... Wait, wait, sorry. He does have Baneling speed, doesn't he? Yeah, 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 he does. I'm like... It's a bit of a weird composition though. Roach, Hydra, Link, Bane, Broodlord, Corruptor. Shin's a man who does use interesting mixes of units. It's not a super long-term composition. It's a... I want to kill you right now with Wave 2. There's no tanks. There's no tanks. The Roach Hydra's just going to get on top. The Broodlords may be falling pretty quickly, but so are those Thors. Hellions move in and focus the Hydras. Tanks getting rolled over by Banelings at the south side. The Broodlords are all gone. It's Roach Hydra versus Thor tank. The tanks get blasted to shreds. And you know what? All the Thors go down. That was the fight that Shin needed. Remember, Shin had all the money in the world. It looks like a Banshee harassing in the north is not going to do enough. Gumiyo's Hellions turn back into Broom Broom race car form and will try to drive away. But losing control of your third base against a Zerg who has every base on his side of the map is terrible. And what a fun series this was. But it does feel a lot like in Game 2 and Game 3, Gumiyo had much worse openings than Shin. And Shin got miles ahead. And this has always been Shin's beauty as a player. He's very good at defending weird stuff. He's very good at doing weird stuff. And simply getting leads in the early stages. It's a reason why Bion just turtles against him every game and plays the most conservative StarCraft you've ever seen. Is because he feels like Shin just has too many ways of getting ahead if you give him a chance to jump on your army. And jump on the army is exactly what Shin is doing here. Especially after those surrounds on the Hellions early. Dude, those surrounds on the Hellions were delicious. Jumping on these Thors. He's got a very expendable army of Roach, Ling, Hydra. A couple Vipers as well. Hellbat harass in the top right. We'll kill a hatchery, but it's an unimportant hatchery, whereas these bases are vital. Gumiro's trying to drop Hellbats on top of the Roach Hydra, but that does not work out. He just doesn't have the numbers. Having to build Thors to deal with Broodlords and no longer having the tanks you need to deal with the Roaches and Hydras. Well, actually, that was a pretty good fight. Those Hellbats did really well. Trying to drop Mass Mule. Gumiro hanging on by a thread. Shin is trying to snip that thread right now. He's got his scissors out. So he's got to make sure while he's running with them, he doesn't drop his scissors and then fall on top of them. It's always something they told us as kids, wasn't it? Don't run with the scissors. No, no. Hold them pointing down at the floor and walk. Then again, I do remember them being... We had these like metal scissors that were pretty sharp. Pretty sure these days they just give kids those plastic ones they can't possibly do anything with. <laughs> Anyways, uh, good times. I just had a flashback of me teacher shouting at me multiple times. Anyways, Zerglings uh, taking out the mules on that expansion. Aliens and tanks there. Going to be cleaning up these Zerglings, but... I mean, Shin's supply looked kind of low for a second. Then I remember that he had 90 workers and I went, yeah, it's fine. Losing this base sucks. But he's still got good income. I mean, it's not great income anymore. But Gumiho's on 32 workers. So, so the longer it goes, I mean, he's just going to rebuild the hatcheries and remax. You had Vipers here abducting a Thor. So good. Oh, yeah. Even the short-ranged abducts worth it. If he gets the tanks down here, and one of the Vipers goes down. But abduct abducting a few Thors and tanks, like an amazing fight. And your opponent just can't replace that. And he's like, cool, get a few spines in case he does that Hellbat harass. Oh, you got a hat? What? You have a command center here? Oh, okay. I can go kill that whenever I feel like it. Clicking on this command center. He does pull back the Hellbat drop. Oh, you want to try and focus the medevacs down before they drop normally. Wasn't quite able to get it. He does have Hydra upgrades though. Three or two, two upgrades, almost plus three. And he's just got the numbers. Even though the aliens do great bonus damage to Hydras, they're very fragile. Arch Hydra does pull back. Nine more Corruptors coming in. So what he's planning here is he's like, look, you're building tanks and Hellions now. Realizing tank Hellbat's the only way you survive against the Roach Hydra. It's inevitable there's either going to be only these two Thors or I might even kill those. And then the Broodlords are going to ruin you. So 
Broodlord tech switch, really smart here from Shin. It's going to work out great. Gumio goes to the bottom left, finds that base mining, and he's got to feel his heart sink. This base gets caught as well. Hydras are on top of it. This base, spine crawlers are everywhere. Shin has so much spare money. Gumio does not. Gumio fought a spectacular series today. Unfortunately, not going to be enough. Actually, both of his series, to be fair, his previous series was a banger as well. Unfortunate. I thought he, I thought after that game one, he'd, he'd be able to close it out, but Shin has proved the better ZVT player. Remember that Shin almost beat Maru in the group stage. This is a, a pretty damn close match. He was doing well versus Maru in late game as well for a while. Thors do pick off a Broodlord. The double Thor drop. It's a classic. Uh, anytime you open with double Thor dra uh, drop into tank Hellbat, that's what I call trad mech, traditional mech. It's the mech that Gumio popularized in 2017 until Rogue showed that if you go swarm host Hydra Bane, you would never lose to it. I do miss those days, swarm host Hydra Bane. Gumio has to tap out. He sees the Broodlords, he sees the giant army, and he's had enough. Shin gets the two to one, and he does it in style. He's going to go through to the rematch with his opponent from the previous round for his last chance to get to the top four of GSL. All right, all right, all right, here we go. It's all gonna be decided here. Who is gonna get second place through to the group, uh, well, out of group B to the top four of GSL. Getting to the semifinals of GSL is massive. He goes 15 hatchery after Overlord. Wow, Overlord into 15 hatchery. So this is like a modified 16 hatch. Very good build order. If you know that their probe is just going to get there at the last second. If the probe comes a few seconds earlier, that doesn't work. And you're better off doing a 15-15 if you want to get the natural up. But I think he's happy with that so far. Probe Harass has been pretty solid for stats, though. Stats is going for it. What appears to be a standard gate gas build behind it. He's going to be frustrated, though. Sending the probe across and not getting the block down. Means Shin has anticipated what you're going to do on this map. And that's something Shin is very good at. Shin is one of the best build planners. Stats is a clutch defender player, defensive player. He plays solid, he scouts, and he has some of the most solid Protoss play out there. Him and Showtime are two birds of a feather. I'm telling you, you put these two together and they will nerd out over the tiniest optimizations to make just the most solid, perfect style for every matchup as Protoss. But Shin, on the other hand, is always thinking about how he can get ahead of you, how he can catch you off guard, how can he trick you? And that's his specialty. And he's already starting off well with a hatch gas pool. All he had to do was delay building one drone to get the 15 hatchery down. Otherwise, it's very similar to your normal 16 hatchery, 18 gas, 17 pool. Now he's getting drone around, probe harassed a little bit. You can see that worker getting bounced. That worker gets bounced. It's not perfect handling, but you'll notice compared to a guy like Dark, who just lets his workers triple stack on the far patches, Shin normally fixes this. Hey, see? See what I'm talking about? I always, I always, I, I gotta give you guys examples because I cast so much Dark and I don't always point out the difference, but basically um, there are games where Dark gets his workers bullied off these close patches and he ends up with three workers on these two patches just stacked up here, three workers on this patch, and he never fixes it and he loses a lot of mining from that. Whereas the mining right now, almost 1300 minerals a minute on two base, much more solid from Shen. Very good opening. And he's even going, whoa, 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 link speed. He's going to Link Flood, Link Flood, Link Flood, all in. Oh my god, of course. He tried to all in two games in a row. It didn't work. And now he's just going to all in again. Oh my gosh. He's just doing a straight up Link Flood. Because we've got to look at this from Stats Vision. The Links are trying to be hidden right now. Does Stats have any idea what is happening? I, I can't just watch from Stats Vision though. We've got to watch from everyone's to see how he's hiding. He's hiding them around the edge of the map. He wants the Adepts to come across the map. If the Adepts are just chilling at home, it's actually so good for Stats. I should have pointed out, this is actually a pretty... Actually, no, it's a normal timed link speed, guys. It's a normal hatch gas pool link speed. It's not faster than normal. Oracle's on the way. There's no wall off, though. He's already thinking about a third base. He's already thinking about a third base. He shades! He shades to the middle of the map! He was waiting! Shin has studied his habits. He knew the Adepts were going to check for it, but only for a little while. And he waits for him to move out and then runs in. Oh, my golly! You dirty piece of beautifully planned Zerg all in. Beautifully planned. He's going to recall the two adapts. Probes are going to try to run to the main. Oracle's doing good damage. Those probes could stack in the corner to try and limit surface area. He's going to run away now. Three adepts in the Oracle doing good damage. Twelve workers go down. It's not an all-in. That's the problem for stats. I was like, oh, this is actually held. He loses all of his links. But he's droning. He's droning behind this. He's got three queens. He's building a spore. And now the third base gets massively delayed for Protoss. 
Unless the Adept Oracle counter aggression can do something. Oh, I mean, stats. Pretty decent handling considering how much he was caught off guard there. And you know, he was like 90% safe versus all ins, maybe 97%. Shin found that little 3%. He, he studied the way stats checks for any links coming in, and he found there's a tiny opening. And that's all you need. That's all you need with these preparation tournaments like GSL is just a tiny opening. And any hole was a goal for those Zerglings, and boy did they find it. Three drones go down, but both Adepts falling is not great because now his third is vulnerable. But if the Oracles could find a bit of damage, they're going to be okay. He's got two, two Warp Gates up. Warping in two Adepts and having a third Oracle popping out, he should be okay. The Oracles came in, they managed to only get one drone. You can see, heavy damage on that Oracle. Oracles here, good pullback. Great pullback by Shin. Okay, Shin is up eight workers. It's a, it's a big amount of momentum in this matchup to be up eight workers. But he hits a big supply block on 58. And look how solid stats is on the D now. Roach Warren going down. No lair. No second gas. I have a feeling we're going to see a queen walk. I wouldn't be surprised to see a third gas go down as well. And a ton of overlords in a moment. That being said, five queens. He's building a few more zerglings to handle this counter attack. Which are necessary. Four adepts are going to clean up those creep tumors. Oh, massive thanks to those coming over from day nine stream. We just got a huge raid live on the stream. We are live right now. We are watching the replays from last night's Global StarCraft League. The GSL was on last night. This is the final deciding match. These two guys won a match. They lost a match. Stats won the first match. He defended two all-ins. But this match has opened up with a disgusting Ling Flood that Shin hid. Till the last second, he snuck in a pack of Zerglings and killed 12 workers. So Shin's got the advantage in game one. Stats is trying to get some counter damage on right now, but he's in big trouble. The Adepts are going to get two workers. They do shuffle in behind the line. But you can see there those Spore Crawlers being built to preserve those drones, protect them until the Adepts are dead, and then pulls back. Stats is getting some nice trades off, but this all comes back off the, off the back of 12 probes in the early game, which have ruined his economy. So he has a lot of work to do to get back in this match. Stats, known as the Shield of Ire, is one of the most defensive Protoss players in the world. He is a player who is all about basically surviving and playing the most standard, solid stuff you can. Recently getting back in form from the military. If he wins this match, he gets to the top four of GSL, which is massive. It would really, like, it's already amazing that he's gone this far. And he was very close to qualifying to the top four in the previous match, which he barely, barely lost. But if he could win this one... I think a lot of people are going to realize we have the, the Shield of Aya back where he belongs in the top of the tournaments playing with the very best. Fourth Hatchery on the right side, Spire, Evo, and Infestation Pit. Oh, the Spire's right there! He needs to see it. Oh no, he's not going to see it. At least he saves. Both Oracles barely saved, but that Spire hidden by Shin. Shin's playing uh, just a big surprise amount of Mutalisks. They're going to be very hard for stats to deal with. Stats is famous for being one of the best players at defending muters with a prism with two archons in it. And he he doesn't have an archon, you know, he doesn't have a phoenix. He's making a Templar Archives and a Robo now. He's going to have to do it with just Blink Stalkers. You can see he's trying to get towards a fourth base because he knows he's in such a, a bad position that he can't really risk too much else. But this is a great pressure from Shin. So Shin's making it look like he's going for a big attack. Stats is worried about it. Meanwhile, he's swapping into a round of Mutalisks behind it. And just six Mutalisks, enough to one-shot workers. Enough to... It takes five muta, muta attacks to one-shot workers. So he's going to fly into the natural and then the main while distracting with more units on the front. And he's going to transition Evo Chamber Hydroden. This is a very Shin thing to do. Oh, no, no, no. I was going to say, it makes more sense to go Lurkers than Hydras. But he is actually going for, for Lurkers. The Hydroden is just to unlock the Lurkerden. Hive is to get those Lurker upgrades, which is so powerful. Oracle's going to get four drones, five drones. Nice harassment from stats. The Oracle Preservation, I was mentioning this earlier today, how he just never loses his Oracles. It's kind of crazy how much safer and, and better he is with his Oracles, you could argue, than a lot of other players, but oh gosh. Luckily, there's a cannon. Quick Stalker Warping. This is a quick response. Dude, stats is very quick to respond. We saw him earlier today defend four bases at the exact same time. About as close to perfectly as you as you could with the resources that he had available. And once again, only seven probes to a surprise bunch of mutalists. He had no idea about this until they flew into his base. That's incredibly impressive. If they want more, he's going to lose a few mutalists. Manages to grab eight probes in total. That one probe disappeared into the gas just before the last mutalist glaive hit it. Storm's almost done. Two one upgrades are on the way. Charge coming in as well. The big problem... Oh, he goes for the, 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 the High Templar! 
Oh, he's going to get the Oracle. Okay, he gets an Oracle, doesn't get the High Templar, but that's okay. Getting an Oracle is still big. Now, here's a huge problem. Lurkers, hard counter. Stalkers, they also kind of ignore Psystorm. They have 200 hit points. Psystorm only does 80 damage over 4 seconds. So even if you sit in the Psystorm with your Lurkers, you just don't care. You need Disruptors or Immortals on the ground or an Air Swap for stats to deal with the Lurkers. I don't think he gets to either of those in time. I think that's, that's you know, a bit of a long shot because he's just in an awkward position. He starts an Immortal, starts a second Robo. We're about to see Lurkers morphing. Six of them already morphed. Surprisingly, Shin's not playing a massive worker count, only 79 workers, but I guess that's because he's building so many hatcheries and spine crawlers. Mutalisk's flying around the main. Single Phoenix did get built to deal with this. Fleet Beacon goes down. That's going to unlock Carrier and Tempest production, not to mention the Mothership. The new Mothership, for those who don't know, is now a little bit cheaper. Its cloaking field is no longer permanent. It's something you activate uh, for about 20 seconds, once every about 40 or 50 seconds. But we'll talk about that more later for now. You've got to slow down the advance of these Lurkers. Unfortunately, Stats could not see the Lurker behind the grass. That's a Sight Blocker. Otherwise, he would have focused it down. He needs to slow down this advance. He cannot let these Lurkers get sieged on his base. Ooh, Ling run by. Not able to squeeze past that Adepts. Good hold for now. Lurker's taking a bit of damage. He's got to focus them down. He almost gets one. He blinks forward. That's so dangerous. That's so dangerous. The Lings on the left are getting wrecked. The Immortal production's going okay. He's up to two, but he needs more. Two more Immortals trying to build. Now the Lurkers are positioned. You can't fight here. Get out of here, Stats. Stats is going to try and fight. Oh, this is an awkward angle to be on. He doesn't seem to have the numbers. Shin's army's not that big. But the Stalkers, as you can see, are no good against Lurkers. Lurkers absolutely ravage him. He should have just pulled back and given up this base if he had to. I know it's a hard call to make, but I think that was the only path that he had to holding this. He cannot fight Lurkers until he gets more Zealots and Immortals out. Zealots to flank, Immortals to do the actual damage. The Zealots are there to drag the Lurker attacks away. He does hold on, though. Call me a doubter, man. I, I did not realize. I thought that was going to get out of control, but he gets in there before more Lurkers arrive. And remember, 2-2 two -two never started. 2-2 two -two never started. Shin was going for 100% commitment. He starts plus 2 range now. He hasn't started plus 2 carapace. Meanwhile, 3-2 starts for stats. So he's ahead on the upgrades. Mothership starts. That's right. Mama's on the way. She can spam time warp a little bit more frequently. And her recall is still incredibly effective. She's also faster. Her acceleration rate massively increased from what she used to be. And this is all happening, of course, just in one of the most recent patches a few months back. Zergling's getting into the main base right now, going after the Fleet Beacon, potentially. Oh, that's a bummer. You don't want to lose that. And Zealots are going to warp in there. It looks like, okay, the Zerglings aren't going to get too much done. Remember, those are no upgrades on the melee. Zerglings with plus three melee and Adrenal are a different story. Shin kind of did this like a Lurker all in, and he didn't actually get enough damage. Even though it looked like he was cleaving through the Stalkers, the tail end of that fight was so negative on the cost for him that now he needs to kind of play late game, and he's refusing to play late game. Lings and Hydras are on the way. It feels like he's been so close to killing stats in both of their first games in the previous series. And now in this game, he's been on the cusp of beating stats, but stats just will not die. And this is why we call him the Shield of Aya, because you watch him fight and it looks like he's just desperately holding his shield up and the other guy is just banging on it, clobbering him with a giant Warhammer trying to break through, but his arm just never breaks. Stats, honestly, you guys ever see a uh, Rafa Nadal's arm in tennis? How one arm is giant, the other arm is real small. Looks kind of weird. That's stats. His shield arm is ripped. He's vascular as all heck. He's got muscles popping out of that bad boy for days. His, his shield arm has defended more BS than I've ever seen in my life. That being said, he's going to lose a base for a base, and that usually favors Zerg. Oh, he's recalling back. Oracle Revelation's good for the detection. Dude, there's no Overseer! No Overseer for Shin! He can't see anything! They're all invisible! Oh god, the Overseer's trying to morph, but it's just gonna get sniped. There's two more Overseers here. He's gotta run with his Zerg tail between his legs, his tentacle between his legs, I guess I should say, for Zerg, since they don't really have tails. That is a big problem. Storm landing on the Lurkers. The Nexus on the left side goes down as well. The Roach Hydra Lurker gathering, trying to find angles. They do deny a base. Kill another base that just started there. Mama's Cloak is on cooldown for now, about another 20 seconds, guys. So, so they gotta chill. And even if you use it now, there's three Overseers here. 11 Lurkers, there's 8 Immortals. This army is much better at cleaning through. 4 High Templar, I'm going to just quickly do an energy check, guys. There's only 3 Storms available, not a lot of not a lot of Storm energy. 
Battery overcharge on this base could be big as well. Battery overcharge goes down. Time warp slows at attack speed by 50% with inside that bubble. The Immortals coming in. They're closing in on those Lurkers. It's hard to get on top, but Immortals are so tanky. Oh, they're falling though. They're falling. Bad fight for stats. Bad fight. Those Immortals got stuck behind each other on that side. He took massive losses. He does end up clearing the army. And you know what? Zealots in the north deny a hatchery at the same time. It might be okay. But definitely those Immortals were a bit too stuck behind each other to be as efficient as he wants. Luckily, those Zealots are good on the chase. He gets two Lurkers on the retreat. He's got to pull back, though. He's got to get out of there. That Immortal and Archon looking a little bit exposed. Mixture of Roach Hydra Zergling Lurker. Still, Shin is stuck on Lair Tech. Even though he's got a Hive, finally he builds a Viper. He's not got plus two Carapace. He doesn't have plus three range. So the three two upgrades are better for Protoss. The Storm is great. The Immortal count has been ruined, though. And that's very scary if it weren't for the fact that he's swapping into carriers. He's got plus one air weapons finished, plus two's going to be finishing, and uh, we'll be starting soon, no doubt. Maybe he thinks he already started it, but didn't have the gas. It's a very important upgrade, because he's not going to have the same power. It's all about overwhelming the Hydras with his carrier count. That's kind of a bit of an awkward transition, just because he lost this base before, and he can't get a fifth base up right now. Income, dead even for both sides. Changelings just kind of hanging around with the army right now. Random Roach waddles in and gets killed. Plus two air weapons does start. Stats is really good about those upgrades. He almost never forgets them, so... Something which he just couldn't afford for a little while there. And he's building Immortals. I like that. Having a few Immortals just cleanses through the Roaches, gets through the Lurkers very quickly. If you don't have them as a core to your army, it can be a, a situation where you just get overrun on the ground. Ooh, what a series we've had so far, man. There's been... It's actually, in, in, in general, today's day of GSL. Sorry, as I have a drink of water there, you could hear me guzzling that. Should have muted my mic. Uh, it's It's been back and forth crazy games, and stats is a big part of it. Stats ability to play much better defensive Protoss than pretty much anyone else in the world. It's showing itself today. Showing what it's got, what he's got, sorry, to uh, to dance with the big dogs. See that storm, guys? He hits one lurker, it does nothing to it. Just, it tickles. Oh, he's looking for the feedback on the Viper. He wants to feed back the Viper before the Abduct comes in. It gets the Abduct, even though the feedback lands. It is just a fraction of a second after the Abduct comes in. Mama gets ripped into the Zerg army and she gets destroyed. Time Warp comes in. I don't know about attacking with the carriers right now. It's enough Hydras to kill the Interceptors. You can see in the top left of our screen, the Interceptor count is dropping very quickly, but... Those are cheaper as Hydras are expensive. He's going to have to pull back now, though. He's going to have to pull back. Hydra count, not that high. Maybe he doesn't have to pull back? Oh, man, not enough anti -air. 17 Corruptors being built. They are only plus one Corruptors. They don't have upgrades. Then again, the Carriers don't have great upgrades either just yet. Only plus one for them. Plus two almost finished. Dude, Stats needs a fifth base desperately. He desperately needs a fifth base. Maybe taking a corner might be worth the risk. You can see his bases are over mining. 17 workers on just four mineral patches there. His main, he's got idle workers just hanging around, nowhere to mine. Does catch a roach split off from Shin. The 20 corruptors are very scary though. If you don't land big storms and arc on hits, those corruptors will do well against the carriers. If you can keep outscaling on the upgrades though, if you get plus three carriers against plus one corruptors, the corruptors will melt. That's a big if, though. Plus two just finished. He does start plus three straight away. Stats has got his eye on the long game. Shin is trying to win the game right here, right now. Hydra's... Oh, no! Walking into the Lurker army. And Archon does get popped by the Lurkers. But now you don't have much anti -air. Corruptors are going to go for it. Big storms on the Corruptors. The Carriers are going to have to stand and fight. Parasitic Bomb in the middle of the Carriers is going to kill a lot of the Interceptors. The Archons and the Storms do massive damage. And that is why... You don't want to go in with 0-1 Corruptors over a field of Archon Storm and plus two carriers. Oh me, oh my. The Shield of Aya gets surprised by a bloody circling run by. I thought he was dead to the Ling Flood at the start. I, 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 he was definitely behind afterwards, but that was actually ridiculous. Shin, unable to break through. Stats is just rock solid today. I have to go back. I have to go back and look at this. This is disgusting. Look at this. Look at this. His vision is amazing. Stats literally is like making sure he doesn't get surprised by anything. He sends an adept here. He's like, got to make sure there's no lings. Shades away at the exact second they shade to the middle. The overlord sees it. The lings are like, quick, it's go time. Oh, man. It catches him just completely pants down. 18 zerglings into the base nice and early. And he was already droning behind it. So it was never an all-in. It was just a very well-timed sneaky maneuver. 
Taking advantage of these few seconds when there's nothing in the wall before that third adept comes out. Stats wanted to do a sharp pressure. Ends up losing 12 workers and being way behind. And he still hangs on and fights back. The defensive god's back, guys. Let's go to game two. All right, solid as a rock and absolutely unbreakable in the top left side stats. He just will not die, man. And at this point, I, I'm like, Shin, maybe just play a macro game. I don't know. I mean, that's that specialty, so it's not really a good idea. He's just, he's been so close to breaking stats every time they've played. And yeah, he's zero for three right now. Today in matches, and that's, that's tough. That's very, very tough. He's used so many tricks as well. And when you've used up your tricks, they've all been pretty successful and given you advantages, but you haven't been able to finish him off. It's demotivating. It's it's one of those, this is the point where I like, I just proxy hatch and try to build spine crawlers outside their base. Like, I do something super gimmicky at this point, if I'm in Shin's shoes. I uh, maybe, maybe like a classic build, maybe just do a queen walk. I think queen walk is, is one of the more, you know, always effective against a triple oracle player if you just walk queens across the map off creep have a bunch of roaches and ravages and just tons of zerglings backing it up you can often kill their third base and get yourself a big lead if not kill them outright and killing them outright happens a fair amount of the time probe harass there you can see he's trying to occupy the minerals so the rule here as we've got a few new people in is uh basically you can only have one dude mining a mineral patch at a time so if you're mining it they can't mine from it and you're not meant to finish mining the five minerals slight mistake there if you stop just before he mines the five minerals and then start mining it again, you could basically occupy one of their mineral patches so they can't mine from it. So it's a little dance to try and like both occupy the mineral patch so the other one can't interrupt it. Uh, it's just a little bit of harassment that you do when you are playing at a very fast speed. Now, to be fair, Stats is one of the slowest of the top tier players. You can see his APM nowhere near Shins. To be fair though, Zerg players are famous for basically abusing increased repeat rates on their keyboards to artificially inflate their APM as much as possible. To, to boost it up just by, so when they hold down a key to build Zerglings, it's basically ticking away at hundreds of clicks a minute without them actually having to click. Stargate's on the way. Adept's out here once again scouting for a Ling Flood. I don't think you're gonna see a Ling Flood again. So playing the exact same way as Start, still going for the double Adept pressure is never a bad idea. His Oracle starts, and notice he's actually, most people use another Chrono Boost on their Adepts. He doesn't, and most people Chrono the Oracle now, with this 50 energy that just ticked over. But just by Chronoing that Oracle a few seconds earlier, he can join that up right behind these Adepts. So even if Ling Speed finishes and they're going to jump on top, he's going to shave about 5 seconds off the Oracle. And that's going to get there to help protect those Adepts from any Zerglings that want to surround them. Second Gate's on the way in the Wall Off. Sporkrill are building in the natural. Good idea on this map. That's always the most exposed base. Kind of hard for oracles to get behind your base without flying past here. Oh, he's building a spore in the main as well. Very defensive. Five queens and two spores this early. Wow. Shin really respecting the oracle harassive stats. Oracle's just chilling at the third, allowing that nexus to go down by now. What's the link speed name? Is it leg enhancements? It's, well, wings actually pop out on them afterwards. It's called metabolic boost. And yet the funny thing is in StarCraft 2, they don't get these little wings until they get that upgrade. So it's it's kind of a funny thing. You're like, is it really? Is the metabolic boost what allows them to just push wings out? Like, oh, metabolic boost, I've got so much more energy now. Like, whoa, now I suddenly grow wings. Should just be like wing evolution or something like that. Oh, 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 watch out, watch out. Ow, 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 ow. Oh, not the best focus fire for stats. Kind of derps at that. Only two drones and the Oracle gets deep in the red. That's actually good for Shin. Those who don't know, Shin used to be called Ragnarok. Pretty much every cast I do, people go, who the hell is Shin? What's a Shin? His real human name is Shin Hebion. Or Bion Bom? Someone was telling me how to properly pronounce it. Oh, Oracle goes down. That hurts. He was trying to send that Oracle home to be defensive on his third base. Oh, look at this Ling Flood. Ling Flood, oh God, he's gonna get the surround. Shin's all over it once again. He's so ready for everything Stats does, but can he actually get an advantage from it? Can he actually get an advantage from it? His preparation is so good. Oh, sorry guys, bad observing there. Oracle does go into the main base, but oh, Queen, get out of there. Shin doesn't react in time. He's gonna lose that Queen. Unfortunate, slight mistake for him. The other Queen wasn't even helping. Yeah, he's gonna get a few drones for good measure. Three drones and a Queen, good counter pressure. The Adepts holding in the choke point. The one on the right does get surrounded. I wouldn't mind, fighting with the probes would help out there. 
Definitely fighting with the probes could help, but just going to rely on warping in more adepts than the zerglings. You know what? They kill a few adepts. At the end of the day, it is positive trading for Shin, which is usually fantastic. But you've got to keep in mind, he preemptively built those zerglings. And with a zerg, every time you build army units, that's less drones you're building. So every time you take a good trade from building a big army early, it comes at a cost of your economy being lower than it should be. And that's why the economy is still dead even despite Shin trading positively. If you're defending, on the other hand, and you take a positive trade, it's a massive advantage for Zerg, because that usually means you've squeezed out more drones and then defended on your side of the map a bit later. Oracles are chilling up here on the Ghost River. I guess that's the Ghost Beach, really. The Ghost River itself, I'm pretty sure, is this bit that runs through the middles of the map. There's uh, a few little patches you can see around of it. Fourth Nexus in the bottom left side. Oracles going in the main. Ooh! Gets himself one, two drones, nice. The fact that these oracles are still being annoying is really big. Roach Warren and Infestation Pit go down. Shin is definitely planning a bit of a longer play. I think it's just gonna be Roach Swarmost. I imagine we see 66 drone Roach Swarmost. We just saw the oracles get recalled home, by the way. They were kind of trapped in the back, so we wanted to get them out here. No gases on the third, straight for the fourth base. Four gas, stalker pressure coming forwards. Shin, uh oh, he's gonna be careful. Trying to go roach speed plus one range. If you can get a bunch of roaches out, that could be good. The infestation pit's also nice for infestors. We don't see many people do it, but against this pressure, if you just build two infestors, infestors in 2024 actually spawn with 75 energy. And uh, they're back to their old casting range of, I think, nine, which, or eight rather than seven, I think it is, just as uh, since the last patch, which is only a week or two ago. Two, two and a half weeks ago, actually. My sense of time's a little bit. A little bit messed up. Oh, nice focus on the Ravager. Adept shade off, but the Ravagers catch them as well. Good defense for Shin so far. Link counterattacks going for the fourth base. That's a great move. If he can just hang on. Oh, the Evo Chamber's kind of blocking his Ravagers a little bit. He doesn't have any transfusers, but he's got a good Ravager count. The Lings are going to cancel that fourth base stats. Oh, he's not going to cancel it, which means that's going to be a kill. But if the Stalkers are getting good enough trades, it might not matter. Oracles are going back to clean that up. Great catch for Shin. Shin once again, kind of saying, hey, you're overcommitting. I can defend with Ravager Queen. I'm going to be in an okay spot. Problem is he needs more Zerglings to buffer for these Ravagers. You don't want to lose Ravagers. They're very expensive units. Oracles plus Shield Battery will defend. Shin immediately pulls the Zerglings back. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of Biles. The only thing I'd like to see from Shin, guys, is space the Biles out a bit more. A big mistake I've seen from many high-level Zergs is they'll use every Bile at once, and then the Stalkers dodge it, and then they go straight back in. See what he just did? Now the Stalkers go straight back in. If you just throw two Biles, you're going to get the same reaction. But he can't come straight back in. Now, to be fair, there's like 12 Ravagers. So at this point, it's, he, he's, he's, as long as he doesn't throw 12 at once, he should be fine. And there we go. Yeah, he's spacing them out really nicely now. That's way better. Good defense. He's going for Baneling Nest and a melee upgrade. I like the defense from Shin. Stalker Micro from Stats has been very good. Stats does not have a fourth base. Stats is, is kind of stuck on this mass Stalker. And he's traded well so far. But it doesn't really go anywhere. There's always a falling off point with Mass Stalker. Stalkers kind of suck in terms of their raw stats the longer the game goes. Ravages Roach is going to jump on front. Oh my gosh. A few Stalkers starting to fall. Good blink back there though. Units lost tab. 2,000 resource lost advantage for stats. But it's four base against three. That being said, Shin isn't really mining off his base yet. Slow Banelings coming in. Ain't going to find much. Oh wait, aren't they? No. Okay, goes for the pylons. Gets a bit of damage, but nothing else. Roach Ravager on the front. Trying to build more Roaches. I'd like to see more Zerglings from Shin. I do think Zerglings buffering against the Stalkers is what we need more of. The forward gateway allows this pylon to become a fast warp-in pylon whenever it's next to a gateway or a nexus. That's going to make a big difference. Trying to squeeze drones out to his fourth. He also needs to transfer workers from his main. Only transfers a few of them so far. Nice dodges there. 3,000 resource loss difference. The forward Stalker pressure is working. He's got defense for his fourth base, even though it's been delayed. Storm, plus one armor, and charge all on the way. Stats forward position is just doing too much right now. It's it's such a frustration. There's more Banelings morphing. you got to get rid of this position, though. I, th I think if Shin just does nothing but Zerglings, he can overwhelm and push him back to his side of the map. Because he's already got so many Ravages. He has a North America of Ravages. Ravages are kind of a, a very expensive unit. They're very accessible, so they're good for timing attacks. They're good for defending all-ins. They're not good in the long term, though. They're, they're so expensive for a very bad set of stats, and that Corrosive Bile is quite easy for an experienced player to dodge. 
called a North America because it's bad, guys, and North America's bad. No, I'm just kidding. It's because a lot of the, the GMs on the NA ladder love their mass Ravager Ling all-ins, and they're, they're very powerful. They're actually very powerful all-ins. Um, that Overlord is going to go down as well. Zealot Stalker on the left side hanging out. The Roach Ravager is still trying to hang. He's going to maybe, maybe breaking these rocks up north and sneak in the natural would be the move. He's kind of stuck on Mass Ravager Ling Bane. There are two High Templar with Psy Storms right now. He's going to warp in a few more. Double Robos on the way behind this. Those are the first Robos being built in this game. On the south side, Zealots do defend those Zerglings. Plus two attacks on the way. Charge finishing up. Hives only now starting. And a Hydrodon. So he's thinking about going Lurk as his Shin, realizing there might not be any way in here. Plus one melee Zerglings against the 1-1 one, one Zealot Stalker. Enough Zerglings to overwhelm, especially with the Roach support, though. Stalkers should save themselves. You don't want to throw any Stalkers away. He's going to try and blink out of there. And Roach is coming in for the flank. Not bad. And should get at least one more of these Stalkers, I believe. Nicely done. Units lost up now 5,000 or 4,500, I should say, in favor of stats. He's trading so well. And the fact that Shin only has a 7 worker lead, it's very bad. The fact, look, stats is getting double immortal. He's getting a fleet beacon. The man is so confident in late game. And you're going double Lurker Den? Oh my gosh. Okay, so why is he going double Lurker Den? It's so he can make mo both Lurker upgrades at once. He does not think he can beat Stats if Stats gets to a carrier army. He's basically saying, I need to win with my first wave of Lurkers. I need to surprise you and win. Ooh, Piles, not quite landing. And the Oracles, they're going to get themselves a Ravager or two. He's not actively microing. He just shift clicked it, did Stats, which is fair enough. He's got other things to manage right now. Cannons, batteries. High Templar, Archons. He's got six High Templar now. And a lot of those, two of them have two storms. The other ones will have a second storm each. Uh, about one minute, minute, minute from now. So 13 minutes in the game. Stats is going to have 12 Psy Storms, 34 Stalkers, four Immortals, three Archons. Uh, I think Mothership will be making soon as well since the Fleet Beacon just finished. He just doesn't have a supply for it. Stats has got five bases now with this bottom left base starting, sorry. So four bases with a fifth just starting. And Ragnarok's only just got his fifth base on the way as well. I like the, the idea of doing a bit of a run by, but with four Immortals stuck behind the Adept, a lucky accident for stats means he has an army in place to defend this. Immortals not really doing bonus damage versus any of this. None of, none of this is armored. And Immortals do massive bonus to armored, but they're still very tanky. They will defend okay. Uh, heals the pylon. Nicely done. Very nicely done. Army comes back to try and catch this. Ooh, if he moved further to the north and came in from behind, it might have been better. But of course, he was worried about defending his base. So we went straight back. Still gets a bunch of Ravager kills. Ooh, Biles not really landing. Oh, Lurkers in the south do deflect this attack, though. Both Lurker upgrades are mere seconds from finishing. Plus two range is finished. If you can get up to about 20 Lurkers and do a big push, you might be able to kill stats as Shin here. But it's it's a hard call because there's so much gas. Does he wait any longer? His upgrades are done. If he, if he probably wants to go pretty soon. Now keep in mind the stasis traps that have been placed on the ground here. They'll freeze any Zerg that come into the area when they get set off. Oh, Lurkers do get taken down. Ling's trying to do some damage. The Hatchery King can just get clicked and he can disengage. Nice move, nice move. Oracles are going to be the best detection against these Lurkers. The Lurker count down to 11. Fifth base has gone down. Shin's got to get a move on. Carriers are starting. Mothership starting. Plus one air weapons. If Stats... Uh, the problem is Stats has got his army split. So where do you, where do you move? How do you get across the map? Gonna just inch Lurkers forward little by little. He's trying to go north now. Stasis Trap sets off on some Zerglings. Another Stasis Trap there. Gets, uh, gets a couple of Lurkers frozen. That Lurker takes a Storm. That Lurker takes a Storm. He's got so many Storms to work with. You can see the difference between this game and Sight Delta in terms of using Psy Storms to zone out the enemy army because he's got so many of them. Nice attack on the natural. We'll get rid of his plus one air weapons, but Stalker Archon counterattack is easily going to kill that base. Cybercore goes down. Lings are in that natural base. It's a problem right now for stats. How does he stabilize? How does he defend the main? He can't lose his production. Oh gosh. Oh gosh, Shin's going to do it. Shin's losing the fourth base of workers. His economy's not great, but if he breaks the production, it doesn't matter. Recall's going to come down. He's going to recall some of the units. It's Oh, it was the army that was out front of his base. He's recalling to the high ground. That means Shin could rotate south and take out his economy in the bottom. The problem for him is Stats still has three mining bases. That is a big problem. Shin is only going to be able to defend his third. His natural and main are mostly mined out. Good Stalker Micro for Stats despite everything that's happening. Pushing up this ramp is a madman. Madman move. Does get some good Storms, does Stats because of that. One of the Lurkers gets popped. The rest are heavily bruised. And Storms on that ramp are just a no. 
Sometimes when you're playing StarCraft, a high level decision making in terms of tactics comes down to looking at a scenario and saying, is this a yes or is this a no? Right now, moving up that ramp for Shin into Sidestorm is a no. It's a no, 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 run away and go somewhere else. And he is making that decision now. Carrier's behind and he's only got a few Hydras. He knows he's on a timer. If five carriers get out, you know, it's very scary. He doesn't have any carapace upgrades to limit their damage. Oh, he's going to catch some units in the middle. Does he have the numbers to overwhelm? It looks like he does. This is actually really good for him. Prism gets damaged. The Hydra on the right side will take out the War Prism. Nice move to try and pull this army away. Remember, Stats does not have recall, except... Actually, he could use Mothership to recall these units back. He could use the Mothership recall to get these guys out of trouble. I think it's a good move. I think if he just recalls them right now, that's massive. Shin's trying to just trap him. But Shin's like, man, I can't waste time chasing you around this side of the map. I gotta go do damage. And I think Stats has done such a good job of, of zoning for control of space on this map. He's got a lot of Immortals up there. There's still two Oracles for detection. Stalker Archon's gonna get caught though. Oh! Stats' first big blunder of this game does get punished. A lot of the Stalkers go down, as does an Archon. Eight Lurkers, all that's remaining. More Hydras and things are in the production tab. Roach is gonna chase these guys down. They'll be able to do that. Stalkers are still outranging them and potentially outmicroing them. Shin thinks about pulling them back and says, ah, oh, whatever, I'll just leave them there. Ling Roach Hydra ready to jump into the main, but there's no economy left in there. Ooh, cannons are going to kill a Lurker. Oh, second Lurker almost goes down, but it looks like the cannons fall pretty quickly. Carriers are going to come forward. Lurkers with their big damage will be nice. That battery overcharge might tempt Stats to engage here if he's got detection to, to reveal those Lurkers. He's got three Observers. One of them must be in this army. He's got two in this army. Ooh, Blink Forward does lose him a bunch of Stalkers. The Overseer giving detection here for Shin. He sees most of this army. The Storms! Oh my lord, the Storms! All over his army. It's massive Storms, dude. Ow, ow, ow. I mean, yeah, you killed some of the Protoss, but the Protoss killed everything Zerg had. And remember, Zerg is on three base. And even though Protoss isn't on that many bases, fresh base, fresh base, decent minerals on his third as well. Whereas it is out of mining, out of mining... And that one's running dry. Shin is dry. He's out of juice. He's out of money. He's not going to be able to build any more of these Zerg units this game. Actually, nice focus. I got two Eye Templar and an Oracle. But he's desperate. The Hydras get overrun. They get outgunned. And that is a big, big loss for Shin. And a massive success for Stats. The Shield of Ayer is back. He looks absolutely untouchable right now. He's now defeated Dark in the first group stage. He's defeated Classic. He's also taken out Shin twice and almost beat Cure in a PVT. And I, I would argue should have if he didn't leave his disruptors exposed. Beautiful units lost tabs pretty much every single game. He makes it to the top four of GSL for the first time since he's come back from the military. Heck yeah. GG well played stats.